morning. Good morning. Is, is mine working? Dobro yeah, it is. Utro. Okay. Ако колегите, които са пред залата ни чуват, молим ви заповядайте. Колегите Вече сме започнали 10 минути. Чуваме ли се? Кире, получи ли? Заповядайте вътре сме, вътре сме. За колегите, които сте тук, имаме нужда от няколко минути, за да дойдат всички и да започнем. Хората се регистрират ли? Аз още не съм се регистрирал. Не, да Времето истина, не е да се регистрираш. <laughs> а, за всички в залата ще ви помоля сега да ме изчакате 5-10 минути да отида да се регистрирам, да се върна след това, за да може да започнем цялата тази история. Докато чакаме останали, и се, извинявам на български, ще превключим на английски след малко. За колко от вас това е първа иста? Дигайте ръка, ако ви е първа иста. Вау. Wow. За колко, колко сте идвали над 30? Поне три пъти сте били. Има. Добре. Пет. Десет. Единайсет. Всички. Тук някъде е Георги Гергинов, той е бил на всички исти, така че не е вярно. Не е вярно, Георги мисля, че миналата година не беше. Не беше ли? Добре. Жора, къде си? Дигни ръка. Той избяга. Добре, може ли нашия шампион с червената буза стани, обърни се нататък, аплодисменти за него. Силни аплодисменти за него. Сега да ти кажа и другото. А, търсихме човек, който да открие и намерихме един в залата, който е бил на всички исти, така че заповядай тук. So good morning, guys. We're going to get started. You want to? Yeah. You sure? Time to kick off. Good morning. Still sleeping? Let's try this again. Good morning. Good morning. Nice. Good morning. All right, guys. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, I usually am up on the stage whenever we have ISTA holding as a regular conference in venue. We started this conference 12 years ago in 2010. It was a QA conference. Uh, then it evolved into a more general one uh, around innovation, around software technologies, uh, around automation. And for 12 years, up until 2020, we were always in this kind of setup. That's what we're used to. That's what we want to see. People coming together, people listening to interesting lectures, and people networking, people socializing with each other people from the sector being together at ISTA. But in 2020, things changed dramatically, I should say. How did things change? We were locked down. Uh, we couldn't held, uh, hold ISTA in the way that we're used to. And so we had to move online. 2020, do you remember? We opened ISTA three times. Why? Well, sound wasn't coming through the first two times. So that was our attempt at the uh, uh, streaming a conference at the time. And uh, 2021, it was slightly different. We didn't have the technical issues. We learned from that, but it's not the same conference. And we were dreaming. We were dreaming uh, for, of coming back to the usual setup that we've had over the years. Now, the 12th uh, iteration of ISTA is coming back to normal. But that was so far. Now, what's about to come? What's about to come is a hybrid event. And I'm sure that's not the first one that you have. So there is a good bunch of people today, right here, right now. But there is also a good bunch of people that is actually attending ISTA online. So welcome to everyone that's in person 
welcome to everyone that is online as well. Uh, what do we have for you today? Um, we said that the motto of this year's Easter is about dreaming, exploring, and inventions. And speaking about dreaming, we have, and I'll speak about a few of the topics that you hear today. Uh, so we have in, uh, Ingu uh, Muschenets, apologies for the name, uh, who's going to present software architecture and the future of the city. So dreaming of the next generation of the cities, the smart cities, I suspect. We're going to hear in a while. Speaking about exploration, uh, space, satellites. So actually, how do we make sense of this data? And you're going to hear from Pavel Genevsky and Georgi Genchev about it today as well. And of course, inventions, which is the birth. This is, this is how this industry is practically moving on. We're going to hear from Vince, from Vancy, just in a, uh, in a second. But before we go to the interesting topics, uh, I have a few logistics that I need to take care of uh, as well. And once again, we have people that are here today, we have people that attend online as well. So talking about everyone that is here today, what you need to know, we have two tracks. So in this hall, which is hall one, you typically have track one, what we call track one, so the first set of lectures, and you can see the agenda on this small leaflet, which you actually have for you. This is how you could easily select where you want to attend. This is how one, next is uh, how to as well. So the second track is basically going to, help, uh, to be held there as well. Uh, speaking about the nice perks and the networks, and Kosi was talking about the fact that ISTA is about networks mo more than anything else. Uh, so you have <coughs> the nice coffee bags, the coffee machine, the one is over there. Uh, this year, we decided that we want to be environment friendly, which means that we want to use less plastic. Uh, so this is why you have the, uh, the water machines. You don't have that big bottles, and they don't have the big pile of plastic outside when the conference is over. Uh, of course, you have a nice lunch if you're here. If you're not here, enjoy the nice lunch at home, which I assume you're going to prepare as well. Uh, and what we have at the end of Easter is the raffle. So this is where the companies, the sponsors, are, are giving the different uh, uh, presents, the different uh, uh, raffles to, uh, to everyone. And in order to attend, you got this when you enter in the, uh, in, the, in, in the room. So that's basically a number. So go to each one of the stands, just give them the uh, representative ticket as well, and we're going to have the raffle at the end of the conference. The raffle is not the end, the, the closing is not the end. One of the most enjoyable things that happen at ISTE is actually the after-party cocktail. So watch out for the after-party cocktail. It's going to be held here. Last time it was Johnny Walker. This year, let that be a surprise. We'll see who, uh, who supports uh, us with that. And speaking about how we make all of this possible, of course, it's our sponsors, and of course, he's going to tell us a bit about them as well. So after Ivan massacred some of our speakers' names, I'm probably going to massacre some of our partners' names, but um, you know, I'm going to give my best and I'm going to try not to do that. Uh, of course, this type of conferences uh, are not possible unless we have other companies supporting us in the organization and uh, through the uh, logistics and uh, mostly the financial part, of course. Uh, and we got to thank all of them. Um, we got to mention all of them. So our main sponsors, Merkel, Bosch, Progress, Resolve, Axway, Commerce Bank, Ocado, Stripes, TIC42, and DevExperts. Uh, and uh, we have a few more, which are Design Technologies, Scale Focus, Chaos, Andava, and Intellius. Uh, and um, last but not least, we have to mention the five companies that are actual organizers of the uh, conference, and those are VMware, Experian, Infragistics, Musolasoft, and uh, SAP. And uh, uh, again, you know, give a round of applause to all of our sponsors because this type of conference is actually not possible without them. So before we uh, came up here, Monica told us you guys have strict five minutes, so uh, we're going away and passing it back over to Ivan. So what we said is that this, this year we're going to dream explore and invent, and talking about inventions, we could welcome the first inventor on stage because invention is how this industry is moving on. So, Vancy, welcome on stage.
Hello, everyone. My name is Vince. You can call me Vinci, Vincislav Galergiev. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself first, and then we can continue on discussing the dreaming and the exploration and a little bit of an invention that happened in the last few years uh, for, for us at Alcatraz. So again, th my name is Vince. Um, I am the founder of Alcatraz AI. Um, I, um, I started Alcatraz with the dream to, to kind of change how people interact and uh, authenticate in the physical environment, kind of like face ID, but not on, on the phone, but in the real world. Um, uh, prior to this, I used to work at Apple. Uh, I led the team that created kind of Face ID and the integration of Face ID into the iPhone, uh, including some iPhone and iPad uh, development as well. Uh, and prior to this, I used to work at NVIDIA on chipsets that uh, used to be integrated in cars. Uh, mostly, I, I used to work for Tesla, the first iteration uh, of uh, Model S all the way back in 2011, uh, 2012. Um, what can I tell you um, about me? Uh, originally, I'm from uh, uh, Russia, from Bulgaria. Um, I, uh, I was born 39 years ago. I uh, studied in uh, the uh, English language school in, in Russia. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I was never supposed to be connected to IT. Um, my grandma used to um, play the violin. She was the first uh, violin player in the uh, Russia Philharmonic all the way back in the 40s, 50s. Um, she even called my mom Violina because my mom was supposed to be a, a violinist player and I was supposed to be a violinist player. Um, uh, and you know, I, I started studying, I started playing the violin, uh, symphonies, concerts uh, every year. But then when I was 12, my parents bought me a computer for my birthday. And I didn't have time anymore for, for violin. It was just my computer at home. Uh, back in the days, in the mid to late uh, 90s, we didn't have a lot of internet, a, a little bit of a uh, dial-up. I was never about gaming. Um, I, I was always dreaming to, to create something that people use and kind of feel useful, that, that it's, it's in their uh, daily life. Um, so back in the days, we used to um, play with some software, how to make dial-up faster. Uh, we were connecting wires through uh, Russe to have uh, you know, manual LAN networking, so things are fa uh, faster in our town. And um, uh, that's how I kind of started my, uh, my dreaming, my exploration, my uh, maybe a little bit of an invention in, um, in the computer business. Um, my parents always wanted to, uh, to send me away, not for good, just for a few years, just to learn some English um, uh, and then come back to Bulgaria. And the idea was, I can go for a few years in high school, I can learn English. Uh, initially, I went to Oxford uh, High School, didn't click for me that much. I came back to Bulgaria, and then I said, well, why don't I go to the US, maybe for a year or two. Um, I'm sure I'm going to like it. I've seen all the movies, they all look great, and um, uh, I can come back. So um, my parents sent me. I almost came back the following week because there was a mix-up uh, back then. Um, there were not a lot of agencies that sent high schoolers from Bulgaria to the US. Um, uh, I was sent. I was supposed to be in a, in a host family because you cannot just go when you're 16 somewhere else by yourself. But the host family ended up being this uh, Native American uh, uh, a prison guard that had a lot of wolves at home. He believed in a lot of gods. I had to feed the wolves. I had to uh, ride uh, the bus in Florida for two hours in, in the morning, in the evening, while going back and, and uh, coming back from school uh, in the desert. And I was like, wow, I, could, I actually like Bulgaria so much more. It, it doesn't seem like US is right like in the movies. I, I want to come back home and uh, start on September 15th with my 
all, all my friends and continue high school. Uh, and just on my, kind of like a, a, the last couple of days of, of me going back to Bulgaria, had a birthday, uh, one of my classmates told about, told m my story to her parents. And uh, her parents came to me and said, well, if you want, we can be your, your host family. We will adopt you. Just stay. And I did. Very different experience. Um, uh, you know, studying in, uh, you can see here in the picture, Interlachen High School, which is the deep, deep, uh, jungly desert in, in, in uh, Florida, uh, but also connected to um, uh, a lot of Christian activities. Um, my, my family was a baptized, uh, Baptist family that spent every Wednesday, every Sunday going to, to church, and uh, I spent my weekends and uh, you know, going to Disney on church trips and so on. So uh, this was great. And the following couple years, I stayed. Then I stayed a little bit for school, then a little bit for uh, post undergrad um, research at school, uh, just kind of studying to see how I can create actual stuff. Uh, I, I studied electrical engineering, microelectronics, how to create stuff with your hands that people can touch and actually love and, and, and enjoy and, and use. Um, and uh, my, uh, uh, eventually, I uh, graduated. And my first job out of school uh, was for a company that really admired uh, called NVIDIA. You know, NVIDIA makes GPUs for uh, for PCs, for servers. Uh, not many people know, but NVIDIA also makes GPUs for cars. Back in the days, in 2010, 2011, this was just starting up. NVIDIA was trying to make GPUs uh, on embedded system on modules that went into tablets and phones. This thing failed a little bit because the GPUs were kind of big and expensive, too hot. Uh, but they were very, very good for cars. And since the technology uh, was tried out and it was tr transitioning to be more for an, for an automotive use, uh, NVIDIA said, well, uh, you know, this, this is before self-driving cars. This is before mapping all the ro roads in, in 3D. Uh, but what, what we can do is we can go and talk to all the vehicle companies. We can uh, create all the partnerships. We can use our GPUs for their multimedia systems. And, uh, and then eventually, when self-driving cars pick up, then we can use the GPUs for everywhere else in the car, including all, all the cameras. My first project at NVIDIA uh, was in the automotive um, division for Tesla. Tesla, even now, but, but especially back in the days, it was only situated within a few miles away from NVIDIA in the Bay Area. Right next to San Francisco, uh, there is Silicon Valley. San Jose, and the Tesla factory was in Fremont, and their main development office was in Palo Alto. Um, so I spent the following couple of years basically camping out in, in the factory at Tesla, bringing up uh, the multimedia technology, so the, the big screen, the small screen on the first Model S, uh, before it actually came out uh, uh, for people to, to use. It initially didn't work at all. I mean, uh, it, it, it couldn't run for more than 10 minutes at a time uh, on, on any car. And, and eventually, with hundreds of people and a lot of testing, a lot of development, it actually kind of worked. Although the, the first test was when they came out in 2014. They still had some issues. They're fine now. And you can see what's going on with uh, Tesla. Um, so that was, that was my, my first kind of project um, out of, out of, out of uh, university. And uh, it really taught me how to create something, again, that people love to use. It was, it was kind of visible that Tesla is ahead of its time, and it will, it will, it will be different than any other car company because it was creating technology, um, not you know, a vehicle with some technology in it, but technology inside just a vehicle wrapping. Uh, and uh, the main idea uh, that Elon Musk had is, not only going electric, but also creating an amazing experience for people to, to really enjoy when they're in the car. Uh, maybe not enjoy the noise of the engine, not, not a lot of noise, but everything else around the car, acceleration, experience, and UI, UX, uh, you, uh, you know, it's, it's really different in a Tesla. Um, 
so I was uh, traveling around um, uh, the uh, Tesla factory, NVIDIA, when, uh, when NVIDIA said, well, uh, we're doing this with Tesla. We like what we see. We're going to go for all the other car uh, manufacturers to see if they can adopt the same technology. And we started traveling. We uh, went to Ferrari and BMW and Audi, Mercedes, Volvo, a lot of the companies out of, out of Europe, some companies even in, in China, NVIDIA was trying to get into. While, uh, while traveling, while well, actually I, I was on, on, a, on a plane or in between uh, planes, someone from Apple called me. Uh, she was a, a recruiter, and the first thing she said when, when she called me on the phone is, hey, um, I'm calling from Apple, but our conversation should be uh, kept uh, between us. We have a, a position open. It's, um, it's kind of rare that, th that this thing uh, opens up. Uh, come to Apple. We cannot tell you anything more. Uh, come to Apple. We want to show you um, what, what it is, and maybe you can, you can think about if you want to join. So, um, uh, so that's how I, I went to Apple. Back then, the spaceship was not built yet. There were plans to, to, uh, for, for the spaceship to be built. Uh, this was back in 20, 2013. Um, and uh, I found out uh, the team and the projects and, and the actual responsibility was exactly what I was uh, dreaming of. It was, um, it was actually more. It was about taking what Johnny Ives, which is the main d designer uh, back then at Apple, uh, taking what Johnny Ives imagines and what Johnny Ives' his team prototypes uh, just with their hands, with, with some plastics and material, not, not functional, just uh, wrapping around a product, taking that and making it functional uh, from early, early on stage all the way eventually to try out for this to be scaling to mass production. And um, you know, you, you hear about Apple, uh, you see their uh, products come out, what people don't know um, um, that's happening behind the scenes is Usually, when, when, when Apple develops one product, like an iPhone or an iPad, there are 20 other iP iPads and iPhones being developed with the same, uh, at, at the same time, with just a little bit different technologies. And then a few products that are not at all in the same category of what we've seen. Um, and eventually, Apple sees, OK, uh, out of those 20 different prototypes of iPhones, with different technologies. This technology is not ready yet for market. Maybe software is not ready. Maybe yield is not ready. Maybe the UI, UX experience is not ready. This is ready. This is not accurate enough. For example, uh, sensors in the Apple Watch need to be very accurate for Apple to re release a sensor that people can use and depend on. Um, and that's what we were doing. We were just playing around with a lot of prototypes. Um, uh, not playing around, actually uh, developing them in, in, at, at Apple first, then in the factories in, um, in uh, China to, to find what sticks, to find what the best use cases are, uh, the best experiences, the highest accuracy that we can get out of some technology, and then it can go um, into uh, almost mass production. Um, so those were my, my first few years at Apple. It was kind of like an engineering boot camp. Uh, you know, um, I, I would always remember the feeling of Sunday evening, because usually, um, you know, Sunday evening in, in California is Monday morning in, in China. And um, the factory wakes up after a Sunday, usually off time, and things started, start uh, uh, breaking in the factory. Uh, and we get a call. Sunday night, our time, hey, line down. We cannot solve it. Someone needs to come. And it's 10 PM. My manager calls me, uh, can you go on a plane in a couple hours, in, uh, going to Hong Kong, then to Shanghai or Shenzhen? Line is down. There are 20 other people that we're flying in to bring the line up. Because every day, every hour is, is key, especially for something like an iPhone that needs to be released on a very specific date. Uh, which means it needs to be ready to mass produce and all the new uh, product line to be copied 
to 100 lines in China, and then they need to start manufacturing 5 million phones that are ready a week after the announcement of the phone, every day counts. Every day is hundreds of thousands of iPhones not, not, not being built. And it's really important, especially uh, after announcement, Apple to, to have enough supply when there's a lot of demand. Um, so yeah, you, you fly uh, basically an hour and a half after you, you get the call. You go directly to the factory, you camp out for a couple of days, maybe sleep, maybe, maybe you don't sleep, uh, you don't shower, eventually the line is up again. Everyone is happy, you go back to the hotel, you sleep, you don't even want to shower at, the, uh, at this point. And uh, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of the experience of, of a boot camp, creating a product on a very contained timeline, uh, uh, basically doing everything you can, no matter what the budget is, no matter how many people need to be involved, no matter if you need to call the government of China to unblock holidays and worker compensation and everything around the factory and the, in the region that may be happening in China, you do everything you can to make sure something like an iPhone has 10 million iPhones on the day of announcement so they can actually ship. Um, a, a few more things about Apple that you, you may be interested in. Um, so Apple has, as many companies, uh, Apple is developing uh, vertical products like iPhones, iPads, Apple Watches, Apple AirPods, uh, but also um, Apple and other companies are developing horizontal technologies that can be applied to many different products. So in, in this case here, I'm showing the lightning connector. There was a reason why Apple developed the, the uh, lightning connector to have this secure handshake between their uh, products and everything else, including power and uh, accessories. And they usually develop this technology and they, they uh, apply it per a good fit within those uh, vertical products. One of those technologies that um, uh, I was in, involved with that I would say is one of the most complex uh, horizontal technologies is Face ID. So people know about Face ID a little bit. Maybe you have an iPhone, maybe you're using it. My grandfather is 95. He has an iPhone, he has Face ID, he doesn't know he has Face ID. I think he doesn't remember that we enrolled him. He's just swiping up and it just works for him. That's the magic of Face ID. Uh, but people don't realize how, how complex something like Face ID is to, to really develop and deploy into maybe half a billion uh, products. And almost all the time, and by almost I mean 99.99999% of the time, it should actually work. Uh, uh, Apple was really ahead of their time on developing something like that. And even up to this date, nothing like that exists. Nothing like that exists even on Android phones. I'm sorry, Android fans, it's, it's a little different there. Uh, nothing like that even exists in, in the physical world. Um, it took Apple many years, many uh, acquisitions, probably hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe over a billion to create this. Um, and uh, you know, why, why it's so difficult? It's complex, uh, but, but the thing is, it needs to be very accurate. It needs to work all the time. All lighting conditions, all kinds of people, it, uh, it should not be spoofed. One of the biggest things about facial recognition is uh, it needs to work all the time. It needs to let you in, but also it should not let someone else in, which is a real hard part, right? You can, you can show a picture of someone on the other side, or now you have those deep fake videos. It needs to work all the time using 3D and, and infrared and RGB cameras and you know, hybrid different uh, neural nets to really make sure it's, it's, it's dependable. People, people can, can trust that technology. And then on top of it, it needs to be cheap. It needs to be small to, to be integrated in a, in a phone. It needs to be uh, in a not really hot. Uh, it, 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 need, it needs to have all the check marks to, uh, to be able to be deployed in half a billion phones and always work with a yield you know, from a manufacturing perspective of 99.99999. So th that was Face ID, very, uh, very technical product. Now it's been deployed into, into iPhones, into iPads, um, and uh, I'm, uh, we were really excited to, to kind of work on it even from early on 
when there were just schematics and layouts and some of the prototypes from the different acquisitions that Apple, uh, Apple did to kind of get the technology in. Um, this was a, an amazing experience. Uh, and what's, what it, it taught me is how to create something that's so transparent that people, people kind of know about it, but they don't have to realize what's, what's going on. Uh, it, it just works all the time, but, but somewhere on the site. This is the actual magic of, of technology. Um, but then at the same time, even at Apple, even in all, all the factories, we were walking around and we're just looking at the physical environment and we're seeing badges, all the employees badging, and guards, and you know, guards standing by the door asking people to badge in. Especially at, at, at companies like Apple, security is very important. You sign NDAs. Uh, not only when you go in the company, but for every single project you work on, no matter if it's horizontal or uh, vertical, different rooms change uh, security, access control uh, rules. Maybe uh, today the iPhone testing lab will be in lab one, tomorrow is lab two because there are different technologies in there. People move around and, and um, tools move around and the security guards, they don't know. They may be my, my, my friends knowing my name, you know, uh, maybe I've shown them pictures of, of my wife and, 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 and my kids. Uh, they, they wouldn't really know if I'm tailgating someone uh, after someone badged in because they've seen my face go through this room a thousand times in the last couple of months. So how do you solve for this? Well, a guard will kind of look at you. They will do manual facial recognition of, of your face and maybe the picture uh, on the batch, comparing it, okay, you, you look okay, you can, you can go in, you may badge in, but then someone else can go behind you, and if the guard knows that that person, they will let them in. Uh, you can solve this with turnstiles, those revolving gates, asking people to badge in all the time, but those turnstiles are not really fit for everywhere around on campus, maybe in the lobbies, but that's it. So. Um, as we were developing face ID, we said, well, what if we take uh, facial authentication and apply it in the physical world, in the physical environment, in, in the built world for enterprise, for government, where there are high security applications, where you know, maybe companies like Apple can afford a thousand guards, but not all companies can afford a thousand guards, and have the same kind of level of security as if you have a guard, actually better than a guard, for a, a fraction of the cost using hardware, software, machine learning, a computer vision. So that's how we were thinking about um, the early, early stages of Alcatraz. Uh, and then we decided, well, it's going to be easy. We did face ID, piece of cake. We, we know how to do it. We just have to make a big iPhone and put it on the wall, and we call it a product for enterprise. Not really. Uh, very, very different uh, to, uh, to develop. Uh, first, something from scratch, something that Apple doesn't develop, and you don't have the thousands and thousands of people as an infrastructure and all the vendors in the world uh, actually fighting to work with you because they know eventually they will have a contract for millions of something that they will sell to, to Apple. Uh, very different to develop something that's not in your hand, that you can kind of control the environment of, especially in regards to facial recognition. Uh, when, you, when you have to deploy it somewhere and forget about it, but then, especially in an enterprise environment, which is how we envisioned our product to be used, you, you have many people going at different angles, different velocities at the same time, d different environments by themselves, single door, dual door, corridors, hallways, um, uh, people going in and out, people uh, not interacting with technology very well. Maybe, maybe one person will authenticate with their face, but the second person will have a mask, or maybe they'll be texting. You have no idea what the actual use cases and people, people's um, experiences will be, but you have to design for all of those people to make sure you're letting the right people in and you're blocking the not right people out from the facility. So that's what we designed. Uh, very quickly, I'll show you a few videos here so you get an idea. Later on in uh, this afternoon, around 1.32, uh, we'll have some of our team members doing deep dive into machine learning, computer vision, 
hardware uh, on our embedded product uh, and how we do the full stack on-prem and cloud development uh, with a bunch of AI and how we integrate into the infrastructure of those large corporations that we call our clients. I'm just going to go high level here. Um, so that's our product. We call it uh, The Rock, which is the, the nickname of Alcatraz as, a, as an island, as an ex a prison. Now it's kind of like a museum that you, know, you go one time, you just don't want to go again. Um, uh, and the idea for The Rock is uh, it, it does a lot of things by, by itself. Uh, and we call our category of access control autonomous access control, just how you have in, in cars uh, uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, and level five of autonomous vehicles is uh, you may not be uh, in the car even. You just maybe stay at home, the car drives around, maybe the car makes money for you as a taxi, and uh, no one actually needs to watch the car. The same thing is the idea for the rock. People should not really look at it. People should not be interacting with it. It will make decisions by, by itself based on access control uh, and environments and people. Uh, and always have the correct people in and the incorrect people out. Um, a few things uh, on how we uh, developed our technology. We, uh, we, we had to make technology that's, that's based on AI so people can enroll fast. Instead of you going to the badging office, you can, you can just badge in a few times with your current badge, and we'll just learn who you are based on your face and badge, and at some point we'll say, well, uh, we've seen you enough, we, we, we kind of know who the owner is, uh, the next time you show up, we'll just see your face, but we output your batch number as if you batched them. That's, uh, that's how we, we train our algorithms uh, when we deploy the rock on campus. And then after you batch in, now you can do single factor, dual factor authentication. Single factor is easy, you just go. You can see the experience in the video on the top right. You just go. By the time you touch the handle on the door, it's already unlocked. A lot of complex 3D. R, uh, RGB infrared facial recognition with anti spoofing is happening, tailgating check in the back to make sure no one is tailgating, and eventually we output the batch number to the access control system to open the door. But the magic is you just touch the handle and it's already unlocked. Dual factor is something like what we've seen in uh, like online when you log in into your bank account, you get a text message with a code, but in the physical world, you don't want to wait for a text message or an email. You, we do badge and face, and the face verifies that you are the owner of the badge, and that's how we let you in. And then tailgating is pretty easy to explain. Uh, you go, someone else may follow behind. If they don't belong, then we'll notify security. So what are the, the challenges, really, that we experienced um, uh, doing, doing this innovation? So it's not only about innovation of the product. It's an innovation on how you pitch, how you get investments. It's innovation about how you change the legacy mindset of, of the buyer, uh, as, as the buyer is a little bit of an old school type of person, uh, and innovation on how to get real traction fast as a startup, so you actually have the, the runway to show off uh, revenue. So on the, on the VC uh, um, side here, it's really hard to, to, to get an investment for hardware. You know, we do hardware as a service, but still, to create such a complex hardware, it, it's kind of like a robot without arms that we had to create. Uh, it just takes a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of people involved. This is not just a, an app like a Snapchat where you can put it in the App Store and then you can debug if people are having issues and add features and have an MVP within days or weeks. It took us four years and 20 million bucks to, to actually create something that's functional, that we can deploy legally in those companies and, and people can actually use and, and even start giving us feedback. Uh, VCs don't, don't really invest in hardware because their mindset is, well, uh, almost no hardware companies go to IPO, almost no hardware companies have huge exits of tens of billions of dollars or even uh, uh, you know, unicorn level status. Uh, so the risk is really high, risk of you know, how complex the product is and what can go wrong in manufacturing, nowadays supply chain issues through COVID, uh, you know, uh, how long it takes to develop and test, especially when you go to a large enterprise, you don't really get the feedback needed from, from your customers since they don't really want to talk about uh, their issues in security and how you can fix all those issues. It's just there are too many unknowns and it's really hard to, to get investment. 
um, you know, I, I, I probably heard of, uh, more than 300, maybe more than 400 no's in my life. And it kind of p plays a little bit of a, on, on your mindset that, um, you know, is it good enough? Is the product good enough? Is it, are, are you good enough? Is the company good enough? Uh, and I think the takeaway here is never give up. You just keep going, you learn, you perfect, you, you, you just get better and better. Um, so, investment in hardware is hard. That's the point here. Uh, going into a large enterprise with a complex product, also very hard. I, I put down here some of the things that we, we had to work no on that we, we, we kind of call our product. It's not only about the hardware product that, that we have called the Rock, which is the embedded hardware with all the machine learning and computer vision algorithms. It's about its privacy of the templates and the security infrastructure of the corporations we deploy in. Our customer is a typical Fortune 1000 company, government agency with very high, high security standards. Uh, all the requirements uh, on networking and IT infrastructure, uh, a lot of enterprise level certifications that you have to, 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 to show, like penetration testing, UL standards, ISO standards, SOC2 standards to, to kind of prove that you cannot be hacked, that you know what you're doing with all the biometric data. Uh, we had to create this. Uh, and then um, going, going to those large corporations we, we learned early on uh, that we, they, they, they wouldn't allow cloud. We, we, we had to develop an on-prem virtual machine kind of an infrastructure to run all, all the templates and um, uh, you know, create our own Alcatraz in, infrastructure in those companies. Uh, the legacy mindset is also a huge challenge for us. So think about who's the chief security officer at Google. Uh, the guy can be ex-FBI, ex-CIA cop, 30, 40, 50 years of experience. That, that, that guy's job, the main job is to de-risk, to de-risk security, to, to de-risk uh, the, how the employees feel in a, uh, day in and day out around campus, to de-risk maybe cybersecurity in, in the corporation, to de-risk all the vendors that are deploying software and hardware for security at, uh, in, in a company like Google. Um, and those guys don't really, really want to do anything to do with startups. Startups die, products fail, products are not really well tested. They're early on, especially complex products. So it, it was hard for us to convince large corporations to give us a try, because then we have to compete with you know, the, the Nokia, the Blackberry of the world, yes, but those guys are well known with 50 years of, of experience, the security guards, the, the, the security guards and the decision makers, they, they know them. They've been, a, you know, in conferences with them, they've, uh, they've, they, they've talked to their executive team, they know them in person. And us as Alcatraz, no one knows, knows us. So, and it's kind of hard for us to to talk about our real customers, because no one wants to be talked about. No one wants to, to, to show publicly that they have Alcatraz as a product within their environment. Um, the last thing I want to mention that was a, a challenge for us is how to gain traction with the investment uh, that we, we had. So it was very hard to get investment through many rounds of funding. Usually, this is a good graph, a good time versus revenue graph of a software as a service company. You have an idea, you get a, you get a little bit of an investment, it's called pre-seed, then you develop your MVP through pilots, you do some pilots, you get more investment, because now new investors, current investors will, will, will see, okay, there is a customer here, a customer there, they are willing to give you some money. If we give you more money, then you can, you can hire more people and scale, and then you, you get a, you know, a C round, Series A round, uh, larger investments to really go maybe into different markets, maybe create new uh, products, and have a successful company on a contained timeline scaling. So that's the, a good, typical, I would say, SaaS traction um, representation of what, what should happen in a company with a potential product market fit. What's going on with hardware companies is it's a bumpy road. It takes a lot more money. You can see here the differences in the, in the uh, dollar signs in the pre-seed, seed, and series A and series B rounds. 
it takes more money, more time. It's a non-dependable sales cycle, especially when you go to large corporations with, um, uh, with decision makers that take too long, with many customers inside the corporation, with many, with many um, signatures that need to be uh, done on the privacy, security, networking side, actual sales cycles that are so long uh, that you really, as a, as a company, as a startup, you don't know what to expect. And investors say, well, we need to give you 5x more money. There are so many unknowns uh, with hardware, with manufacturing, with deployment, with, with maintenance and operational scalability of the company. It's too much risk. Uh, we, we, we've seen the other 1,000 companies that create hardware, no matter how magical it is, and 99% fail. It doesn't work for us. So that was our challenge, how to quickly run, and with a little investment and a little more investment, we show our investors there is a real market for this, and we can actually make it. We just have to get a little more money, and we need a little more time. So that's, uh, that's kind of my, uh, my long story short. Um, I think I want to finish with, um, uh, with, a, with a few takeaways here. Um, always have an open mindset, no matter if you're creating your own company or you work uh, uh, for a company that's creating products. The product need, needs to give real value, and, and your customers need to love the product. Always talk to, to the customer and iterate, no matter how hard it is. For us, it was very hard initially to talk to, to anyone because no one wanted to share the heavy issues with physical security. Uh, it's okay to fail. I failed hundreds of times when listening to various nice, gentle no's by investors and other 100 times by customers. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it always takes, you know, here it says double, but actually triple the time, triple the money, triple the effort, triple the, the, the tears uh, that you will have through a journey to create while dreaming and exploring. Thank you. Q&A now or later? Ivan. Ivan, Q&A now or later? Or rather. Now? All right, Q&A. Any questions? What are the prospects for us to deploy our technology in private homes? Great prospects. Um, uh, as, a, as a company, we're always thinking about how to expand our uh, market and go downstream into mid-sized businesses, small businesses, and eventually residential homes. Um, it's just the technology needs to be more m mature, uh, I would say cheaper, uh, be able to be created more at scale. It's actually easier to, to deploy uh, facial recognition technology or facial authentication technology for homes because then you don't have to enroll thousands of people and moving uh, uh, templates and enterprise environment with all the certifications. Um, it's just, it, it would take some, some time to make it perfect for homes, but you can look out for those kind of things in, in a few years, kind of like a, a nest or you know a ring doorbell, but with facial recognition, it's it, it, it will happen. Yes. Can you speak up, please? Can I mean, someone repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, oh, can you hear yeah. me now? Yeah. About the bootcamp, if that saves that much money, why weren't you there pre-hand? I mean, if that happens so often, getting a call at 10 p.m., why weren't you there pre-hand so that can be avoided? And yeah. Uh, if so, I, you're talking about the the bootcamp in in China, and if it happens so often, whether yeah, so there um, many companies, including Apple, that have local engineers thousands of engineers in those different facilities, like 
Foxconn, Pegatron, the different factories, the different vendors bringing up the technologies and eventually integrating the technologies in a new product line to eventually go to mass production. Um, but there is development. As the technology is being developed in China, there is also development in Cupertino or in, in, in the actual office where engineering is congregated in a company like Apple. And, and every once in a while, uh, we, we learn about uh, some, some bugs uh, that only a few people uh, did analysis on. They're experts in those fields. For example, a display technology or a touch technology. You know, think about, you know, PhD, AX students that dedicated all, all their life on how to create the best possible touch technology uh, to, to give you the best experience, for example, right? Though not all the time those, those, those people can be camping out all the time or move, uh, or move to China. You know, they may be in California or Germany or somewhere else. And if we need an expert to solve some kind of an issue, uh, through testing, calibration, or you know, bringing up software and hardware, you have to ship that, that engineer or team of engineers to, to China. And there are so many issues and so many experts are, uh, around the world, especially in Cupertino. You, you just move people around all the time, every week, every, every day, to really make sure you expedite the line down of that different technology, because you cannot continue through the line uh, when developing a product, if, uh, if one of a thousand things, one thing fails, you cannot continue on the next process of the testing or calibration. Uh, one question regarding the long kind of prototype phase here. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, how do you keep the team focused during this long prototype phase? Like, how do you know that you're really focused on the core things and you're not like building features that are not? essential or will not uh, improve the actual end customer value? Like, how do you basically know that you're doing the right thing? How do you, what is your feedback cycle in this kind of long prototype uh, game? <laughs> yeah, good question. So, um, uh, if talking about Apple, there is no customer feedback, right? Apple invents products with the vision of you make them and people will buy them. Uh, you delight the customer after they've seen the product or the product category that Apple is inventing. Many times now Apple is not inventing a, a category, they're joining a category that's already there, but they create something that's uh, more perfected, more well-rounded. At Alcatraz, it was really hard for us to, to get feedback by the customer because, uh, again, the customer is a large corporation or government. They they don't want to give us feedback. All of, all our, most of our uh, products that are deployed on-premise, air-gapped. Alcatraz doesn't have access to the data. We can't even log in and see what's going on. Even if they tell us our product doesn't work, we have no idea what doesn't work. For them, oh, it, do, it doesn't authenticate. So we have to fly in, uh, someone, an engineer, in to debug the issue. Through this, we kind of get the feedback, OK, that's how, um, that's how we use it, that's what happened. Maybe it's an infrastructure, some kind of wiring issue, and we always try to iterate. Early on when prototyping, we had some hardware issues, some machine learning, different corner cases of different lighting conditions. For example, um, I remember uh, a large corporation that also has a huge presence in Bulgaria as a, as a large office. Uh, they were doing a pilot with us. And they, they call us and they said, well, your product doesn't work. We've been testing it, but there is this guy that, uh, that, that's, that's trying to authenticate, and, it, and it, it doesn't work for that guy. Uh, fortunately, this was cloud connected, so we could see what's going on. Well, the guy had a, a mask, um, uh, sunglasses, a hoodie, uh, uh, and then kind of zipped up up to, up to here. And uh, he, he was trying to run towards uh, the, you know, through, through the door with, uh, with a light shining behind him. And you know, we are, we are facial recognition technology. We need some, some form of a face. It's like doing fingerprint scanning, but you have gloves. It's hard to authenticate. Uh, fortunately, we were actually able to solve uh, a, a lot of those challenges with just data and 
uh, training of new neural nets to kind of compensate for the different lighting conditions, uh, different skin tones, maybe not needing the full face, but a portion of the face, uh, which affects accuracy, but the experience is also important depending on the, on the deployment and how many people enrolled, and then just go. You, you deploy the new software uh, to the customer and you get their feedback, and then if it's great, then you deploy to everyone else. And that's how you kind of solve for all the different corner cases of whatever you didn't test in the lab. Right, but it's uh, it's one out of many, but not enough uh, feedback cycles we have. Just because our customer is not a typical a customer, they're very um, limited in what they want to share. Thank you so much. Test, test, one, two, three. Okay, merci.
Hello everyone, sorry for the delay. Okay, uh, hello everyone, my name is Nikki, and today I'm going to talk about the power of the observability and how to unleash it. Um, so we are all be building software uh, that is running on frameworks, built on top of frameworks, that are running on top of frameworks that are built on top of other people's computers, uh, the cloud. And we are creating these very complex systems with multiple levels of abstractions. And all the time we want to know, are those systems working properly? Is everything working fine? And uh, this is where observability comes to help. Uh, basically, uh, the practice of observability includes monitoring, uh, logging, and distributed tracing. And all of the three combined is uh, what allows you to have an overview of your system. Is it working fine? Is there a problem with it, etc.? cetera? Um, I'm, I'm going to start with the first one, with monitoring. <coughs> um, this is what a dashboard look, looks like, and monitoring helps you build those kinds of dashboards. As you can see, this is a dashboard that is showing metrics for a database. You can see uh, the memory that it, that it uses, the CPU utilizations, the free file descriptors, and a lot of useful information that where, when you look at it, you have this picture that is showing you, oh, is my system working or not? Uh, and the typical monitoring system is built out of a couple of components. We have the backend of the monitoring system. We also have a time series database that's doing all the magic. And we have a dashboard. Um, the typical system combines the backend and the database together. And the time series da database is a specialized database that allows you to store time series data. And time series data is data where we have a timestamp and a value that changes over time. Um, and you have these sequences of time value, time value, time value. And uh, the time series database is very efficient at, at storing this kind of information as well, and also executing different operations on top of this data. Um, yeah, and the typical systems that are used for monitoring are Prometheus, Grapha, Graphite, and M3DB. Uh, and for the dashboard, the typical thing that's mostly used are uh, Prometheus UI and Grafana. And, uh, here is how the thing look in your code. Uh, let's say that we're building a product. In our case, um, we have a search functionality in our system. It's a healthcare system, so you can search for patients or for their exams. Um, and you can search for, for things. And you can, every time when you, the user searches something, can you get, get them the search results back? You count that it's successful. OK, the search is success, successful. I have a counter, and I'm incrementing it. And you can see that it grows over time. Uh, this is the uh, one thing, the counters are one abstraction that the monitoring system supports. And you can also execute different operations of, on top of this data that's stored. Um, and over here, you can see that we have applied an increment fun uh, increased function on top of the data. And you can see basically how the value changes over time. And uh, you can see at the end that it's dropped. You, you, on this graph, it's more obvious at the end that it drops to 0. You can say, OK, it's dropping to 0. Is there a bug in my code and it's not working? Or maybe it's the end of the business day and people just start stopped using the software? Or what happened? It gives you a flag that something is wrong. Uh, you can also measure the execution time of stuff. Um, so you, you can have timers that measure the latency, the time it takes for something to be executed. And over here, here is an example of measuring time for our search code that is uh, measuring the time it takes to go to the search engine, get the result back, parse them, and return them to the front end. Um, and you can add labels to the metrics. Uh, so here you have a counter, and you can type for, you, you can add labels that are meaningful to your application. And later you can filter or group by those metrics. And over here you can see that we have added type for, of the search. And there is a different graph for how many times somebody searched for a patient or how many time they, times they search for an exam. And if one of those two drops to zero, you can say, OK, I have a problem with my search code. Then you can dry, dive deeper and say, OK, it's with the code for searching this entity. And it's more, more easy to find where the bug is. So the first tip that I have for you for today is always add domain-specific labels um, to, to your code so you can uh, 
have the context of the measurement that you're taking, and you can use this context to better evaluate the possible root cause of the issues that you're detecting or the desirable behavior that, that you want, so you can replicate it somewhere else in some other domain in, in your application. Uh, the next thing to keep in mind is called cardinality. So the cardinality basically, basically tells you uh, how many time series are created from each measurement. And let's go back to the previous example with the search. We want to log the type of the search, and we also want to log the application version. So if the successful search is dropped to zero, I can say, OK, for which application version this is happening? And I can, I can say, OK, for this version, there is a bug in my code, and I can go to Git and check, OK, what are the commits there, and find the problem. Uh, but the problem is that every combination between labels creates a different time series. And over here, if we say that we have two versions for the applications in two types of search, two by two makes four different time series that um, our time series database is storing. And uh, we, sh we should avoid using high cardinality metrics, uh, high cardinality tags, something that creates has a lot of different values that grows, grows over time, because the time series database are good at storing time series data, points in time, but they're not good at working with many time series. Uh, time series. Um, and you, you can get to a point where you're bringing the whole database down and uh, basically can incur monitoring infrastructure just by introducing, um, by, by an error, introducing some high cardinality tax. And the, last, and the next tip that I have for you um, on, on monitoring is learn the query language. Just like we have SQL that allows us to look for data and apply operations like sum or unique or max or min, it is the same with the query language for our monitoring system, and we need to spend time to learn it. And there are some specifics on working with timers, and we also need to learn what those are, how to use percentiles, what, why to use percentiles, and how to use histograms, etc. And uh, it's great, right? We have monitoring, we have set up the right labels, and um, how are we going to detect issues with our code? We can build those dashboards and have people sitting in front of computers all day, looking at the screens and trying to notice when something breaks. And this is very inefficient, right? And very tedious job. Uh, and this is where uh, automatic alerts come in to help. Um, and here is an example of one alert. You can say, well, I have a success rate for my search, search code. And I get the success rate by dividing the number of uh, successful uh, responses by the number of total requests that are sent to, to this code. And one divided by the other gives us the success rate. Um, and I say, OK, if the success rate drops below 70%, then it's a real issue, and you need to ping the engineers that are working on this functionality. Um, and you can have different alert values. We can say, OK, if it drops below 90%, first send um, a message to our Slack or Teams channel. And then if it drops below 70%, then notify the on-call engineers about the incident. Um, and the alerting tool, the place where you define your alerts, is usually built inside the metric system. Um, and uh, there is a different component in it than it allows you to define alerts and work with alerts uh, more, yeah, better. Uh, and yeah, the alerting tool is built into the system. And uh, there are a couple of things that you should keep in mind when you're uh, thinking about alerts. Alerts should be urgent. It should be something that needs to be looked at right now um, and something that's, that's uh, impactful, something that's important to the users, users care about, they care about, this is why we care about. It's important to the users, it's important to us. And alerts should not notify about such important failures in our system. Also, the alert should be actionable. Um, if your own co-engineers are getting alerts and they're like, oh, I know this alert is happening every hour, so I'm just going to ignore it. Uh, this is creating a bad habit of people ignoring alerts. It's creating a lot of noise. People are not looking at the correct things. So alerts should be actionable, and they should be also real, something that is really breaking in your system. Um, and there are a couple of ways to think about alerting. And the first view that you can look your alerting over is symptom-based monitoring. And symptom-based monitoring is when you monitor the symptoms of failures. 
uh, one symptoms may be the number of uh, 500 response code in your requests or increased response time or your email sending is not working. This is a symptom that can uh, have multiple causes or your users cannot log in. This is again a symptom of a problem. Maybe um, your database where you store the users are not, is not working. Maybe your backend cannot communicate with the database because there's a network networking issue. Uh, maybe uh, you have a bug in your login code. There, there are different causes that can trigger this symptom. And with this type of monitoring, we just look at the symptoms. Um, and the, on the other side, we have cost-based monitoring. Uh, for example, the database where your uh, users cannot log in, where you store the database information with the user information, and you cannot uh, work with this database because there is no free disk space on the server. This is the cause of the issue why your users cannot log in. And yeah, you can cost-based monitoring, and where you're looking for specific causes of failures. And you need to keep in mind that many causes may trigger a symptom. In my previous example, users cannot log in because uh, there's a bug in the code, the network is down, the firewall is misconfigured, um, the database is not working, the database doesn't have uh, free space, it runs out, out of file descriptors, you have memory leak in your code, many, many different causes may trigger a symptom. But at the end of the day, the user's impact is the most important thing. Basically, users want to log in, they cannot log in, and this is why they care about. They don't care if your database is not working, they don't care if your network is misconfigured, they cannot log in. Um, and this is why it's very important to focus on symptom-based alerts, because sim the symptoms of issues is what your users care about, and with a single symptom-based alert, you can catch many, many different causes that may trigger it. Um, and you, if you are wondering, well, okay, uh, where to start replacing alerts, the best place is always pick uh, the component that is closer to the client. So for example, in your front end, you can count the number of times that users are can, yeah, can log in successfully or they cannot log in. Um, and this, this will tell you maybe your load balancer is misconfigured, maybe you have a bug in your code in the back end, maybe your database is not working. And you can also do it, do it in, in the most up, most closer to the client place in your backend. For example, in your, your load balancer, in your reverse proxy, you can have a request success rate for all the requests. And if uh, the success rate of one of your endpoints uh, falls below a certain, certain level, you can get an alert. And this will allow you to catch all the issues with your endpoints on symptom-based level. You're not going to know what the cause is, but you will know that there is a problem, and this is super important. And great, we have alerts. Um, we, we we get an alert where something is broken, but now the question is how to find the issue. You start, start scratching your head, okay, how to find the, the problem now? I know that it's in this component and then there there is a problem. Um, and this is where logging comes into place. With logging, you um, have a system that aggregates the logs that your applications produce and store them in a central, central place and it has Typical system has a couple of components. There are your applications, then there is some infrastructure that's actually collecting the logs and storing them inside the database. And the two most popular options here are log, stash, and fluentd. And you have a database that you usually a reverse index database. That's Elasticsearch, Loki, or there are the popular alternatives. You have a dashboard that Kibana is like the people automatically assume when they uh, think about logging. Um, and well, here is how logging looks in your code, and there are different levels that you can set on your uh, logs. You can have an info level log, warn level log, or error level log. Um, and yeah, with info, you're, on, you, you're just notifying um, if something happened in my application. With warn level, you, you have the semantic that maybe something is an issue and you want to look at it. And with error level, it's like, okay, this is something that is breaking, we need to check. Uh, what's happening. So use appropriate log level every time when you, um, yeah, when you work, when you add logging in your code. And the next super useful strategy to use over here is called structured logging. And with structured logging, you append useful key value pairs in your log that looks like this. Um, here, for example, we have failed to generate PDF, and then we can say, okay, for this particular template. And then I can go in my Kibana, 
and I can say, okay, group this message by the template, template name. And I can say, okay, for this template, there are 19 such errors. For this template, there are three, and there are no other errors for other templates. It basically groups and sums by, by those key value pairs, and it allows you, allows you to troubleshoot easier. You can say, okay, the problem is with this specific template. Maybe the HTML there is broken or something, and I can look at it and, yeah, uh, find the issue is easier. And always put your log statements after something happens, not, not before that. So, for example, if you want to record that the search request is successful, return the response and then log that it's successful. And um, we have monitoring, uh, logging, alerts uh, that show us the health of a single component, but sometimes we have this complex system of interconnected services, components that talk, talk with each other, and we want to be able to also troubleshoot those systems to see how the, the behavior of the system changes under load over time, what are the slowest requests, what, what are the certain requests that are failing, well, what is the path that these requests go through. And in order to illustrate this, I need a more complex example. Um, so let's say we have a client that first needs to authenticate to the authentication service. Then it needs to go to the billing service and say, okay, is, did the user pay for something? And then they can go to the third service, that's resource service, and then they can return the resource if the user is authenticated and they paid to access it. And you can see that over here we have a scenario where our logic where, where our execution flow goes through a couple of services. And with monitoring and, alert and uh, logging alone, it's very hard to figure out the end-to-end -end flow. And uh, this is where the next thing comes into place. Distributed tracing transforms the previous picture into this thing. And each line here is called a span, and you can zoom inside it, and you, you can see, okay, um, the client started the transaction. In blue, you can see how much time it it took for the um, execution inside the load balancer. Then you can see how many, how much time it took for the request for the execution of the request inside the authentication service for the execution of uh, this request inside the billing service, and then in the um, resource service. And you can also dig deeper and say, okay, what are the functions that are the components inside those this service that were executed? You can see how many, how much time each of the, those takes. Um, there are different tracing systems out there that you can pick from. Um, this is one example of such a system, Jaeger, that's very popular. Uh, here you can see that on the left side you have a menu that allows you to filter traces. You can say, okay, give me uh, all requests that, are, that originate from this service or that terminate in this service. You can say, okay, give me all requests in this time span or that has these labels. Um, and then on the right side, you see the, the results, and you can see this graph where the, it shows you how much time it takes for an end-to-end -to -end request to be executed. You can see the outliers, click on the outliers. And then uh, here, is, here is what you see, basically this picture that is showing you which steps are executed in parallel, which steps are sequential, how, how much time it takes to query different databases. Over here we have MySQL, MongoDB, um, and you can even dig deeper and see the SQL queries or the MongoDB requests that were e executed. And basically, you can also add additional information to, to those uh, spans. You can add log logs inside it, each of those. This is how you add your SQL statement inside your um, span where, where you're making a request to the database. This is where you can also add some domain-specific information. Um, so, one, yeah. Something to keep in mind is to always add logs to, and tags to your traces uh, so you can easier filter those out and debug issues when you have such issues. And another thing to keep, is, keep in mind is always add trace ID to logs. Um, your logging infrastructure can add um, keywords that are added by default when the thing start, starts up. Uh, for example, it adds the IP address where the uh, log was produced or the application name and you can configure it to add also the trace ID. This, this will allow you to, when you see a certain trace in your tracing system, get the trace ID, open your logs, filter your more detailed logs to, to see what you're looking for. Um, basically, easier to debug it. And my next recommendation is always add consistent labels across metrics, logs, and traces. Um, so when you have, um, for example, the type of the search, always add it to, to your logging with the same type 
search uh, in, in your metrics, in your logs, in your traces, and this will allow you to cross-reference between the three. You can say, okay, let me see the logs that are related to searching for patients, for example. Let's see the uh, metrics, let's see the traces, and yeah, you'll be, be, you'll be able to more easily co collaborate the three systems. And uh, the last thing that I have uh, for you today is something to look forward to. Um, so you can see that the three things are very interconnected. And one of the advices is put logs inside traces, put trace ID inside logs, use consistent labels between the three systems. And you can see, okay, it looks like the three are interconnected. Why we are using three different systems for this thing? Shouldn't there be one standard to rule them all and one system to, to use it? And this is what where open telemetry comes into place. Um, it's a standard that's just getting started to be adopted that has the client libraries, the backend infrastructure that allows you to use one client library, get monitoring, logging, distributed tracing um, with a single in instrumentation, and then have the, the backend take care of storing the correct piece of information inside the correct type of database because it's, it needs a different database, a different type of data that has its own different query characteristics, um, storage optimizations, needs, um, querying specificities, and everything that's, that's related to this. Um, and with this, I want to thank you for your time and looking forward to your questions. Year, they've changed. Oh, yeah. yeah, they've changed their licensing model from yeah, Apache to zero to AGPL. Yeah. How how did that affect you, and what did you do to, to deal with it? Well, well, it 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 affect. So basically, uh, the we if you're if you're really investing in something, you get a, you you know um, it's better to get a a support for it. <laughs> so there is a different, uh, yeah, you can basically buy support for those things and then there is different things that you're running. But if you don't want their open source projects, you can use those. Um, if you're basically, if you're distributing them, you need to, in, in part of some uh, stuff, you need to open source the whole stuff, right? Um, and, but if you're, if it's part of your SaaS application, um, then and you, and you're not selling it, uh, the problem was with another company basically putting this, these kinds of software, exactly Elasticsearch was a good example, was the, maybe the trigger that triggered this. So if you get Elasticsearch, you put something in front of Elasticsearch and you start selling this, this is where you get into, into problem, right? But if you're using it for your op operations, uh, then it's a different story. You cannot sell other, people, other people's things yeah, just by rebranding them. And this is what you're referring to, right? And the yeah, thing exactly. that, that you need to keep in mind. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Some other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, how do you decide what is the best system to pick? You have different options for monitoring, for logging, for tracing. Um, how do you pick what to do? Um, so you look at your um, infrastructure that you're already using. If you're, for example, if you're using a lot of, um, a lot of uh, um, cloud native foundation um, projects, then you you go to the uh, Cloud Native Foundation website, you see what are the things that are part of this initiative, and then the things that are inside the same ecosystem integrate very well with each other. Um, if you're not, um, if you're running more Apache stuff, then you go to the, to the Apache project and you, and you check there. Um, you also, if you have experience, then with some stuff that it's a no-brainer, you can use the thing that you're most experienced with. Um, at the end of the day, it's like every software, you pick different options, you evaluate the pros and cons of each option inside your context, and you 
pick what's best in your context. Uh, it depends on the infrastructure that you're running. If you're in, in a cloud, you can use some managed solutions. If you're on-prem or if you're running your own infrastructure, then you need to also run your monitoring infrastructure. And there is a third option. There are SaaS-based products that you can use as a service. You just instrument your code. Um, and there are wonderful solutions out there that uh, works with kernel modules. Um, and you just add your, some extensions to your kernels where your applications are running. And then you have observability. Um, that, that, inc that includes distributed tracing and monitoring. Um, there are yeah, many different options. You need to pick what's best for you. If you're OK with spending money or, and, you have, and you want faster time to market, you want something that's running just out of the box, you don't have a team to support the system, um, then you pick either a managed solution or a SaaS-based solution. If, you're, uh, if you have, if you, yeah, it's more efficient for you to have your team supporting you running the systems, then you pick the system and you run it yourself. So yeah, it really depends on the on the context and you need to be aware of your context and work inside of it. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much.
over this mic. Hello. Okay, so we are ready for our next speaker. Uh, just before that, I want to let you know that there is a special area uh, on the right corner where you can meet uh, all of the speakers after that and have a chat if there is no enough time for questions. So our next speaker is Alexandrina Todorova. She is a quality engineering uh, leader at Musala Soft and an IoT expert. In the past couple of years, she's working on uh, smart home platform solutions. And today, she would like to share with us uh, the challenges her team had uh, with the physical dependencies and the devices, especially uh, when the pandemic started. So, Alex, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thanks for presenting me. And uh, today, I want to share with you the challenges we had the past uh, couple of years since the pandemic started. So, uh, I'm working in the IT industry for more than five years, and uh, I'm passionate about automation, testing strategies, and infrastructure configurations for efficient CI CD. And as I mentioned, we will talk about Internet of Things. This is the agenda, and we will speak of what IoT actually is, uh, and more specific, our smart home solution. Um, as well, uh, I want to share with you what actually do I mean by physical dependency and uh, how we have managed to solve it using mock services. So, Internet of Things. I think that most of you already know what the Internet of Things is and are somehow part of it. But the thing is that it is a network of uh, physical devices connected to the Internet worldwide. So, those devices are all collecting and sharing data. And um, today, worldwide, there are like 10 billion connected IoT devices, and experts are expecting this number to grow up to 22 billion by 2025. So, today, there are more smart devices worldwide than human beings. And uh, to get a better understanding, I'll start with an example from my current project. Imagine a cloud-based smart home platform which uh, allows the customers to connect devices from different manufacturers and to create uh, automations and configurations based on their setup. You probably all have some smart devices at home. For example, if you have a vacuum cleaner, this vacuum cleaner has its own application to be controlled. Um, if you have a smart camera, you have a second application for, it, for this. If you have a smart air conditioner, you have a third application. And that's what we are not doing here. We want to have one platform for all of the vendors and to be able to create automations between them. So um, the automations that we can make are like turn on the vacuum cleaner when I leave my house, close the shutters when it starts to rain, and my favorite one is simulate presence when I'm on a vacation. So it happens by sporadically turning on lights, music, and TV on. And in order to test this platform, we have a team structure with distributed teams where each team is responsible for a specific feature. The development happens on feature branches, and a smoke test set of the automated tests are running against those feature branches. And when the time for a release comes, uh, we are creating a build from the, from the master branch and we are performing a full regression testing. And um, we have like 800 test scenarios per platform, which are partially automated. And in order to test them, we have uh, physical setups at the office uh, with connected physical devices and gateways. And Going back to the example for the shutters and the rain, in order to test it, we need to take the actual sensor and to put it under a running water and to verify that the shutters will actually close. And dependencies. What is the physical dependency? Actually, currently in the IoT world, there is no answer to that question. What is actually the physical dependency? But what we need to know is that we need to make sure that the devices work together. And um, as I mentioned, there are more than 10 billion devices worldwide. So in order to test, we cannot ensure that our product will work with all of them. And as well, they cost money, they are taking up space, and 
they need some additional resources like internet, Bluetooth, or other connectivity. Uh, they, they need electrical installations and batteries. So this is how much batteries we are consuming in order to, in order to test those devices. And uh, to get a better vision how the real testing environment looks like, I've made some pictures of our office. So these are the devices. We have like thousands of devices from small ones like bulbs, door window sensors, um, grass mowers, and dishwashers. Um, and here, is a, here are two pictures from the testing labs that we have for the laundry space and the kitchen corner. So, you probably think that we are washing our clothes there. <laughs> actually, <laughs> actually no, but the fridge is full with wine for successful deliveries. <laughs> and uh, here the challenge came because we have, as you see, we have one fridge, we have one washing machine, and we have 16 distributed teams that sometimes they need to test those devices, so they need to wait on a queue for the resources. That's not a problem when we are at the office, but the problem scaled when the pandemic came. We needed to find a way to keep people safe by moving them at their homes and not to uh, interrupt the delivery process at the same time. And how to move this fridge at home? Um, first of all, we decided to split the smaller devices, like the door sensors, the bulbs, and we have created uh, testing environments at people's places, and for those bigger devices, we have mounted cameras in order to observe their behavior remotely. So the last thing was um, some network configurations were changed at the office so we can access the devices remotely, and yeah. This is, on the left, this is the grass mower, and on the right, it is the vacuum cleaner. Okay, we found a way to somehow manage to proceed working with this setup, but still, um, a successful product needs more and more resources, so we needed to find a way to multiply those devices, and we decided to go for mocking the, the services. Uh, we have implemented mock services and virtual devices. So the reason was that we wanted faster and independent automated tests. We wanted to have a wider variety of devices and states so we can provide, now actually every team can create a setup based on their needs and to simulate the, the states of the devices if they are on or off, if they are showing a specific temperature value or volume of a speaker and scalability. And the technologies for mocking, we conduct the research for some of the existing uh, solutions that were on the market about mocking, like wire mock, but uh, they were either too expensive or they did not meet actually our requirements because the most important for us were to persist the state of the devices. And what do I mean by per persisting the state is? Imagine that this cloud here is the environment, the mocked environment. We have the environment, we are deploying the mocked services on it. And this is the testing team they, are, they all want to, to test on this environment. For example, tester one wants to simulate the change of the state of um, mock device, which is on this example, a white bulb, which is turned on on 100% brightness. And in that case, with um, the existing solutions, it, needed, um, it is changing the state for all of the users logged into this environment. And what we made, we've made a custom solution using Quarkus framework. And what we gain from that is that same environment, same deployment mock services. And uh, here in this example, the tester is changing the state of the bright, the brightness state of the white bulb, and it is not affecting the work of any of the other users. So in that way, we can test independently and not to interrupt. We are not interrupting the the work of the other team members. And what are the benefits from mocking? Improved parallel run. So in the beginning, with the real setups, we have two real setups with two gateways and connect devices to them. And uh, imagine the pipelines. You have like 50 pipelines per day that are running. They are put it on a queue. So the first pipeline is getting the resources, and the other pipelines are in a pending status until the resources are freed. 
So in that way, we're using mock services, we can create a separate environment for every feature branch. And that's how we can run multiple pipelines simultaneously. The second one is, as I already mentioned, wide variety of devices. Every team can configure the, set, the desired setup. Everyone can have a fridge and uh, oven and so on. And the state simulation. Uh, remember the example with the white bulbs? We can, we can uh, simulate all of desire, the desired states that a device has. And last but not least, um, the environmental impact. We, are, we have dramatically reduced the energy consumption, the, 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 the usage of batteries and uh, plastic for the device itself. And as well, those are the challenges that we had. The first one was that mocks are not 100% reliable. Uh, we have increased costs in the beginning uh, and time-consuming connection creation for the mock services, and we'll go one by one. So the first one is that we cannot rely 100% on something that is not real, because that's not what the customer will receive after all. The customer will receive a physical product with electronic parts, firmware, and so on. And um, what we did to ensure that our product will work we have created a nightly schedule with the automated test that is running against real setup. So the pipelines during the day are running with mock services, and everything that is go goes to the master branch is tested during the night, and in the morning we can see the reports of the real environment results. And the second one is the increased costs. This means that we have, with this implementation of the mock services, we have increased the money that we are paying to Asia for pot usage, and it's scaled up to 1,000 euros per day on top with what we paid. So initially, imagine the, the temporary environment, the blue ones are the temporary environments. We have this temporary environment, we are deploying the mock services. We are creating a separate environment, we are deploying the mock services again. And those deployments are consuming the resources. So we needed to find a faster way to, to save some money. And what we did, the purple one, I hope that you can see it well, is a temporary environment. We have created a temporary environment with pre-deployed mock services and a bridge implementation that is using the already deployed services. And that's how we have decreased um, the expenses to less than 300 euros per day. And the last one, the initial connection of the mock services is time consuming. What I mean is that the real setup is already configured. Some will have configured it with uh, real gateway, real connected devices, and all we need to do is just to log in with a specific user and password, and we are starting to use those devices. But for the mock services, it's not exactly the same case because we have the environment, we need to wait the deployment of the environment, the backend services, the mock services. After that, we are logging to a brand new environment and we, we need to go through all the pairing flows. For example, we want a bulb, we need to go select bulb model, etc. We want to have um, some additional devices. And we are going to do to this flow and it is taking up uh, like um, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It depends on the amount of devices that we want to connect. And together with the development team, we decided to implement some solution that is adding uh, the devices automatically on the login. So that's how we have speeded up the tests with around 10 to 15 minutes. And uh, as well, we have checked the performance of the automated test itself. We did multiple things to, to save the time and uh, the connection creation improvements. And um, we have removed some weights and some fun functions were improved and refactored in order to make the tests running faster themselves. And the last thing was that we decided to create a smoke test set and a full regression test set. The smoke test set contains the critical priority test cases and it is executed, as I mentioned, on the feature branches during the day. It is running on mocked environment and the full regression test set is the one that contains all the priorities. And it is running against a real environment during the night. And this is one example of 
how we are handling the, the conditions in the test. If you want to run a specific test on a mocked environment on a real envir or on a real environment, the ones in the brackets are the parameters that we are putting the, the, exact, the exact conditions in order to differentiate if you want to run those tests on mocked or on a real environment. And if we leave it empty, it means that those tests are supported for both environments and we can proceed without failing tests. And after those metamorphoses, this is how the final, this is the final look of uh, pipeline conf configuration. So the first step is creating the environment. After that, we are deploying the mock services or the real services, depending on our needs. After that, we are executing the automated tests and we are creating a report of the quality of the desired branch. And as well, the last stage is to destroy the, envi the environment, which is saving us some resources that are not needed anymore. And here is an example, just a short example, how the reports look like for the automated tests. On the left, you can see the tests that are running on mocked environment. You can see that they are less than the ones on the right. That be that's because those are the critical scenarios from a specific feature. And on the right, here it is the report which is running during the night on the live configuration, and it includes all the priority test cases. And that's how we have managed to, to decrease the time for pipeline execution from 60 minutes to 20 minutes. And what I want you to remember from my presentation is that think of something that is taking you time, resources, or any kind of effort, and together with your team, try to find a solution for this because you can always decrease the time that is needed for a specific thing to be done. So, thank you. And if you want, we can chat a little longer after on the, what was the launch? <laughs> the, the, speech, the speakers won't, yeah. Do you have any questions now? <laughs> Wait for the mic. <laughs> uh, so my question is about the Nitron on the live environment. Uh, do you make assertions, uh, for example, the light bulb? If uh, the test tests the brightness from 20 to 100 percent, do you make assertion if the real device actually become brighter? If uh, the bulb actually, actually, on this stage, no. Uh, we are verifying those states uh, manually on the regression phase. We are ve verifying that the change state is activating some automation, for example, mm -hmm. uh, when. Um, the example with uh, the water sensor, if we have water, we want something else to happen. And we can simulate the water and to see if the result of the other connected device mm -hmm. will, will be the expected one. But we need to ensure that the customer will, th this scenario will work with the customer, so we are testing as well on real setup. Mm -hmm. The ones that are in our homes and the ones that are at the office. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, should I understand that uh, with uh, the mocking services, uh, your test engineers are having better environment for producing tests, and uh, they are more efficient? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? If not. Oh, we have a question. Yeah, so thank you very much for the lovely presentation. It seems that you have a lot of fun into the lab. Uh, can I just volunteer my home for the vacuum cleaner test? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is not my question, actually. Um, what uh, about the security? With the beginning of the pandemic, one of our colleagues took took it at her apartment yeah. and it was running like 10 hours per day and <laughs> her neighbors started complaining <laughs> about the noise so we put it back in the office with a camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so 
a lot of fun during the pandemic. Uh, what about the security? Because we know uh, well-known hacks through the vacuum cleaners or another IoT devices, and after that, the hackers uh, were able to penetrate through your local network and then steal your private data, for example. Actually, we are using external APIs. We have integrated the external APIs of uh, the vendors, so we depend on their security. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Implementations. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Сега, добре.
SAP focused on making businesses run better by pushing the boundaries of innovation and impacted the world and people's lives beyond anything the founders ever imagined. With 50 years of groundbreaking work, SAP will continue to lead the way with innovation and help the world run better and improve people's lives. Strive Bulgaria was founded in 2008 by the Dutch entrepreneur Kun van Wijk. His vision was to create solutions that exceed customer expectations. Since 2014, Stripes is part of the ICT Group in the Netherlands. The ICT Group is a stock-listed company on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange and employs more than 1,000 professionals. Since 2017, I have the privilege and honor to drive Stripes forward in the role of CEO. We offer solutions to our clients in digital transformation, smart applications and infrastructure. Our mission is to build smart solutions that create business impact. We are Stripe. Okay, uh, we are ready for our next session. Um, so please take your seats. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Ivan Votov. He's a senior developer at VMware. And today he's gonna talk about uh, his experience with performance, uh, performance testing in the UI and how we can measure the user interactions in our uh, web applications. So Ivan, welcome on stage. Thank you. Hi, guys. So my name is Ivan. I have been with VMware for the past seven years in the vSphere UI team. Uh, we are building what is also known as the vCenter UI. So based on this, I will try to give you some ideas about performance testing of the UI. Uh, in, in, in this talk, uh, I will be talking about uh, as uh, you already heard, performance testing of web applications, and more specifically, the UI responsiveness of these web applications, because this is what the user directly perceives, and the user should be very important to us. Consider, for example, the following use case. I log in into a web app, uh, I wait for the UI to load, and then I click on a button. In a few moments, the screen changes, and I have my actionable data in front of me. Uh, that's fine, that's, uh, all, we, uh, that's uh, all we would expect it. However, a few moments for me may very well have been an eternity for you. So clearly, the UI responsiveness is something subjective, and as such, we need to put some specific numbers behind it. Was it really one second or five seconds, or maybe even 2,200 milliseconds? So one, our number one goal should be in this case to be able to really tell how long did it take. So if we have these two, pro if, the, if, if we have these three problems uh, nested in each other with uh, r maybe rising priority, let's say, then of course uh, to solve them, one number, our number one goal would be to really 
detail, how long did it take. And then uh, we should also strive to automate things so, so that there is no user intervention required and so that we can run our measurements on a regular basis again without user intervention. Building on our mental model that I have just um, introduced, here's a UI control with a search button. We click on a button and then the UI starts transitioning through some states. We may also have some intermediate data, but the user only will be able to tell on step three that, yes, I have my actionable data right now, and this is the time when the UI has actually settled or stabilized. These are the words that I'm going to use in my vocabulary uh, for the next slides. What we want to achieve is to be able to measure this thing automatically. So basically, the, uh, this time span between the user interaction, in this case, this is a click on a button, and then uh, once uh, the load, the UI has already settled, when the user can tell us, yes, I have my actionable data right now. And we, as a team uh, of developers, realized that this time span here is actually built of two separate components. One are the network calls that a typical web application does. These are asynchronous HTTP requests, or also known as AJAX requests. There may be zero or more of them for each a workflow like this one. And uh, the second component, however, is the time that it takes for the web application to really crunch through the results after the responses of this request has come. It usually uh, makes some modifications to the DOM, to the document tree, such as adding or deleting elements, and this sometimes happens multiple times. And eventually, the browser has to re-render our changes. So for non-trivial and non-hello world applications, the second component is always there with some considerable weight. Uh, of course, one could argue that uh, we may also track the AJAX requests only, and I can agree, but this works only for an uh, isolated number of uh, maybe smaller apps. But for enterprise applications with uh, many contributors and uh, long history, so to say, the second component is um, always there. So if I am now uh, to tackle both of these components separately. So if I am to analyze the AJAX requests, I will certainly go by collecting HAR files. This I can done with Google Chrome, for example, in the network tab. A HAR file gives me details about the past request that the browser did, including URL, method, and most importantly, the duration of each and every request. So far, so good. What about the second component? So again, Google Chrome, this time the performance tab where I can start a session. And uh, at the end of this uh, session, uh, Chrome will report some very exhaustive information about how did the UI behave. So was there any very running JavaScript tasks, which in turn takes too much time from the JavaScript event loop, and which in turn decreases uh, the, um, what, what the user, uh, worsens the experience of the user because the frame rate drops. And uh, even though the browser is multi-threaded to some extent because of this loop, the user will experience some degrading performance. So uh, based on this, we decided uh, let, uh, let us maybe try to automate this with the JavaScript library. Uh, we built it, it is uh, still uh, for uh, in-house use, uh, but in the next few slides I will try to uh, present you the main ideas behind the library and, and uh, how it works. So here it is, with it we wanted to be able to express the following thought. Interact with the UI and then for a given period, period of time capture all the AJAX requests that the web application we are testing does and uh, wait for some provided target element to settle or to stabilize. While waiting for this element to settle, that actually means, implementation-wise for us, that we observe this element for changes, and we deem it settled once changes basically stop. Uh, on each change, uh, I will show you uh, some pseudocode in a few slides. We just um, 
we run a predicate function that the, uh, that, that the user supplied. And in code, this looks like this. So we create a new measurement, or also performance measurement session. We give it a name and some ID. Then we instruct the framework itself to interact with this element by giving in a selector for the element and a callback function. For now, for actually 100% of the times, we, we simply click on this element. But as you can see, it's, it's uh, more flexible than this. Then we instruct the framework to start waiting for some other element. For example, the population grid from, from, the, uh, uh, from our example at the beginning to settle. And each time the element changes, this callback function here is run over this uh, target element. And we do this for the next, in this case, 15 seconds. So we give our framework a static interval static timeout so that the performance measurement session that we are creating with it we run for at least these 15 seconds. The reasoning is the following. Observe all the Ajax requests during this time and um, keep observing our element for changes. Rerun the predicate on each change. This is uh, how the first part of the problem is done. We use two web APIs. One has been with us for maybe tens of years. It is the XHR, XHR API, the XML HTTP request, which is used for making AJAX requests from the browser. And uh, we patch its prototype, these two methods here. The aim is for us to be able to collect details about the request, such as method, URL, etc. And as you can see, we, we also bind to the onload end uh, property of the instances. So each instance is a request. So this means that we know the start and end time of the requests. And we can, of course, use this to track their uh, duration. And indeed, we did so at the beginning. But we realized there is a better way to do this, namely the Performance Observer API, a fairly newer one, but very handy for our goals. We use this to measure the performance, the duration of each and every request. And during our multiple tries, we made sure that the times reported by the performance observer are actually exactly the same as the ones reported by the network tab in Google Chrome. So we are fairly certain in the correctness of this part of the solution. At the end, we joined the details from both methods. So that simply means that we uh, merge the durations of the requests with their URLs, methods, uh, etc. All the details of a single request. Actually, of all the requests that have happened uh, during our performance measurement session. And uh, what about uh, the tracking of, the, of our target element? Here it is. So, uh, as you may have guessed, there is another very handy web API here. It's called Mutation Observer. It's not on the slide, but I have it in the references slide. This is the algorithm um, which, we, which we use. First, we get our current timestamp and call it interaction timestamp. Then, uh, immediately afterwards, we do the interaction with the element. And then, the timer, the, this static thing that I have shown you 15 seconds from our example, uh, we start it. And, um, during our performance measurement session, while this timeout is not yet expired, we basically do two things. First, we wait for our target element to appear in the DOM. If it is not there yet, this is this part here. And once it appears in the DOM, uh, we update our settlement timestamp. As a matter of fact, we do the same thing as here. So we evaluate the predicate. And if it returns true, we update our settlement timestamp. But for brevity, it's a bit different here. Then when our element is in the DOM, or if it has been in the DOM in the first place, we start observing this element and all its child elements. So this is basically a part of the whole DOM, of the whole document tree. And as such, we are observing this subtree, which is identified by our target element. On every change in this subtree, we evaluate our, our predicate over, this, uh, over our element. And uh, if, we ret if it returns true, we update our settlement timestamp. 
our predicate was from the from our example this is element visible so so far so good the crux of this o is maybe here so we do we we use set timeout with zero so that on each update from this uh, mutation observer we are actually running our uh, predicate in the next browser task so think of the javascript event loop and why we do it why do we do it this way because when we receive the event is not the same moment when the user will see the changes caused by this event so imagine that the grid has changed somehow for, for example maybe uh, 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 some the content has come uh, and we are notified about it by our event the thing is that this change will only be rendered at the end of the current task and because of this uh, we defer the, evalu the evaluation of the predicate to some subsequent task from the JavaScript event loop. At the end of the day, uh, after the timeout is already expired, our duration that we targeted and that we wanted to measure originally is simply the uh, difference between the latest settlement timestamp that we recorded and our constant initial interaction timestamp. So this is how the result of it looks like. This is the so-called performance measurement report. We have our duration here, the thing that we have measured about the responsiveness of the UI, and a list of all the AJAX requests that uh, have been recorded with their details, most important than everything maybe, the duration. Note, however, that we also have start along with the duration, which allows us to what our requests and to reason about whether they are parallel or not because one way, of, one way of optimizing things is of course to parallelize requests that are subsequent but there is no need for them to be. Then uh, last two slides, how we actually use it in-house. We use it with another framework, this time it is built with uh, on uh, Selenium, and this is our end-to-end -end functional testing framework. We use it for our regressional testing, but we also use it for this kind of performance tests. This framework loads our JavaScript performance framework into the browser, along with the vSphere UI. It calls it, and uh, eventually it, it waits for it to, 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 to uh, do its job, and eventually uh, it extracts this report that I have just shown parses it and creates open tracing spans out of it. Think of open tracing uh, as a stack trace of a process, for instance, where every function or method call has its own duration. This is how it looks like. These are open tracing spans, and the one wrapped in red here is the span created by our performance measurement session. Not sure if you can see it, but this session says load storage overview grid. And it has lasted for around 500 milliseconds. So it took that long for the vSphere UI to respond to some user interaction and um, stabilize this uh, storage overview grid. Also something interesting that we can see here, there are two parallel AJAX requests during this session. and. Quite unfortunate for us as UI developers, they are uh, very fast. This means that this implicit span here in green that I have added to the image is what we can really optimize and work for if we deem these 500 milliseconds not acceptable. With it, finally, to the references slide, because I forgot the thank you slide, but I do thank you all, and I really hope that there will be some of you that bring some of our ideas home to their applications. Thanks. Yep, there is a question. Uh, hi. hi. Um, so, uh, how do you, uh, do you get like requirements, or how do you know if uh, 
request Ajax request is fast or slow. Do you make this decision on your own, or you have like a requirements uh, what duration is okay? Yes, we have targets for the durations here. Uh, they're different, but say usually around a second, uh, not counting latency, of course, this is without latency. So yes, we do have targets, and indeed, uh, what we gather from our performance measurement session is um, compared to our targets, and this is how we fail performance tests. Uh, regarding the requests, no, we don't, but with this kind of visualization, uh, we have the advantage to be able to tell exactly, oh yes, this time it is the request which is slow, so let's, uh, let's log back to the back end, for example. Thank you. Another one here. Hello, uh, quick question. How do you deal with uh, flaky end-to-end -end tests and do they uh, affect your uh, performance measurements? Fake? Fl tests? Flaky, like flaky tests. breaking the end-to-end -end tests? Uh, yes, we, we tackle this a lot. And, but since we are using this Selenium framework that I mentioned from quite some time, uh, we try to reduce the flakiness as much as possible. And the steps, so the parts that load and call the JavaScript performance measurement session uh, also leverage this, this deflakiness effort that we have been doing. Sometimes, uh, yes, we, we get some uh, false negatives, for example. Sometimes the browser gets too slow and we get some outliers even in the performance measurement. But if they do not repeat, because we have automated the tests, they run on a regular basis. If it's just a single outlier, we may not even analyze it. We, we look for a trend. Yeah? Sorry, do you run the tests with, with every commit or? Functional tests with every few commits, but uh, performance tests uh, not that often. Say a couple of times a week, maybe. Something like that. There's the cadence. Thank you. Test.
We're a pretty resilient species, and that's true now more than ever. So we deserve app experiences that are as resilient as we are. This starts with apps that can scale to keep pace with shifting demand, or update at a moment's notice to support entirely new business models. In a time when the app experience has become the human experience, being future ready means keeping people at the heart of innovation and flexing to meet their needs. Because technology really can change the world, but the best technology changes with it. Мъркъл започват официално в България на 1 януари 2022 година, но двете компании, които обединява са на нашия пазар доста по-отдавна. Isobar Commerce и Liferia стартират съвместна работа като част от новата бизнес линия на Мъркъл Commerce and Experience. Аз съм част от това семейство от 13 години и заедно с много мои колеги преживяхме най-различни метаморфози на фирмата. Започнахме като малък стартъп, наречен Никомера през 2008 година. Тогава празнувахме успешен декемврийски ден на коледно пазаруване с цели 1000 онлайн поръчки за 24 часа. През 2015 година Екомера беше придобита от iSobar и стана част от бизнеса на Денцо. Това ни позволи да спечелиме нови вълнуващи клиенти и на последния черен петък през 2021 година достигнахме пикови стоености от 1000 поръчки в минута. През цялото това време сме разработили и внедрили над 400 транзакционал сайта. Работили сме с клиенти в над 60 държави и имаме онлайн магазини на 6 континента. Качеството на кода и поддръжката ни е ненадмината. Затова свидетелстват и нашите клиенти, с които работим заедно вече повече от 13 години. Днес сме Мъркъл и целим да поставим нови рекорди с качеството на кода, който пишем.
Okay, uh, we are ready to, to go with the next session. So uh, our next speaker is Sugnan Chikov. He's a senior, he's senior blockchain developer at LimeChain. And he's also a mentor in a blockchain academy, helping developers to gain the required skill set for blockchain. Today, uh, Ogi is going to talk about uh, what are the smart contracts in blockchain and how can we test them. So welcome on the stage, Ogi. Thank you very much for the amazing introduction, Kirill. Uh, I'm so excited because today we're going to talk about instruments for smart contract testing and how we can test actually the smart contracts. But before that, I just want to say GM and please raise your hands, those of you who know what GM stands for. Okay, good. So GM stands for good morning, but into the crypto world and blockchain world, it is more than a greeting because it expresses that we are still early and young into the technology and we are young adopters and our future is bright. So I just want to say GM to all of you. And before we deep dive into the instruments uh, of the smart contract testing and how we can test actually the smart contracts. Let's first of all learn and understand what is a smart contract actually. So you might think of the smart contracts as simply programs or functions or just a fragment of code that is stored on a dis distributed, decentralized, public ledger technology called blockchain. And those fragments of codes or those functions or those programs can be run when cer certain predefined conditions are met. Or with other words, you can imagine a smart contract with a function inside this smart contract and this function can distribute amount of tokens to some accounts. This function can be run when certain predefined, predetermined conditions are met. But when we can use and why we can use the smart contracts, smart contracts are typically used to automate the execution of an agreement among participants where all those participants can immediately get the outcome without any kind of third parties or intermediaries into the process and without any time loss. But why it is important to test smart contracts and what is actually a smart contract testing? Testing the smart contracts is the most important part of the process of developing the smart contracts or if you want of developing the decentralized applications or Web3 applications. Because smart contracts commonly need to have interface because users need to interact with them. And even more, the testing is the most important part of improving their security. Why? You're going to ask why. Because unlike the traditional software applications, smart contracts typically cannot be updated after launching them or after deploying them on the mainnet. That's why it's really important and this part is crucial, critical, mandatory, and needs to be done before those contracts go live onto the blockchain. Okay, and why it is important actually to test smart contracts? Just keep in mind that 95% of the smart contracts are high value applications. And if we are going to speak about industries like DeFi, the smart contracts are holding and dealing with high value digital assets. Or if we're going to speak about just valuable items, the well-known NFTs or non-fungible tokens are such an example. And as such, little and small vulnerabilities can lead to big, irreplaceable and irrecoverable loses for users, and you're going to see later on the slides what can happen. Also, as I mentioned, the smart contracts deployed on the blockchain by default are immutable. So, 
we know different upgradability patterns that can be applied, but instead of um, reducing the immutability and introducing complexity, sometimes the upgradability is not an option because you need to deal with really, really strong and difficult governance processes. So maybe upgradability is not an option. And you need to test, of course, because hacks and exploits can be presented into your smart contracts. OK, and a lot of you will ask what can happen if we don't test our smart contracts. You can see this one. This topic is actually, it happens when I was creating this presentation. It was from two weeks ago. Binance was hacked. Almost half a billion dollars were stolen. The next one, really stupid smart contract book, 31 millions are stealed. And you can see that they are wishing a good look to the entity that was contacted, the hacker, with the desperate willing to return the money. Or the next one, the Poly Network. This was from the last year. On the left side, you can see the announcement on Twitter. And to the right side, again, a desperate letter to the hacker explaining that this was the biggest DeFi hack with almost $611 million of digital assets that were stolen with this hack. So I wonder that I answered your question, what can happen if we don't test? OK. What is the process of smart contract testing? And what is the process that we're usually applying on our everyday basis at LimeChain? First of all, the manual testing. Just keep in mind that this process is not mandatory. It's subject, it's subject to change. Depends on the complexity of the smart contracts. But I consider for myself and based on my experience that those are the mandatory steps that you need to perform before deploy or before the main net deployment of the smart contract. So the manual testing. What is manual testing here? It is internal manual um, execution of the testing scenarios, the testing steps. What does it mean? Um, individuals with high experience sit down and go through the smart contract code manually, step by step internally, even during the pull requests, during the development process, or during the whole cycle of the development process. After that, the good old unit testing is here. The unit testing is performing simple assertions based on predefined um, steps that is testing your smart contract components separately. Uh, later, you're going to see what kind of tools you can use for unit testing. Um, here again, different kind of assertions and what kind of assertions we may have into the smart contracts. For example, only the owner can pause the contract or only the owner can call this function or this account should not have any kind of tokens. Um, at a specific life cycle of the contract. Keep in mind that simple contracts may have up to two or 300 unit tests. And I'm going to show you what tools we are using for production testing and dep deploying the smart contracts. Then integration testing. Integration testing is one level higher than the unit testing because you can test how the different components of those contracts are working together. Even we can have uh, contracts that are communicating between each other. And this is the place where you can test that they can work together and you're expecting their behavior. Then the most important part of all these parts is the third party audit. What does it mean and what it is used for? This is a separate entity, external company, that is auditing your contract here. It is time effort and money effort operation because it is really slow and you have to reserve your spot uh, 
a lot of time before you even start to develop your smart contract. The external audit is public as well, which helps to your DAP or application or Web3 application to be uh, well known into the community and to prove that you're not doing a scam or to prove that you are not going to steal the tokens or the digital assets of the users that want to stake, for example, into your product. Uh, the third party audit is doing also a security audit with different kind of instruments, even with manual testing again. It is a really slow process, but it is really important because even though this audit is public, as I said, and everybody can uh, access it and go through it and see what are the potential vulnerabilities and bugs. Um, actually, it is uh, uh, separated on steps. You may have different kind of um, interactions with uh, the entity that is auditing your contracts in order to fix uh, the vulnerabilities and the security flaws. And then the bug bounties. What is the bug bounty? It is um, reward connected you can uh, actually run your product on a test network and you can open the bug bounty program to a group of community of developers or hackers where they can point potential vulnerabilities and earn rewards for that. Only with pointing them or even with fixing them, it depends. The bug bounty is a little bit similar to the, the third-party audit because you are again asking for help from other users to find potential vulnerabilities in your smart contracts, but it's also a little bit different because into the third-party audit, the teams or the people that are doing it have more narrow thinking, where into the bug bounty programs they are attract they are attracting a uh, different kind of hackers, white hackers with different kind of thinking, which may help to uh, find different kind of bugs into your contracts. And actually, what kind of instruments you can use, and we prove that they are really useful, and we use them into the Lime chain through the whole process of developing the centralized applications, not only testing, but deploying them, compile the smart contracts, perform different tests uh, from the processes that you saw. The first one is hard hat. Uh, a little uh, message here. Before the hard hat, there was Truffle, there was other kind of libraries. We even have our internal framework that we do it by ourselves. We develop it by ourselves. Uh, it was um, created with the help of one of the best libraries. Uh, for Web3 development, it suggests Hardhead is an Ethereum development and deployment tool which you can use not only to test your smart contracts, but to compile them, to deploy them, to verify them, and even to upgrade them. You can use different kind of upgradability patterns together with this kind of framework. And it's again built on Ethers.js, and we are kind of contributors to that library, and the Hardhead is using modul modularity, so everybody can write his own model. And how the unit tests may look like, here you can see that uh, different assertions can be created. And here, this is an example that we should not have any tokens to the contract at a specific stage of the contract. And imagine two, three, even 500 of these kind of tests that you can run with a simple comment. Um, Hardhead is uh, running local own network that you can use immediately to run and test your smart contracts because the other scenario is to test your smart contracts against some kind of test network, which is slow during, uh, because of the specifics of the blockchain. Um, you can use the hardhead even to uh, check what is your code coverage. Here you can see that uh, a specific contract has 100% code coverage, but the other ones, we still need to perform unit tests because we have uncovered lines. Then the next type of tools that you can use is 
fuzzers. What are the fuzzers? The fuzzers are attacking your functions or giving to your functions different kind of uh, malformed data to check what those functions will do with this kind of malformed data because maybe a dangerous operation can be performed when this kind of uh, data is reaching your input params of the uh, functions. For example, here what we have, you can see that here we are checking a lot of things. We are asserting the math, we are rounding down the numbers, we also revert on overflow, and performing such tools as Echidna or fuzzing tools, you can see that our smart contract is passing those tests. Here, think about of like 20 or 30,000 different tests that are running against your smart contract functions. It's something like penetration testing, but just for functions. Uh, and the next one, it's my trio. You can use such tools for static analysis of your smart contract, and you can potentially point kind of security flaws here, and I'm going to show you what I'm meaning. The last function, it doesn't uh, um, mean the name, but here we have a really important solidity um, command here, or solidity line, that what this function will do. It will delete all the byte codes of your contract uh, where this contract is deployed and will send all the funds or all the balance or all the money that this smart contract is holding to this address. And this function is really dangerous. And as you can see, it's marked only as public. What does it mean? It means that everybody can call that function. And this is really dangerous because everybody can delete your smart contract, actually. And what these tools are actually doing they are telling you that you have unprotected self-destruct. And imagine a large system of such kind of smart contracts, and you may miss something, and you may have 100% code coverage, but you may just... Um, you may just have this kind of unprotected functions that are doing dangerous uh, stuff with the solidity on the low level, and such tools will help you to protect your smart contracts. And for the conclusion, I can say that there is not a single method of testing a smart contract. You need to play with the different scenarios and approaches in order to deliver a 100% secured application, which, based on my experience, is not possible, actually, because we can see that those hacks, this does not mean that they do not test. They test a lot, but we can still find some kind of flaws, issues that we can then use them for hacking the contract. But testing and doing the different kind of audits will give you um, more, let's say, uh, time. And then with the developing of the Solidity code, and especially if you um, do upgradability, you have it on the architecture level because you cannot just upgrade every contract. You just need to think about it before you start to create your smart contract. You need to create your architecture to be able to uh, give you the upgradability. You need to play with different kind of storage addresses, memory reservation, etc., etc. This is a really complicated task, but with the development of the language, you may address those security flaws and upgrade them. And that's why the testing of the smart contracts is one of the most important parts during the development. Now it's time for questions. Uh, just a second, the mic is coming. To ask uh, that methodology as test-driven development, does it make sense for smart contracts no, at all? No. no, actually it doesn't make sense, the test-driven development, because the solidity is still limited and you need to perform different limitations and you need to take them into account because, first of all, you need to think about gas optimization, 
then the limitations of the language, then the, uh, the whole uh, ecosystem or how the EVM-based blockchain works, or not EVM-based, but blockchains that you can use your smart contracts, what kind of uh, consensus mechanisms they are using. So I don't think that the test-driven development is a really good approach here because of the behavior of the whole ecosystem. I thought that as far as a unit test is there, doesn't, uh, there are no, uh, um, what, what what's, uh, says against just to start with unit test, make it failing, and after that uh, um, fix it in the code like DDD normally uh, prescribes? Yeah, but keep in mind that uh, unit testing cannot solve uh, different problems with overflowing data types, for example, or uh, your smart contracts often are relying on off-chain services. Unit testing cannot catch that because you're testing different fragments of your code, but not the integration testing or not how the whole uh, system will behave. That's why, yeah, you can start with the unit testing, but it's not only your single option. You're going to fix everything with the unit testing. You're going to get 100% code coverage, but it doesn't, this doesn't mean nothing because you may still be hacked. You may still miss something, as you saw here. So I can get 100% code coverage of that smart contract, and I can miss that and deploy that on the mainnet, and then somebody will came, will up, uh, call that function with his address, will delete my contract, and will steal my money. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I think we have time for more questions. Okay. Thank you very much. SAP focused on making businesses run better by pushing the boundaries of innovation and impacted the world and people's lives beyond anything the founders ever imagined. With 50 years of groundbreaking work, SAP will continue to lead the way with innovation and help the world run better and improve people's lives. Strive Bulgaria was founded in 2008 by the Dutch entrepreneur Kun van Wijk. His vision was to create solutions that exceed customer expectations. Since 2014, Stripes is part of the ICT Group in the Netherlands. ICT Group is a stock-listed company on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange and employs more than 1,000 professionals. Since 2017, I have the privilege and honor to drive Stripes forward in the role of CEO. We offer solutions to our clients in digital transformation, smart applications and infrastructure. Our mission is to build smart solutions that create business impact. We are Stripe.
We're a pretty resilient species, and that's true now more than ever. So we deserve app experiences that are as resilient as we are. This starts with apps that can scale to keep pace with shifting demand, or update at a moment's notice to support entirely new business models. In a time when the app experience has become the human experience, being future ready means keeping people at the heart of innovation and flexing to meet their needs. Because technology really can change the world, but the best technology changes with it. Мъркъл започват официално в България на 1 януари 2022 година, но двете компании, които обединява се на нашия пазар доста по-отдавна. Isobar Commerce и Liferia стартират съвместна работа като част от новата бизнес линия на Мъркъл Commerce and Experience. Аз съм част от това семейство от 13 години и заедно с много мои колеги преживяхме най-различни метаморфози на фирмата. Започнахме като малък стартъп, наречен Никомера през 2008 година. Тогава празнувахме успешен декемврийски ден на коледно пазаруване с цели 1000 онлайн поръчки за 24 часа. През 2015 година Екомера беше придобита от iSobar и стана част от бизнеса на Денцо. Това ни позволи да спечелиме нови вълнуващи клиенти и на последния черен петък през 2021 година достигнахме пикови стоености от 1000 поръчки в минута. През цялото това време сме разработили и внедрили над 400 транзакционал сайта. Работили сме с клиенти в над 60 държави и имаме онлайн магазини на 6 континента. Качеството на кода и поддръжката ни е ненадмината. Затова свидетелстват и нашите клиенти, с които работим заедно вече повече от 13 години. Днес сме Мъркъл и целим да поставим нови рекорди с качеството на кода, който пишем.
SAP focused on making businesses run better by pushing the boundaries of innovation and impacted the world and people's lives beyond anything the founders ever imagined. With 50 years of groundbreaking work, SAP will continue to lead the way with innovation and help the world run better and improve people's lives. Stride Bulgaria was founded in 2008 by the Dutch entrepreneur Koen van Wijk. His vision was to create solutions that exceed customer expectations. Since 2014, Stripes is part of the ICT Group in the Netherlands. ICT Group is a stock-listed company on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange and employs more than 1,000 professionals. Since 2017, I have the privilege and honor to drive Stripes forward in the role of CEO. We offer solutions to our clients in digital transformation, smart applications and infrastructure. Our mission is to build smart solutions that create business impact. We are Stripes. We're a pretty resilient species, and that's true now more than ever. So we deserve app experiences that are as resilient as we are. This starts with apps that can scale to keep pace with shifting demand, or update at a moment's notice to support entirely new business models. In a time when the app experience has become the human experience, being future ready means keeping people at the heart of innovation and flexing to meet their needs. Because technology really can change the world, but the best technology changes with it.
Мъркъл започват официално в България на 1 януари 2022 година, но двете компании, които обединява са на нашия пазар доста по-отдавна. Isobar Commerce и Liferia стартират съвместна работа като част от новата бизнес линия на Мъркъл Commerce and Experience. Аз съм част от това семейство от 13 години и заедно с много мои колеги преживяхме най-различни метаморфози на фирмата. Започнахме като малък стартъп, наречен Икомера през 2008 година. Тогава празнувахме успешен декемврийски ден на коледно пазаруване с цели 1000 онлайн поръчки за 24 часа. През 2015 година Екомера беше придобита от iSobar и стана част от бизнеса на Денцо. Това ни позволи да спечелиме нови вълнуващи клиенти и на последния черен петък през 2021 година достигнахме пикови стоености от 1000 поръчки в минута. През цялото това време сме разработили и внедрили над 400 транзакционал сайта. Работили сме с клиенти в над 60 държави и имаме онлайн магазини на 6 континента. Качеството на кода и поддръжката ни е ненадмината. Затова свидетелстват и нашите клиенти, с които работим заедно вече повече от 13 години. Днес сме мъркал и целим да поставим нови рекорди с качеството на кода, който пишем.
SAP focused on making businesses run better by pushing the boundaries of innovation and impacted the world and people's lives beyond anything the founders ever imagined. With 50 years of groundbreaking work, SAP will continue to lead the way with innovation and help the world run better and improve people's lives. Drive Bulgaria was founded in 2008 by the Dutch entrepreneur Kun van Wijk. His vision was to create solutions that exceed customer expectations. Since 2014, Stripes is part of the ICT Group in the Netherlands. ICT Group is a stock-listed company on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange and employs more than 1,000 professionals. Since 2017, I have the privilege and honor to drive Stripes forward in the role of CEO. We offer solutions to our clients in digital transformation, smart applications and infrastructure. Our mission is to build smart solutions that create business impact. We are Stripe. We're a pretty resilient species, and that's true now more than ever. So we deserve app experiences that are as resilient as we are. This starts with apps that can scale to keep pace with shifting demand, or update at a moment's notice to support entirely new business models. In a time when the app experience has become the human experience, being future ready means keeping people at the heart of innovation and flexing to meet their needs. Because technology really can change the world, but the best technology changes with it.
Мъркъл започват официално в България на 1 януари 2022 година, но двете компании, които обединява се на нашия пазар доста по-отдавна. Айсобар Къмърс и Лайферия стартират съвместна работа като част от новата бизнес линия на Мъркъл Commerce and Experience. Аз съм част от това семейство от 13 години и заедно с много мои колеги преживяхме най-различни метаморфози на фирмата. Започнахме като малък стартъп, наречен Никомера през 2008 година. Тогава празнувахме успешен декемврийски ден на коледно пазаруване с цели 1000 онлайн поръчки за 24 часа. През 2015 година Екомера беше придобита от Айсобар и стана част от бизнеса на Денцо. Това ни позволи да спечелиме нови вълнуващи клиенти и на последния черен петък през 2021 година достигнахме пикови стоености от 1000 поръчки в минута. През цялото това време сме разработили и внедрили над 400 транзакционал сайта. Работили сме с клиенти в над 60 държави и имаме онлайн магазини на 6 континента. Качеството на кода и поддръжката ни е ненадмината. Затова свидетелстват и нашите клиенти, с които работим заедно вече повече от 13 години. Днес сме Мъркъл и целим да поставим нови рекорди с качеството на кода, който пишем.
Това е Собари и стана част от бизнеса на Денцо. Това ни позволи да спечелиме нови вълнуващи клиенти и на последния черен петък през 2021 година достигнахме пикови стоености от 1000 поръчки в минута. През цялото това време сме разработили и внедрили над 400 транзакционал сайта. Работили сме с клиенти в над 60 държави и имаме онлайн магазини на 6 континента. Качеството на кода и поддръжката ни е ненадмината. Затова свидетелстват и нашите клиенти, с които работим заедно вече повече от 13 години. Днес сме мъркал и целим да поставим нови рекорди с качеството на кода, който пишем.
SAP focused on making businesses run better by pushing the boundaries of innovation and impacted the world and people's lives beyond anything the founders ever imagined. With 50 years of groundbreaking work, SAP will continue to lead the way with innovation and help the world run better and improve people's lives. Red Bulgaria was founded in 2008 by the Dutch entrepreneur Kun van Weyck. His vision was to create solutions that exceed customer expectations. Since 2014, Stripes is part of the ICT Group in the Netherlands. The ICT Group is a stock-listed company on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange and employs more than 1,000 professionals. Since 2017, I have the privilege and honor to drive Stripes forward in the role of CEO. We offer solutions to our clients in digital transformation, smart applications and infrastructure. Our mission is to build smart solutions that create business impact. We are Stripe. pretty resilient species, and that's true now more than ever. So we deserve app experiences that are as resilient as we are. This starts with apps that can scale to keep pace with shifting demand, or update at a moment's notice to support entirely new business models. In a time when the app experience has become the human experience, being future ready means keeping people at the heart of innovation and flexing to meet their needs. Because technology really can change the world, but the best technology changes with it.
Oracle започват официално в България на 1 януари 2022 година, но двете компании, които обединява се на нашия пазар доста по-давна. Isobar Commerce и Liferia стартират съвместна работа като част от новата бизнес линия на Merkel Commerce and Experience. Аз съм част от това семейство от 13 години и заедно с много мои колеги преживяхме най-различни метаморфози на фирмата. Започнахме като малък стартъп, наречен Nicomera през 2008 година. Тогава празнувахме успешен декемврийски ден на коледно пазаруване с цели 1000 онлайн поръчки за 24 часа. През 2015 година Екомера беше придобита от Айсобар и стана част от бизнеса на Денцо. Това ни позволи да спечелиме нови вълнуващи клиенти и на последния черен петък през 2021 година достигнахме пикови стоености от 1000 поръчки в минута. През цялото това време сме разработили и внедрили над 400 транзакционал сайта. Работили сме с клиенти. Звукът нещо. Hi everyone, my name is Christo and I will be hosting uh, the agenda for track one by the end of the day. I hope you had a nice networking time during our lunch break. It is time now to continue with our agenda and I can't wait to introduce uh, our next speaker. His uh, name is Peter and he is an expert, entrepreneur and innovator that dives quite deep in the area of virtual teams. His book, Empowering Virtual Teams, is actually translated in six languages, and it reached top three in the Amazon category for international management. His passion and mission is to help as much as possible teams and uh, managers to uh, support their culture, uh, despite challenges such as age, geography, and culture. Please uh, give your warmest welcome to Peter Ivanov. Thank you. My presentation today starts with five words, which 52 years ago have casted the world in fear and hope, which are still a symbol of the unexpected that calls for urgent action, which for free men and their family meant one week struggle for life or death. These five words are, Houston, we have a problem. Imagine. The year is 1970, by the way, the year when I was born. Precisely, it is 11 of April, and the clock in Houston shows 1313. Precisely in this moment in town, the American space agency NASA shoots the spaceship Apollo 13 to the moon. The experts plan to land on the moon in four days. On the third day, April the 13th, there is a loud crash, and the three astronauts see how white powder flows into the space. This is their oxygen. Two from their three oxygen tanks have just exploded, and their entire oxygen flows into the space. The Houston Control Center is in panic. No one has ever planned with such a disaster. The families of the three astronauts are completely horrified. How many of you have seen the film Apollo 13? Give me your hands up. Yeah, not so many young audience. If this, here, <laughs> if this here is the Earth, and up there is the Moon, on the third day, April the 13th, when the explosion happens, they're very close to the Moon, where is the cross. If they continue flying according to the plan, they have energy until somewhere between the Earth and the Moon, when the line stops, but not enough to reach the gravity of the Earth, and so to be pulled on the Earth's surface. It is clear now the mission landing on the moon has failed. All already planned geological or other lunar research have been blown away by this explosion. Now, the lives of the astronauts are at stake. Now it is a matter of life or death. 
In the Houston Control Center, there is one man in charge, the 37-year-old Gene Kranz. He, with his short and flat haircut, he looks you always into the eyes and acts tough but competent. Gene grasps immediately that in order to save the lives of the astronauts, he has to win one fight, the fight for energy. Energy in the space is everything. You need energy in order to move the spaceship, in order to navigate it, but also to communicate with the Earth. Now, every energy unit, every single amp, has a life meaning. Now, they need a miracle. What does Gene Kranz do in this historical moment? He gathers his entire Houston team in one room. The room boils from anxiety and nervousness. The heads are challenged, the ideas rush around, the hearts are full with care, fear, and hope. Gene listens to each and every one very carefully. At one point, he calls for silence. Then he pulls all these people spread around the space together. Everyone, the three astronauts in the space, the Houston Control Center, scientists, engineers, hundreds of people. Gene says, we haven't lost a man in space until now, and as long as I'm responsible, no one stays there. Failure is not an option. He succeeds to pull all these people spread around the space through a magical gravity force in one strong virtual team. One team aligned towards one goal, to save the lives of the astronauts. These are seven days filled with incredible character strength, genius feats of engineering. Among others, they built CO2 converter into the spaceship. But above all, an extraterrestrial triumph of leadership. On the 17th of April, the land capsule of Apollo 13 lands, or rather splashes, in the Pacific, and the three astronauts are rescued. This is a miracle. This is virtual power. This is a virtual power team. Now, why I'm telling you this story? How many of you have worked on a project where something unexpected happens? Give me your hands up. Okay. Much more than <laughs> Apollo 13 story. So how often is the goal life date brought forward, or the budget reduced, and you still have to deliver with less energy. Or how often the team members in different locations, home office, different countries, sometimes they lose motivation, and that deteriorates the team performance. So I personally heard the statement, Houston, we have a problem more than once in my career. Luckily, it was never life in that situation, but for the project, it was quite critical. And now, COVID came, made us all remote and virtual, lockdown, and we responded quite well with good, well-honed digital skills. But the longer this period expands, the more we need to set goals remotely, we need to resolve conflicts remotely, we need to establish a structured communication in remote and now hybrid teams, and maintain the winning team spirit. And for this, we need a system. And this is what I will share with you today, a system to build powerful virtual and hybrid teams and also to motivate the remote team members, the home office workers. Now, I was, I was 20 years IT manager, so like many of you, or being on the client side, deploying SAP and so on. And the last eight years, I decided to dedicate myself to the topic of virtual power teams, as Christo mentioned. And what keeps me going now eight, ninth year is that the, the system works, for example, one two years project involving 20 countries in Europe. We delivered three months early and we saved 250,000 euros. That was establishing global shared services, and I'll share in the end of the presentation. On another one, it was one billion euro project involving Alibaba and e-commerce. We delivered on time in a very dispersed team, had 80 million profitability. Now, nine years work with many different clients. Some of them big. I live in Germany, in Hamburg, you know, like BASF and Lufthansa and so on. But some of them, like many of you, how many of you come like from mid-sized SME, small and medium enterprises? Although it's a matter of definition, yes, okay. And probably, how many are from like big multinationals? Okay, and the rest must be like scaling startups. So here you have all range. You have the big multinationals. You have middle enterprises where we also connect 
not just the internal teams and internal employees, but also their clients and sometimes partners and strategic suppliers, and also scaling, uh, scaling uh, startups. And also, if you take there some NGOs like United Nations, <laughs> quite a big non-profit organization, where people are not on salary, they don't have career or bonus scheme, same principles apply. Now, from all these experiences as a manager of large teams and also coaching now some global teams, I can tell that the virtual team is like the atom, where you have a nucleus and then you have a various particles flying around. In a virtual team, we aim to retain the gravity despite the distance. The gravity between the individual team members, which are the particles in this model, towards the nucleus. But the nucleus is not the manager, it's not the company owner, it's not the project manager. The nucleus is the team purpose and goal. So you will see we put a lot of emphasis to put the goal bottom up in this method. And I'll explain how we do it. Now, the virtual power teams comprises the 10 big rocks. And these are 10 success factors for retaining the gravity in a virtual team and unleashing the team power. And these 10 success factors, 10 is a big number, they're broken down in three main parts. If you imagine your team, by the way, how many of you work in virtual teams? At least one team member is, now we have a quite a lot, probably around 85%. Um, if you imagine your team as a human being, the first part, the logical part is the head. This is the logical, the cognitive part. And here come the first three big rocks, namely, big rock number one, personality in focus. Some managers say, I don't see the people, why should I bother what are they as individuals? From my perspective, big mistake. So I will give you a couple of formats where even people, if, even if they don't have a chance to meet face to face, they can go deep and connect on a human level, not just expert to expert, brilliant, machine learning or data scientist, human level. That helps to retain the gravity. Second big rock, strength matrix. In the poorly led virtual teams, people feel anonymous. They feel isolated, they feel not understood. Here we will establish, we will find out the natural strengths and talents of the people. And I'll share with you a script, they coach each other. And when we put all the strengths in the strength matrix, a new feeling emerges. Like everyone, instead of feeling anonymous and isolated, he or she feels like a hero, because every one of us brings a special skills and strengths and talents to the table. And when people see all the strengths on the strength matrix, a new feeling emerges. With this bouquet of strengths, with this mix of talents, we could achieve any goal that we set to ourselves, any nucleus. So, Simple steps you will see, but they help each one of them to strengthen the gravity and the team spirit, the sense of belonging. Big rock number three is interdependent goals. So here is the place where we define the nucleus of the atom in a special three-step process. So in the first part, the head, we are aiming for clarity. Who is a member of the team as a human being and what is the goal of the team, the nucleus of the atom? The second part is the body and the muscles, this is the dynamic part. And big rock number four is forums and agenda. What online meetings do you need? What um, forums, asynchronous and synchronous forums you need in order to keep the communication? Then knowledge management, and we link it to the strengths. You know, the strengths that we identified in the strength matrix, they become the knowledge champions and custodians in this particular, for the team, relevant areas. And then big rock number six is regular feedback. Sometimes scarce in local team and even more in virtual teams. And here we are aiming in this part, the body, for structured communication. Not like in poorly led teams, sometimes the manager calls a meeting, if there is a problem, starts some finger pointing, or he speaks most of the time. No, we are aiming for structured communication where everyone has a slot to contribute and to shine. And the last part, the third, my favorite, is the heart. So here we're talking about recognition. Do you know, by the way, what's number one reason for people leaving companies? Software development, anyone? <laughs> it's, yes, it's, it's not salary, although 
here is the big driver. Salary is number two. Number one, not enough recognition by the line manager. So people leave managers and bosses, not, not companies. Big rock number eight, diversity. If you have a multiple dimensions, multicultural teams, or different ages, age diversity, how to establish the optimal team culture. Number nine, winning spirit. Tell your story in the end. And number 10, which is like overarching, is next generation leaders. So how to involve the millennials and digital natives in order to, you know, they contribute and shine in the team. Now, as Christo mentioned, the book that I've written, I'm a mathematician, then IT manager, so process and numbers guy, written a book for my big surprise. It was translated in six languages, including Bulgarian, and then it was Amazon top three, just for a week. But I keep this screenshot like dear, dear to my heart. Now, that was a bit of a spoiler. This 81 is the question to you would have been how many are the virtual teams globally? So it's a study from Forrester Research before COVID, four years old, and they found out that there are 81%. And do you know how many of them are in more than one time zone, quite dispersed? What's the percentage? 70? 40 said someone? 60%. More than 60% are in more than one time zone. If you look around the room, how many of you have a colleague who is in another time zone? Just let's have a look. Yes, you see 60% or 70%. Okay, now I've written another book during COVID. I didn't travel so much on conferences. And first one was about business. This is more about uniting global talents also to tackle the toughest challenges, like climate change that we heard today from SAP and so on. Now, another spoiler. Google wanted to find out what the best global teams have in common. And they started a project called Google Project Aristotle. And they wanted to find out what is the one characteristic that their best performing teams have in common. They researched. At some point, they found that their best teams, when they have a meeting, they have an equal share of talking. So at some point in time, the introverts will shut up by themselves, or the extroverts will shut up by themselves. The introverts will gain and speak up. So they end up with like equal share of talking. It was quite a discovery for them. But it was not 100%, it was 90 plus percent applied to this rule, and they continued to research. And in the end, they found it. What do you think? Just what's your first thing? What is this characteristic that all best teams have in common? In this case, virtual global teams. Anyone? Trust. Very good, very good. So for the benefit of time, I wouldn't go further. They call it, and trust is the key ingredient, psychological safety which means that people in the team feel safe enough to take risks. Not being afraid that if they fail, it will, they will be laughed at or they will, have, they will be fired, they will have negative consequences for their career. They feel safe enough to take risks. And secondly, they feel safe enough to show vulnerability in front of each other. Not just their perfect side, as sometimes we do in social media, they show their vulnerabilities. They show their weaknesses, you know, they ask for help and so on. So psychological safety. And then comes number two, dependability, you know, relying on each other and so on. Clarity of role and structure. Now, how do you feel in your team? It's more a bit of a workshop question. Let's go into the 10 big rocks, you know, the, the method of virtual power teams. I will cover some of them in more details, some of them in less. Now, in poor led teams, like in the Atom, some team members get lost in space. And that drives the performance down. So I ask myself the question, how can we retain the gravity so they feel really connected to the nucleus and improve performance even exponentially? And those teams that manage to do that, I call virtual power teams. And let's start building them now with the, with the 10 big rocks. By the way, I'm a father of five girls. One wife, one marriage, five girls. Apparently, it's the only thing I can. I've tried long and hard enough. But um, two of them are now in the USA. The rest lived in Hamburg, you know, in our family house. So the next book project will be cracking the code of the virtual power family. Now, I do this little intro because every time I'm appointed as a manager of a new team or now I'm as a coach, I try to go deep in the personality of the people. So I invite people to present themselves with their lifeline or life journey. 
And here are the moments of excellence, moments that you are most proud of, but also the lowlights, moments that you struggled but nevertheless managed to overcome. And if you invite people to present themselves from this perspective, you will be amazed. Within like five to ten minutes per person, you will find out what makes the heart of each and every one singing. It's really very powerful. And as a smart manager, you may ask those questions during the recruitment, but in this way, everyone on the team finds out about everyone else, what makes their heart sing. So you see, as we said, psychological safety. You start building trust, you start building commonality, and this translates later on in performance. I also work with pictures. This is Oscar, who lives in Madrid and weighs nine kilos, so a real monster. I ask people to come up with a picture that they either find funny or identify with it. And again, within 30 seconds, just by the picture they pick and the way they present it, it opens the window to the soul of your people. And working with scaling startups, they have no budget to get together. We do this online, a lot of gravity. You start building the lifeline, the picture, and the third one that we do is so-called flash intro. Four simple questions. I would have loved to do it now in like three minutes, but the time is very limited. Siblings, brothers and sisters, hobby as a child, what you are most proud of, and then what else should others know about you. Try this one with a friend, try with your colleagues. Again, you'll be amazed by the level of depth you get. First two questions, very easy. You don't have to think what to answer. Second two questions, you need to decide what do you share. So you're forced to show vulnerability. And this is exactly what Google discovered that builds trust. Because we have our Bulgarian saying, you know, to, be, to trust someone, you need to eat two kilos of salt, sort of. So many years together so you can trust him. But the other, the speedway for building trust is opening up and showing vulnerability. And I would only recommend to try it out. You will see with completely uncommon and unknown people, if we do it like for two minutes, you will find out commonalities and start feeling trust. Trust, by the way, which is essential ingredient, as here um, someone mentioned of, of the psychological safety, is component of two things. Personality. Will he or she do it? Can I trust him? Will he or she do it? And for this, you need to know a little bit more the personality. And that's why we do these formats even online. And then, can he or she do it, if he has the skills and the competence? And this is where the second big rock, the strength matrix, come in. But the combination of two gives you the trust to your team members. And this is the fundament for your success as a team. By the way, the slides that I will share, they have some questions for self-coaching. You could use it for yourself or for your team. The second big rock is strengths matrix. I'm a big fan of strengths-orientated management, which means strengthening the strengths instead of developing the weaknesses. It's not mine. Gallup International came up with Strengths Finder 2.0. How many of you have come across? Not so many. So I made it simple. When we do the workshops, I ask people to list their strengths. And for those of them who come with a list of 100 strengths, I explain that this is not a strengths competition. We will use it for additional roles and responsibilities and say, oh, but why additional? We are already 150% overutilized. But for those of them who struggle to list a single strength, there is a script. Simple script, you do it in pairs. One is a coach asking the question, the other answer. What is easy and fun to do in your job? What is your biggest success in life, not just in work? What are people coming to you and asking you for help? If you ask, who is your best friend, like Christo, if you ask Christo, what is your biggest strength, what would he say? And then, in the end, you ask, from everything you told me, what is your biggest strength? Again, you will be amazed. And then you as a coach can say, I think from everything I've heard, your biggest strength is this. So in, everyone will end up with two strengths. What is the internal perspective, what you think of yourself. And again, this question will give you to come up with something that you probably will be surprised. And then how others perceive you, the external perspective. And we put on top what is your avatar, a question, and we put it in this trend matrix with avatar like celebrities, movie characters, whatever. Some people go for animals like elephants or diamond and so on. And when people present themselves with their strengths, as I said, new feeling emerges. Everyone feels special because everyone is a star and brings a particular skill set to the team. And then when they see the rest of the talents, say, we can achieve any goal that we set to ourselves. And the more 
That's the trick in teams. The more you work in your strength area, the more joy you feel. How many of you have come across the flow state? Flow state? If you're fully focused, so that's yes. If you work in your strength area, you fall in flow. You are fully focused. This is the area of top performance, and you feel joy. And if you know the strengths of the others, and you have psychological safety, if something is not your strength, instead of you know, struggling and frustrating, you would ask for help, the people that have the strengths. And then one plus one plus one becomes much more than three. Just one simple story. I have a client in New York who runs MOOCs. MOOC stands for Massive Open Online Course. And he's gathering 35,000 students, and he's teaching modern architecture. So they're building resilient schools for the Philippines. When the tsunami in the Philippines destroyed the infrastructure, the government decided to build the schools in such a resilient way, so there will be, in normal case, there will be schools, but in case of natural disaster, they will provide shelter to the people. And six weeks, he recorded everything in videos. Each week, he gives the new instructions, they build a school. But his problem was, week five comes, people drop out. Learned enough for free, just dropping out. Why for free? They were paying in the end when they have a successful project, pay for the certificate and get it. They didn't care for the certificate so much. He tried to get the money up front, only 2,000 subscribed. So we get together with his team and agreed to divide them in groups of five. Not us, it's a mammoth task. Self-organized, get together in a group of five, based on proximity, time zone, whatever principle. And then, in these groups of five, they presented themselves with a life journey, they discovered their strengths, and they were designing just one school, not five individuals, based on their strengths. And when the critical week five came, they couldn't let their teammates down. There was already so much gravity in the team, so they couldn't let their teammates down. In the end, 27,000 people stealthed into the end, and with this simple measure, just letting people connect on a personal level, he had a nearly half a million revenue improvement. Now, interdependent goals. This is the nucleus. It's a very important uh, big rock. I will explain the principle. Each organization has a vision, but sometimes it's difficult to translate it into a team on a team level. You know, you have a choice either in the Martin Luther King style, I have a dream, to present it so vividly that everyone follows, or you can let the team work it out. And I've streamlined the process for breaking down, defining the vision, and breaking down in the goals. And essentially, these are three steps. First, you discover the three hottest topics of the team. Regardless how smart are you as a manager, if you have a multiple location, time zones, and culture, you don't know. So it's a bottom-up process, free groups, silhouette, issues and opportunities, symbol of success. People vote in the end, you discover what are the three hottest topics of the team. Step number two, we convert them into the smart goals. Smart, the specific, measurable, and so on, but in a very rich script, so it makes it really tangible for them. And then we build for each of the smart goals a roadmap. And then people pick from the roadmaps their goals. So the roadmaps are the nucleus, and people pick their goals and justify it by their strengths. So there is no delegation. People pick their goals, and they work in their strength area. And from kind of day one, ensure much bigger commitment, even from the distance. Now, let's move to the second part, the body. I'll give you a couple of home office tips. 2019, I was speaking on an event in Bali called a Running Remote. So there were organizations and companies having, some of them, 10,000 plus people like Shopify and not having an office. So they decided from day one to be fully remote. Their people can work wherever they like and even whenever they like, as much asynchronous as possible. And they asked the question, what is the number one skill to lead remote workers? And we were voting with Slido, with the mobile phones, and the topics which get resonance were bigger and centered on the screen. And at some point in time, there was one word in the middle of the screen, the number one skill, according to this audience, to lead remote workers. What do you think? What is this skill as a leader to lead remote workers? Give me a few ideas. Empathy, big time. What else? Self? Self-driven, yeah, you need self-motivators, self-starters, yes. So the word which was on the screen was over-communicate. may sound a bit negative and surprising, 
It has two aspects, clarified. First of all, if you give a task remotely and you put it in an asynchronous channel, you don't see if the people are not in agreement or they are puzzled. So give them not just the task, give them why we do what we do. Give them the goal that this task will achieve. Because otherwise, they will start bugging you back on their peers, and you will waste time. Invest a little bit to give them the bigger picture, the big why and the big what. And second aspect is, Make sure they, understood what, they understand what do you mean. Sometimes we give a task when we see the result has nothing to do with what we expected. Who is to blame? Me, the communication sender. So make sure, ask them to rephrase that they really understood. So these two aspects of our communication can over time, you know, spare your time and, and have a better result. The second tip, which I use in my family, is praise, praise, praise. I've tried with my girls with constructive criticism using the best practices. I failed miserably. The only thing that works is praise, praise, praise. And similarly apply to virtual teams. What to praise, you may ask. If there is a result, if there is a deliverable, praise the result. If there is no result yet, but you see supportive behaviors, psychological safety, praise the behavior. If there is neither result nor behavior, look harder. There is always something to praise, but be authentic. And then there are many others, like take regular breaks. I take like every 25 minutes if I'm not on stage, you know. Alexa, set an alarm. Take regular breaks. You will see. You will have, you'll be more productive in the end. And particularly if you're like in a multiple time zones, as we saw in the room, agree on a single channel for urgent communication and agree on the response time. Don't use email for urgent. Let the team decide. Now. Forums and agenda. I will just mention here that how many of you use like Scrum or any of the agile methodologies? Quite a few. So in your, in your regular communication, make sure you have a meeting with a core team, core project team or core leadership team, the core members, the manager and his reports. And whatever your periodic is, like weekly or daily, start with a personal update. Start with a highlight from each one share within two minutes, what is my highlight since we last met? You will see, particularly if it's fully hybrid or remote context, this is the spice of the meeting. People share what's my record in half marathon, and I've seen many sporty people here, I was positively surprised, or how it tastes, red wine from Chile, reserve 96. So very personal, two minutes, set the tone. Once, if this is like your weekly team meeting, the core team, like monthly, but it's key that the team decide, not the manager, I invite a bit of a bigger body. It could be, if you like, multiple hierarchy, their direct reports. So the leadership team is the manager and his direct reports, and here is the extended leadership team. Or if it's like a smaller team, you could invite key partners and suppliers or um, different stakeholders, key interfaces within the organization. It's very important. Once you set the goals, the interdependent goals, the nucleus and everyone is having a goal, here everyone reports, where am I with my strategic goal? So, and you open it for key interfaces to also find out. That will ensure from a virtual power team center, you go and spread the message and your mission within the organization. VR is coming big time. Recently I had a VR keynote in a hotel room and we were on the Necker Island, so this immersive thing is coming and will make our meeting probably a bit more exciting. And then a little bit on the psychological safety in hybrid teams. Do you know how many people want to come back to the office the old way? What's the percentage? Yes? Yeah, you, you want to, okay. Let's ask the room. How many want to go back five days a week? Okay. 20, 20%, 20 yes. So global research says 25. 70% like in this audience, 75 prefer to work remotely, if possible, even if they have a pay cut. But two-thirds, 66, want to have a meaningful interaction with their colleagues. And you will see how the fully remote companies do it. So a few ideas how to set the psychological safety if some people work remote. As a manager, call the team members and get their needs. You know, it was easy to distinguish work and non-work in the past. Now, if you work from home, we have different needs, different constraints. Young kids, all the aging parents, and so on. Get the needs of everyone. Then you can put the needs of the team. Maybe you need a really synchronous time where everybody is online. 
lead the way, share your constraint first. You don't expect that everybody will open up and share, and you, in the end, don't share anything. Start, share your constraints, your vulnerabilities. That's how we build trust. You don't fix it with one meeting. Make it a recurring format, and make sure if people share, this is not penalized. It's stay confidential. Share the quick wins. If somebody share a constraint, don't have a room for like three hours budget review, maybe co-working co space and so on. If there are solutions to their problem, share. That would make people that it's not just a lip service. We mean it. And then very important, be a watchdog. Watch the language. Don't, we miss you, come to the office. Why don't you come? Doesn't help, just pressure. We miss your ideas, we miss your empathy, but we understand your constraints. How can we help? This how can we help? How can I help as a leader? This is the key question. And again, micromanagement is not an option in virtual teams. You cannot control, it's counterproductive. The name of the game is empowerment. So put the goals, put the roadmaps, let the people choose. So you set the nucleus as a team, People choose their individual goals and then set them free. On the how, let them decide within some budgetary and time constraints. And then if you made a mistake, because we live in an agile world, be the first one as a leader, hey, I made a mistake. The first one as soon as possible. Celebrate the mistakes. This is how we learn. Because of this, this and that. Because that's the learning. Maybe you made the wrong assumption. You don't do it on purpose. In this way, you enable others also, if they do a mistake, to share. A few ideas from Google, they have their hybrid work, they have this team pots, everything is on wheels, you could build as big as you need space with this smart camera. Everything on wheels, you have this privacy robot, so this is a wall which is inflating. If you need privacy, you click a button, it gives you visual privacy and audio privacy, you finish, click, this robot wall disappears. And then you could just scan, and if you need a standing desk, this will adjust to your preferences. Now let me share a few tips of the companies that work fully remote, you know, that don't have an office and still deliver best results. Like Airbnb, they had their best results in the last two years. Even that the tourist industry was negatively impacted by COVID, working fully remote, they had best years. And now they go remote first policy. Three principles, full transparency, very brief, each employee has the information of the CEO. The PL, if you need to lay off people, what are the arguments? Full transparency. Second, the leaders, this organization happened to be flatter. So the leaders master the video. They send the messages why we do on the why, 10 minutes video, and they track if people watch or not. And then they do retreats. If they don't have the office, twice a year they meet, all hands build a project roadmap, there is a lot of know-how how to leverage on these events. As a mathematician, cannot leave you without one formula, and this is virtual power teams. P is personality. Let people present themselves as human beings. V is vision, the nucleus. Make sure the nucleus is defined bottom-up. I is intimacy. Let them connect as human beings, not just an expert. And S is self or ego, the less the better. If we define the team, you know, in some corporations, some managers have hidden agenda, which facilitates their career, their bonus scheme. If we have um, the goal set up as a team and everyone picks his individual goal and a lot of praise, 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 you don't have to develop your hidden agenda. So just mention this um, story. That was the 1 billion euro project. That was a client, global fast-moving consumer good companies, and they had Chinese traders buying their goods in six countries, Australia, UK, France, <clears throat> and putting them on Alibaba. And the overall volume was 1 billion euro. And then the vice president of business development said, OK, let's be smart, as the general managers in these six countries, get together, accumulate the volume, so the procurement can do a deal with Alibaba. One year passed, nothing happened. Very busy people, big egos involved, so he said, OK, let's set up a project and build a powerful virtual team. Very diverse. So 10 people, the six GMs, supply chain, finance director, HR, we were in Amsterdam for one day, and we defined the culture on three scales. First was the leadership scale, distinguishing between hierarchical culture 
and where you have big distance between boss and employee, you know, you ask for permission, wait for approval, and egalitarian, you're expected to be proactive, to challenge your boss. And different countries, they fall on the scale in a different, like, it will be interesting whether you see Bulgaria, but like China, Russia, Japan, they're very hierarchical, Scandinavian and egalitarian. So ask them to put their optimal position on the scale. And there, a moment was, they say, okay, we will be more egalitarian, where is the first star, until we reach project mandate, high-level project definition, and then we'll be more, more, uh, hier more hierarchical. Now, this is the brief, give it to the Chinese, now go on and deliver. Similarly was the decision scale, top-down versus consensus, and then disagreeing or conflict scale. And then everyone committed based on this, what can I do in order to enable this culture? And what our leader can do in order to enable it? So culture is a soft thing, you cannot impose it, but if people choose it themselves, the team in a well-moderated format, and they make a commitment, they hold each other peer accountable. So this is the only way from my perspective to introduce culture. Let them choose it and hold each other peer accountable. So we had in the end 0.1% profitability, which reducing the project cost was 80 million. So winning spirit, I will send you a video on the winning spirit. This is the global services project. It's a very nice story. I love it, but happy to share a video with you. We went to Tenerife, Canary Islands. We said, if we finish this two years project, um, three months earlier, we go all 30 people to Tenerife, Canary Islands. We convinced the project board because the people cost was 1 million euro project, uh, 1 million per annum. If we finish three months earlier, we save 250 and with 50 we go. We had this visual reporting, which is key, like an island and, uh, you know, the, the palm tree and the parachuters, 20 parachuters for each of the country. And visual and virtual is key. If you know where we are towards our goal at any moment in time, if you know who needs help, who can help, who already landed on the island, you create a winning spirit. People go extra mile. So we, we had a top customer feedback, we saved 200,000 net and we had a great party. Now concluding, um, again, questions for you. Um, to do the old 10 big rocks in the detail, usually we do a tailored workshop, two days when we tune it for your organization, your reality. And there is also, because time is very pressured nowadays, a digital masterclass where you, all these 10 big rocks, six hour videos, 20 videos, you can digest uh, in your own convenience when you have the time. Before I go to the universe, and I see we have few seconds, if you scan this, you can get the virtual power team book. It's already five years old, so now I'm happy to, to share with the world. Um, let's go back to the universe just for a moment. We started with a space journey. Let's go to the universe just for one um, kind of minute. Do you know that in the universe only 10% is material? 10% are planets and stars. 20% is like nothing, like black holes or phenomena the scientists still cannot uh, explain. And 70%, the major part, is invisible energy, like the gravity that holds the universe the way we, call, we, we know it. In a virtual team, it's quite similar. 10% are the team members and the infrastructure. 20% are undeveloped yet potentials. And 70%, the major part, are the relationships, the trust, the gravity that holds the universe together. So, the art to lead virtual teams is to focus on the 70%. And I'm sure you will be amazed by the wonderful thoughts to come. So let me conclude with one sentence which has guided me through the years, and it goes like this. If you dream alone, this is just a dream. If we people dream together, this is the beginning of a new reality. Thank you so much. Uh, we can do one question. Who would like to ask a question? Come on, don't be shy. OK, I'll ask a question. What's, yes. he, what's your biggest strength? And how did you figure out that this is your biggest strength? My biggest strength? Yeah. My biggest strength, I think, is um, because I was IT manager. I hope I'm not kind of overestimating myself, but it's inspiring people. If I'm inspired about something, 
I can transfer this energy and passion to, to the others. And I changed my job eight years ago, and I enjoy. I never worked again, <laughs> you know. So I think that's my biggest trend. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, guys. If you have further questions or you would like to reach out to Peter, you can find him in the networking room. It's right there, my right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
SAP focused on making businesses run better by pushing the boundaries of innovation and impacted the world and people's lives beyond anything the founders ever imagined. Hello, my name is Karina and I will present our next speaker, Ivan Ilyev, who is a DevOps engineering and has helped multi-millions company uh, to, uh, build and, uh, to build modern applications with IT infrastructure and uh, he will present today uh, architecture with a Kubernetes operator in multi-cloud. So please welcome Ivan. Hello. As you can see, uh, we had a pr just a small technical problem, as usual. So there is quite a lot of people. I will actually need to pretend that I know what I'm speaking about. Uh, so today's topic it's Kubernetes, and more specifically, operators in Kubernetes. Uh, how, they, how do they work, uh, what they are, what are custom resource definitions, uh, how potentially we can use them. Uh, so, if you don't know what Kubernetes is and what problem does it solve, uh, essentially, just to simplify it, Kubernetes is a container orchestrator. What does a container orchestrator mean? So, container orchestrators are essentially managing containers. Uh, they provide also clusterization for those containers, so we can create large clusters with many nodes to which we can host our containers, and the orchestrators are essentially managing the state of our containers and our applications. Uh, furthermore, uh, Kubernetes is providing quite a lot of extendability, and that is a very important point because in Kubernetes, we can extend it however we want. We don't have something which is provided natively, then we can extend it. So we can pretty much tailor it to our own use case. And that is very powerful too. Uh, also, we have uh, one very, another actually important point, which is the community. And I do not mean by community just asking in Stack Overflow, okay, how can I do this? Or just finding, um, something for Kubernetes uh, in the internet, let's say in GitHub. Uh, community actually means a lot for Kubernetes because Kubernetes is com community driven. That means that uh, essentially to develop Kubernetes, you need to have a big community which is taking part of it. And as of now, as far as I'm aware, if you want to find a solution to deploy on container orchestrator, it is far more likely to find it, for example, in Kubernetes than any other orchestrator, for example, in HashiCorp Nomad. It's just more popular. Uh, so, Kubernetes actually 
I'm not thinking that it solves every unique case. Uh, but yeah, so how do we deploy usually in Kubernetes? First, we need a cluster. So how we would create our cluster? Usually, we would use a tool like, let's say, like Terraform. Uh, Terraform, Terraform will build our cluster, will create it essentially, let's say, in a cloud environment in Azure or AWS, and we will have our own cluster. Uh, then we need our application, which will build and test on containers, uh, for example, Docker, and we'll publish most likely our containers to a remote registry. So we have our cluster and we have our uh, containerized application. Then what we do? We deploy it, but how do we deploy it? And here it comes the tricky part. We will usually write quite a lot of Kubernetes manifests. And what are Kubernetes manifests? Kubernetes manifests are one quite big, I would say, uh, either YAML or JSON files. And they are quite a lot because we usually separate them. So we have one for our deployment, one for our, let's say, database secrets. Uh, also, we have for our app settings uh, file, we have a config map. And we also have probably a bunch of volumes. And if you deploy a microservices-based application, you'll have a lot of those. Um, so we deployed, let's say, using this example, our application with a lot of Kubernetes manifests. Then what challenges would we face? Well, we'll have several challenges. One is not being able to scale dynamically according to the state of our application. We can most likely still scale on CPU and memory-based metrics, but we all know that uh, they are not 100% correct what it, our application is doing. So to tackle this issue, we need to scale our, our application by using the state of it. So what is our application actually doing at the moment? Let's say that it's processing something and the intention is to have a lot of CPU and memory. Also, we face another challenge. We have no in-cluster automation. So let's say that we have these big deployment pipelines, we have uh, the build process automated, everything is automated, but when it comes to the deployed application, it is very much manual. We just uh, depend that we don't touch it. Don't touch the production. Don't touch anything. It works. Well, yeah, but it, that can be actually bad because let's say that our applications needs to scale. And what do we do? We go and scale it manually? Well, that's not really good option. Um, also, there is no integration between the ha hardware slash infrastructure and the software. Uh, well, in the 1960s, when the National Space Agency of the US, NASA for short, uh, was developing the Apple missions to the moon, they actually managed to do it with technologies which are so, so far back. And how they did manage to actually send astronauts to the moon, and nowadays we still have not sent. And we are complaining, OK, my code needs actually uh, 24 CPUs and 80 gigabytes of RAM just for a small web application. Let's not mention the npm install command here. Uh, so uh, the thing here is that we had quite a big integration between the hardware and the software. Or in a sense, our infrastructure knew what code it was running, and our code knew what on what infrastructure it was working on. So there was very, very big automation part and integration. Uh, so for, I would say, the last 10 years, with the, especially with containers and so on, it was like kind of the perception come in that we build it once, deploy it everywhere, or it should work on any infrastructure. It's called infrastructure agnostic, so our application should work everywhere. OK, but that's not really the case, or I would not say. This is quite a lot misunderstood, because we still would need to have some integration with our infrastructure if you want to have bigger optimization. Uh, and the last point uh, would be the cloud part is missing. Well, essentially, we have Kubernetes. We deploy something, but where is the cloud part? OK, our cluster might be on the cloud, but are we using anything apart from just, let's say, Microsoft managing our cloud, our cloud-based Kubernetes? 
Mm, most likely not. We might have some managed database which we deployed alongside manually or uh, any other code, but in the big in the big part, our cluster it's just staying as it is on non-prem, and we just deploy our manifests. Okay, so how we can potentially solve uh, those challenges? Uh, nobody knows Kubernetes. Where does this came from? Well, it comes from this acronym, CRD. CRD stands for Custom Resource Definitions. And as it is in the name, there are something custom in Kubernetes. And nobody knows it because everybody can write their own uh, custom resource definitions. And if you can write your own, you cannot know what uh, some guy, for example, in the UK uh, decided to write as a code. And you say, yeah, I know Kubernetes. Yes, but you cannot know everything for sure. So CRDs. Uh, CRDs are custom Kubernetes manifests, as everything it is. So we deployed via custom Kubernetes manifests, which we write. I'm going to show uh, an example just later on. And it is just a record inside Kubernetes. So it does not perform any action by itself. So it is just a record inside our, let's say, SQL database. We can imagine it like this. This is a very simplistic explanation. Uh, we can also have uh, one really good option, which is multiple versions. So we can have multiple versions of this CRD and what kind of parameters accept. So let's say that we introduced a new feature. We can introduce it to the new version and mark the old one as deprecated. And the new version will have more properties, essentially. And finally, it is Kubernetes object like everything else. So we can work with it with the API like we work with pods, deployments, config maps, and everything else. So if it is just a record, how would we actually use it in Kubernetes? It's just a record. It's nothing. It stays written, but that's it. And here it comes the Kubernetes operators. So the operators are what it actually takes action. So it can monitor for those custom resource definition and deploy something based on them. But operators are uh, a little bit more. They don't operate only on the basis of custom resource definition. In the most uh, essential form, there are some piece of containerized code. So that can be Python, Node.js, Go, whatever you want. They also interact with the Kubernetes REST API. So they are essentially connected with the cluster by connecting to its own API. Uh, and very important point here, they can interact not only with the Kubernetes API, but any other API in the world. Let's say that we have some food delivery app. It can also interact with that food delivery app alongside with the Kubernetes REST API. So it can interact with both and do something with both APIs altogether. And the final point is that they constantly need to monitor our application and cluster. And uh, why does it need to monitor those things? Well, it essentially uh, should be able to see what is going on, what is happening, and take actions based on what it sees. Um, so some example operators uh, you may find for AWS and Azure. They have multiple ones, for example, for ingress controllers, for deploying some databases, and so on. Uh, Prometheus have a very popular operator, which is for deployment of the Prometheus and Grafana stack. And you just type three commands, everything is deployed. You have your monitoring, you have your graphs, you have your alerts, and that is done just by three commands. And the thing here is that the Prometheus operators are actually doing all this. Uh, we can also have for example, some operators for date, managed databases, and so on. And the source for this is in one very cool website called operatorhub.io, and you can find quite a lot of operators for pretty much anything you can think of there, or anything it is written. So I'm going to step to the first demo, which is actually uh, creating dynamic worker processes. And what I mean by this, let's say in this example, we have uh, let's say one simple queuing service, which accepts messages. And we need workers to, let's say, process those messages. How we can integrate this with Kubernetes? So if we go to the, just let me move my screen, okay. 
Uh, so I prepared the demo. The first part here is our deployment because operator needs to be deployed as usual. We cannot avoid the manifests. So I'm going to skip to the deployment part. So we just have a simple container. We deploy it with service account so it can interact with our API. And we have also attached some secrets so it can interact, in my case, with the AWS API. And we also have some code. And that code is actually very simple. So I'm written this quite quickly in Python. And we have two main packages. One is the Kubernetes package for Python, which is a wrapper for the API. And we have another package, which is called Bottle Tree, for interacting with the simple queuing service in Amazon. So it's a quite simple code where it just follows the queue, so interacts with the Cloud API, and it creates new worker processes based on the how big our queue is. So if we go right now to the demo one folder, maybe we can try to apply it. So we are going to apply the operator. And let's see if it would be applied. So we did not mention something. Okay. And we deployed our operator. Okay. Let me open some very cool program, which is called uh, Lens. It's just a Kubernetes ID to be able to show it. And as of now, you can see our operator is deployed, and we have one worker process. And what is this worker process? Let's, uh, let's go back to our queue. And I also have a simple script. Just let me spam maybe this. So a simple script, which will create some messages. So I've created some messages really quickly. Let me scroll. And yeah, messages and some random string. And if we go back now, we can see that uh, our operator is spawning workers, which are processing those messages. And when they are suc succeeded, essentially they are uh, queued and they die. So we can spawn dynamically uh, containers based on the state of our queue, which is also in the cloud, so we interact with it. Um, so let's go to queue our operator here, because we don't need it anymore. OK. And let's go back to our presentation. So the next point would be demo number two. And this is defining our application as a custom resource. So let's say that we are a SaaS company which provides some kind of a SaaS services. And we need to deploy an uh, instance for each of our customers. But if you worked in such a company, you know that every customer comes and they have their own requirement and you need to configure it per their own requirements and it becomes a mess. So let's say that this customer wants Postgres uh, SQL database, another wants MySQL, another wants MSQL, and congratulations, you have quite a lot of problems. How we can solve this potentially in Kubernetes? So let's go to the demo number two which is custom, custom resource definitions. And we have a little bit more files here we can look. So uh, the first part is our custom resource definition. And we can see that this is actually quite straightforward, very simple object for Kubernetes. So we define custom resource definition as a type, and then we pass some properties. I've defined only one version, which is version 1. And then we passed two custom properties, which I called image. And image, it will require to pass it as to pass some string to it. So I'll need to pass some string for an image. And I will also need to pass another point, which is called nodes, or at least I called it nodes. And this needs to be an integer. So in my definition, I need to pass one string, which would be for image, and one um, option, which is for the number of nodes. Uh, so this also needs to be scripted, of course, in your operator to be able to handle these resources. And we have also another uh, deployment file, which is for actually deployment of our custom application. And you can see here that I have 
image and I have number of nodes. In our case, one would be with two nodes and another would be with three nodes. So if you go back and actually deploy our thing, So, oh, first, let's say we want to deploy our custom resource definition. So, name it my app CRD. So, if we click apply, we've created it. Now we can create our applications. Okay, let's deploy two of our applications. Okay, we've created them. And if we go again, we should be able to see our custom resources, which are deployed just 10 seconds ago, and we have to, one is my Easter and the another one called Very Cool App. But we cannot actually see any pods or anything being created. That's because, as I told you, this is just a record. So we need to deploy actually an operator which manages those custom resources. Uh, so deploy it. That means it's created. And we have our operator, which is currently starting. It's probably pulling the image. So if we give it a second, or maybe just check on the status. Uh, yeah, it pretty much started. And uh, immediately, it created our application, which we have two nodes of the very cool app and three nodes of the application, which is called MyEast. Uh, so let's go back to the presentation and let me just expand it. So what we were able to demonstrate in these two demos. So we were able to interact with the cloud service provider API. In our case, we just followed an SQS service, which is in Amazon. And we actually changed something in Kubernetes based on the external state. So we interacted with both different APIs to change something on our application. Uh, so to summarize, we interacted with another software to change our infrastructure state. We have also interacted with the cloud provider SDK or API to deploy resources as we need them. And we, are, we also have bundled our application into a single resource. And our operator should ideally know how to manage uh, this single resource or instance of our application in such behavior that it knows that we can have multiple ones. It means that we can deploy different instances for different customers with completely different options, and it should know what is going on. So thank you very much. That was from me for my demo and my presentation. Some useful links would be the Kubernetes documentation, GitHub uh, page of the Kubernetes client, also some documentation in the Red Hat si website and some other documentation as well. Thank you very much. If there are any questions. Well, we have one question. Just a moment. <laughs> So I, I repeat just, when I, when I uh, learn in, um, uh, use uh, Kubernetes, I have an impression that uh, Kubernetes operations a bit on the side, is not mainstream of the Kubernetes stuff. Yeah? Uh, I also see that the big uh, GE providers like uh, WebSphere, Laptop Logic tries to wrap somehow web server using operators in Kubernetes. Uh, could you um, elaborate a bit what is the use cases for operators? How, when, when we should uh, uh, keep um, uh, uh, replica set in deployment, so just a standard way, and to thinking about using operators in which cases? Yeah, so actually deployment replica set is something I would say a bit different than operators because deployment replica set, they are just a Kubernetes object which deploy essentially at the end pod. Deployment deploys a replica set and so on. But uh, those things, they do not have, I would say, code logic in them. There is, but it is already built in Kubernetes. So we cannot, it's hard to extend this without operator and so on. And what operators are doing, they're essentially, I would say, something like a plugin 
for Kubernetes. We can imagine it uh, this way. So we need a function which is not already in Kubernetes. We cannot find it in any other platform. And let's say we have a customized application and we want to pass multiple properties, you're probably not going to find it anywhere, so you need to build it yourself. And the way to do this, at least in Kubernetes, one way, it's operator. I would agree that they're a little bit on the side, not that many people in the world are talking about because you also need to spend development time to develop this operator, to be customized for your own needs, and that is actually quite hard, but in a lot of cases, if you're, for example, a SaaS provider, that can help you a lot. But do you have some practical examples from the so some, some use cases when um, I uh, should uh, I, I see some uh, monitoring systems perhaps as a good for operators? Yeah. Would you uh, um, uh, show uh, some other examples? Yeah, for example, MariaDB or MySQL. If you deploy it with something with the operator, uh, usually if you deploy it like a pod. Uh, it would be just a single instance. If you deploy it clusterized, you need to manage it essentially yourself and write some logic to monitor is the cluster intact and so on. Uh, that is already built into the, those operators, so they will manage the state of that cluster inside Kubernetes. Of course, it might have some limitations, but it's up to you to customize it. Also, we had a customer which reached out uh, to my company a few months ago, and they were exactly a SaaS provider. They had something which was built, and they wanted it to be migrated to Azure Cloud, also to have an Azure instances. Uh, but there was many problems exactly because they didn't use uh, Kubernetes and operators specifically. specifically. And they were using exactly uh, very similar infrastructure to what I showed. They were doing some kind of a CRM where uh, they had a lot of components which were spread into multiple services and they didn't have a central point of actually management. Okay, thanks. Another question? No? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. SAP focused on making businesses run better by pushing the boundaries of innovation and impacted the world and people's lives beyond anything the founders ever imagined. With 50 years of groundbreaking work, SAP will continue to lead the way with innovation and help the world run better and improve people's lives. Stripe Bulgaria was founded in 2008 by the Dutch entrepreneur Kun van Wijk. His vision was to create solutions that exceed customer expectations. Since 2014, Stripes is part of the ICT Group in the Netherlands. ICT Group is a stock-listed company on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange and employs more than 1,000 professionals. Since 2017, I have the privilege and honor to drive Stripes forward in the role of CEO. We offer solutions to our clients in digital transformation, smart applications and infrastructure. Our mission is to build smart solutions that create business impact. We are Stripe.
want me to see We're a pretty resilient species, and that's true now more than ever. So we deserve app experiences that are as resilient as we are. This starts with apps that can scale to keep pace with shifting demand, or update at a moment's notice to support entirely new business models. In a time when the app experience has become the human experience, being future ready means keeping people at the heart of innovation and flexing to meet their needs. Because technology really can change the world, but the best technology changes with it. Мъркъл започват официално в България на 1 януари 2022 година, но двете компании, които обединява са на нашия пазар доста по-отдавна. Isobar Commerce и Liferia стартират съвместна работа като част от новата бизнес линия на Мъркъл Commerce and Experience. Аз съм част от това семейство от 13 години и заедно с много мои колеги преживяхме най-различни метаморфози на фирмата. Започнахме като малък стартъп, наречен Никомера през 2008 година. Тогава празнувахме успешен декемврийски ден на коледно пазаруване с цели 1000 онлайн поръчки за 24 часа. През 2015 година Екомера беше придобита от iSobar и стана част от бизнеса на Денцо. Това ни позволи да спечелиме нови вълнуващи клиенти и на последния черен петък през 2021 година достигнахме пикови стоености от 1000 поръчки в минута. През цялото това време сме разработили и внедрили над 400 транзакционал сайта. Работили сме с клиенти в над 60 държави и имаме онлайн магазини на 6 континента. Качеството на кода и поддръжката ни е ненадмината. Затова свидетелстват и нашите клиенти, с които работим заедно вече повече от 13 години. Днес сме Мъркъл и целим да поставим нови рекорди с качеството на кода, който пишем.
SAP focused on making businesses run better by pushing the boundaries of innovation and impacted the world and people's lives beyond anything the founders ever imagined. With 50 years of groundbreaking work, SAP will continue to lead the way with innovation and help the world run better and improve people's lives. Strides Bulgaria was founded in 2008 by the Dutch entrepreneur Kun van Wijk. His vision was to create solutions that exceed customer expectations. Since 2014, Stripes is part of the ICT Group in the Netherlands. ICT Group is a stock-listed company on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange and employs more than 1,000 professionals. Since 2017, I have the privilege and honor to drive Stripes forward in the role of CEO. We offer solutions to our clients in digital transformation, smart applications and infrastructure. Our mission is to build smart solutions that create business impact. We are Stripe. We're a pretty resilient species, and that's true now more than ever. So we deserve app experiences that are as resilient as we are. This starts with apps that can scale to keep pace with shifting demand, or update at a moment's notice to support entirely new business models. In a time when the app experience has become the human experience, being future ready means keeping people at the heart of innovation and flexing to meet their needs. Because technology really can change the world, but the best technology changes with it.
Мъркъл започват официално в България на 1 януари 2022 година, но двете компании, които обединява са на нашия пазар доста по-отдавна. Isobar Commerce и Liferia стартират съвместна работа като част от новата бизнес линия на Мъркъл Commerce and Experience. Аз съм част от това семейство от 13 години и заедно с много мои колеги преживяхме най-различни метаморфози на фирмата. Започнахме като малък стартъп, наречен Никомера през 2008 година. Тогава празнувахме успешен декемврийски ден на коледно пазаруване с цели 1000 онлайн поръчки за 24 часа. През 2015 година Екомера беше придобита от Айсобар и стана част от бизнеса на Денцо. Това ни позволи да спечелиме нови вълнуващи клиенти и на последния черен петък през 2021 година достигнахме пикови стоености от 1000 поръчки в минута. През цялото това време сме разработили и внедрили над 400 транзакционал сайта. Работили сме с клиенти в над 60 държави и имаме онлайн магазини на 6 континента. Качеството на кода и поддръжката ни е ненадмината. Затова свидетелстват и нашите клиенти, с които работим заедно вече повече от 13 години. Днес сме Мъркъл и целим да поставим нови рекорди с качеството на кода, който пишем. It's really important, and that's why we are invite our next lector, who has more than seven years of experience with uh, quality and main focus of performance testing. So let me introduce you Rohit and his great lecture, lecture about why performance test fails. Here. Hello, здравейте. Uh, Аз се казвам Rohit. Аз живот младо с четири, not that you need to know. Аз говоря малко български, so I just wanted to say a few lines because, you know, I, I tried to learn them a bit hard. But anyway, uh, so I've been in the performance area for about six, seven years now. And uh, I would like to share my experience about what are some do's and don'ts. So let's get started. Yeah, I love this guy. He's trying his best, doing all he can, try, trying to achieve the goals. And the goals would in this case be to have a, a well-performing and uh, high resilient system, which is something that we miss quite often. So I just want to sh uh, share why we miss that. Uh, so the first thing is, of course, uh, we are not having the real world scenarios. Meaning we have a lot of tests, we, we put in a lot of effort to design and develop those tests, but they are nowhere what is going to happen in the real world. And why is that? Because uh, we, don't, we don't touch base with the customer as often as we should. We don't talk to them uh, or, or the, we don't explore the use cases as often as we should. And even before talking about the real world scenarios, I want to say that Uh, we need to find if a system actually deserves performance because sometimes we we do we test a use case or a system which doesn't actually deserve performance test and that's that's your failing point number one uh, and let's say this is a system you you are given a task to test it is it something that you really want to do like do you really want to do a load test on a system that looks like this or this I don't think so. I mean, even if you try to see how much data or can flow through the system, it's useless because you, uh, I mean, if you can tell from the first glance that the system is not uh, going to scale, um, I think that's it. We should tell, that should be our first point of feedback and sometimes we miss that. We just try to test even before we know if the testing is required. And performance testing has a lot of cost. It has a lot of cost of execution, maintenance and development. So why would you spend money and effort on something that's not needed? The next, like, this is an example of a, of a like, I would like to ask you, do you think this is a, this is a test that should be done on a, on a phone? Like, any yeses? This, is this a needed test? Like, you try to put it on under the, under the, under the car? I mean, It's, it's still debatable, but I still think it's a, it's a bit an ov of an overkill, and it's not a real-world use case. Um, I saw some tests with a phone where they are trying to uh, actually replicate uh, your bottom sitting on the phone rather than the car tire, because the, the use case is different. It might bend, it may not break, crack, but the actual test should look like real use cases, so of course. Uh, 
the next one, this one. Do you think this is real world? Like sometimes we go too deep into trying to make sure uh, this is a, this is a, um, you know, our product is the best. But do you really need a test like this, where you uh, are trying to burn down your phone uh, in, in, in lava? I, I don't think so. Uh, another problem that we have is when we have when we when when people say get set go, we try and have as many tests automated as possible, and that's that's not the always the right answer. I mean, there is a point uh, after which you are actually losing value when you have too many tests to maintain. I mean, be it end to end or be it performance, it doesn't matter. But and actually for performance, you you actually lose that value much faster. So. I mean, the, the best way to, to measure value for uh, performance is not just by the count of the test, but actually the aspects that you are covering. So are you covering the performance? Are you covering the resilience? Like, um, are you trying to make sure that you have m many different facets covered and not just the number? I mean, running behind the numbers is not what we should be doing. And this is a graph that I have, um, I have shown. So, if you like for every project there is a there is amount of testing that is beneficial and after which it is actually a negative impact on you so the total number of tests that you have uh, there is going to be a point up until which you you are going to getting you are going to be getting value after which you you just have some tests that are actually not um, giving you any value and actually are reducing uh, the overall gains that you have from the testing framework so another thing that people fall into running behind the number of tests uh, another problem with uh, performance testing is that when you have tests that run two hours, three hours, six hours, endurance tests, and you leave a step in them that is not fully automated. So you have a step, you have to go and download some kind of a report at the end of the test from the environment. I mean, not everyone does that, but still some people fall into that, and that kills productivity like anything, uh, like that kills productivity much more than anything else. And if you have such a step, get rid of it immediately. Um, so I just told you what half, half autom automation is. You have to, you have an environment which uh, you are trying to, uh, in from which you are trying to uh, download a report at the end of the test, or you are trying to get a snapshot of a failure, so some something went out of memory, and uh, you actually have to go in and uh, take a screen, uh, take a, a heap dump of the uh, the process that you have. If you have such a step automated, it's going to make your life easier. If you don't, then you will have to spend many many hours looking into the right time when you need such a, such a snapshot. And that's what's going to happen if you, if you don't have a full automation. You'll be the only one in the city, uh, awake at 3 AM, waiting for the test to finish. Uh, I told you how to avoid it. Automate everything and don't leave anything uh, when you're automating. I, some some uh, companies and structures have a way of, uh, of doing that, meaning uh, you will actually have an environment. You, you automatically work in AWS. And, um, Everything is there, so at the end of the test, you are pushed to do it. But let's say you have some servers that are yours forever. You have a on-prem environment, and they are yours forever. So what you're going to actually do is uh, forget about cleaning and uh, taking a snapshot or uh, rerunning those steps. And you may have a step at the at somewhere in your cycle that is not automated. The next pitfall is you like test results that cannot be repeated, meaning. Uh, you have a you have a set of tests that you have automated very hard, but you, when you try to run them six months after, you cannot repeat them. Again, uh, in one of my previous companies, uh, previous uh, projects that I worked with, there was a there was a project with uh, with Oracle database that some database administrator came in and he just automated and did some tuning that nobody knows what he did. And after that, we had very good performance. And after a few. Uh, Few weeks of that, uh, we like the database administrator was not in the company, and uh, somebody deleted the database, and nobody ever was able to bring back that performance. So the magic was gone. So always, always uh, like take a snapshot of everything that you have done because performance testing is much more complex than any other testing. And whatever you do should be committed um, in in your uh, repository and infrastructure as code. And these tools that I have mentioned here, they are really really useful for uh, for such automation. OK, so this is another thing. So what would you do if you have a magic wand, like, like Harry Potter here? Like, you're excited. And like it would be stupid if you do this. Like, you submit it, um, and you would say that, OK, I'm done. I, I just used it. I don't want to use it anymore. That's what we do sometimes with our tests. We automate a lot of tests, and we never put it in continuous execution. So you don't get to uh, get the value of you know Harry Potter having those seven more films and 
Voldemort being killed because you just used it once on the day one and then you said, I don't want to use it. So once you have a test, once you have put in a lot of effort, um, always, always make use of continuous execution to see the trends in performance because with performance, we cannot see trends unless we have uh, a history of them because with just a few tests, you will never know if 2% degradation has happened uh, in, your, in your release. So a large history of having exact X number, X amount of performance or X throughput or X response times, and then suddenly you see a 2% degradation, that is something that you, are, uh, you, you want to see. So a history is much more important in performance, and it should be always uh, looked at. And the power is infinite, like you have one release, you, you, you just tested your one release, you want to test all of the releases after that. You have put in l hard hours and a hard amount of um, you know, uh, money into building that test, making that stable. So you definitely want to have uh, and, and, and use it for the rest of the, of the, of the work, for the, all the future work, basically. And then you will be able to slay Voldemort. Uh, so most of the time when we think about performance, this comes to mind, like how fast the things are. But is it really the case, like non-functional uh, testing, non-functional QA, they not, need, need not, not only look into performance, but also uh, into resilience of the system. So, I mean, I'm going to say a few more things that I think we should be doing and not just what we are doing. Uh, fast is not always enough. So there are many non-functional aspects, and we should not just focus on performance all the time. What about the resilience? So tell me about this, like an aircraft landing on a landing strip. Do you really care how fast it lands, or do you really care if it lands or not, like if it crashes or if it doesn't or the weather is not right? So. In this case, in, in some use cases, performance is like the second priority, actually. It's the resilience which is much more important. And resilience is something that we always overlook in many projects, like because performance is such a buzzword, we always forget about resilience. The second thing, like if you don't test and think about all the scenarios, you remember this incident from um, Suez Canal when um, Evergreen was stuck. I'm not saying like the ship was not built and tested, but at least something went wrong, like the whole entire end-to-end -end flow of getting that ship through the canal did not work. And there was a reason behind it, because at least something was not thought about. Maybe it was the, the pilots who were guiding the ship or the helpers who were trying to tell them how to guide the ship to the Suez Canal. And that's when you should test a system in, in its entirety, not just the components, but integration with like human aspects and integration with many different aspects is, becomes much more important. And the last thing is something I learned from a very wise person in, our, in my previous experience. Like Sometimes effectiveness comes, actually all the time, effectiveness comes before efficiency. So before you can actually go for being much more efficient and fast, it's much more important to be effective, to actually achieve what you're doing, which is the case of landing the airplane and getting the, the ship past the Suez Canal. If it was slower, not a, really a, that big of a problem if it just cannot pass through the canal. And what other aspects in resilience do we have? So I, I love airplane, airplanes and the way they work. So you see uh, an airplane is certified to play. Uh, uh, most of the airplanes, I believe, are certified to fly with just one engine if the, the second one is gone. But who certifies them? It's the, it's, it's the engineers, like the people who look after the resilience. It cannot be just assumed that one day this is going to happen in the air and it's just going to continue flying like that. So. Uh, it's, it's, it happens all the time, like when the systems or its components fail, what, what does it happen? Those kind of tests should happen and should not be overlooked in any, in any um, large environment, like large environment worth its salt. Uh, OK, so what lies beyond benchmarks? When, when we are doing performance, we focus a lot of time on benchmarks. This is where we start. We measure how fast the things are, what is the throughput, what is the response time what CPU we are using, but there is much more beyond that, like, like in the galaxy far, far away, a lot of things that happen. And some of the things that I mentioned that we should always try and include them in our plans when we are working on them, like stress your system, uh, go two times, five times, ten times, like whatever you need be for the stress, run it for a longer duration. If you're running a, like a one-hour test, try and run it for for, for three days, four days, see what happens, what, what kind of leaks you have in the system. See if you have a memory leak, file handler leak, or, or 
any anything that can that the system is using up but is not freeing up will show up only after a long uh, long duration of testing like in in one of the uh, very early projects that i worked upon the developers were amazed when we just wrote a shell script that did a request for 3 hours and the whole system crashed so it's not something they could not have done but it's something they did not do because they overlooked the fact that such a thing can happen uh what is failover so you you just saw an airplane engine going down so when an engine goes down do you like who make sure that the plane can still fly and that's that's failover like you're part of like you're you have a cluster of uh, multiple nodes and one node goes down who make sure that the rest of the application can still process the minimum critical data needed for the application recovery something has gone down and now you are trying to make sure that um does when it comes back online there is like the transactions are not missing duplicate or um, or or you know if it's a banking app and you have missing and duplicate transaction it's the end of the story so that becomes critical in such situations and in many other situations idle is something you don't even like you don't even put any load on the system just observe like what's happening on the system um, is it scaling down or is the, are there some zombie processes that are all, always consuming resources some test that that always brings some value and the last one is chaos so um it's it's a mix of those it's probably something that you should do at the end like when you have achieved a lot of those uh, scenarios that you want to achieve like do some play around in the in the in the live environments and there is some companies and there is some articles out there you can always read like netflix doing this and they made it popular but it's again something something for the future but things don't happen if you don't have them in your plan that's my point uh and the last point that i want to uh, share today is uh measuring the the measurement of uh, success is the biggest motivator in in any big project so if you're measuring the success in the wrong way then you are going to motivate the the people and the project and the company in the wrong way so i think what it should, what we should measure on is like how many aspects you have covered meaning like are you are you sure that the endurance uh, stress and the the system is resilient the system is performing and many different things not just you know 10000 benchmarks that you have and not basically not the number of tests and the number of use cases that you have so with that uh, that's it uh, i hope it was interesting and i would be taking any questions if you have Thank you so much. Мъркъл започват официално в България на 1 януари 2022 година, но двете компании, които обединява се на нашия пазар доста по-отдавна, Isobar Commerce и Life Area, стартират съвместна работа като част от новата бизнес линия на Мъркъл Commerce and Experience. Аз съм част от това семейство от 13 години и заедно с много мои колеги преживяхме най-различни метаморфози на фирмата. Започнахме като малък стартъп, наречен Никомера през 2008 година. Тогава празнувахме успешен декемврийски ден на коледно пазаруване с цели 1000 онлайн поръчки за 24 часа. През 2015 година Екомера беше придобита от Айсобар и стана част от бизнеса на Денцо. Това ни позволи да спечелиме нови вълнуващи клиенти и на последния черен петък през 2021 година достигнахме пикови стоености от 1000 поръчки в минута. През цялото това време сме разработили и внедрили над 400 транзакционал сайта. Работили сме с клиенти в над 60 държави и имаме онлайн магазини на 6 континента. Качеството на кода и поддръжката ни е ненадмината. Затова свидетелстват и нашите клиенти, с които работим заедно вече повече от 13 години. Днес сме Мъркъл и целим да поставим нови рекорди с качеството на кода, който пишем.
SAP focused on making businesses run better by pushing the boundaries of innovation and impacted the world and people's lives beyond anything the founders ever imagined. With 50 years of groundbreaking work, SAP will continue to lead the way with innovation and help the world run better and improve people's lives. Stripe Bulgaria was founded in 2008 by the Dutch entrepreneur Kun van Wijk. His vision was to create solutions that exceed customer expectations. Since 2014, Stripe is part of the ICT Group in the Netherlands. ICT Group is a stock-listed company on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange and employs more than 1,000 professionals. Since 2017, I have the privilege and honor to drive Stripes forward in the role of CEO. We offer solutions to our clients in digital transformation, smart applications and infrastructure. Our mission is to build smart solutions that create business impact. We are Stripes. We're a pretty resilient species, and that's true now more than ever. So we deserve app experiences that are as resilient as we are. This starts with apps that can scale to keep pace with shifting demand, or update at a moment's notice to support entirely new business models. In a time when the app experience has become the human experience, being future ready means keeping people at the heart of innovation and flexing to meet their needs. Because technology really can change the world, but the best technology changes with it.
Мъркъл започват официално в България на 1 януари 2022 година, но двете компании, които обединява се на нашия пазар доста по-отдавна. Isobar Commerce и Liferia стартират съвместна работа като част от новата бизнес линия на Мъркъл Commerce and Experience. Аз съм част от това семейство от 13 години и заедно с много мои колеги преживяхме най-различни метаморфози на фирмата. Започнахме като малък стартъп, наречен Икомера през 2008 година. Тогава празнувахме успешен декемврийски ден на коледно пазаруване с цели 1000 онлайн поръчки за 24 часа. През 2015 година Екомера беше придобита от iSobar и стана част от бизнеса на Денцо. Това ни позволи да спечелиме нови вълнуващи клиенти и на последния черен петък през 2021 година достигнахме пикови стоености от 1000 поръчки в минута. През цялото това време сме разработили и внедрили над 400 транзакционал сайта. Работили сме с клиенти в над 60 държави и имаме онлайн магазини на 6 континента. Качеството на кода и поддръжката ни е ненадмината. Затова свидетелстват и нашите клиенти, с които работим заедно вече повече от 13 години. Днес сме мъркал и целим да поставим нови рекорди с качеството на кода, който пишем. Sunday Max Phil, one image, morning.
А, да. Как се чувам? Тест, тест. Ами, добре. Ще ви дигна още. Добре. SAP focused on making businesses run better by pushing the boundaries of innovation and impacted the world and people's lives beyond anything the founders ever imagined. With 50 years of groundbreaking work, SAP will continue to lead the way with innovation and help the world run better and improve people's lives. Trice Bulgaria was founded in 2008 by the Dutch entrepreneur Kun van Wijk. His vision was to create solutions that exceed customer expectations. Since 2014, Stripes is part of the ICT Group in the Netherlands. ICT Group is a stock-listed company on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange and employs more than 1,000 professionals. 
Since 2017, I have the privilege and honor to drive Stripes forward in the role of CEO. We offer solutions to our clients in digital transformation, smart applications, and infrastructure. Our mission is to build smart solutions that create business impact. We are Stripes. We're a pretty resilient species, and that's true now more than ever. So we deserve app experiences that are as resilient as we are. This starts with apps that can scale to keep pace with shifting demand, or update at a moment's notice to support entirely new business models. In a time when the app experience has become the human experience, being future ready means keeping people at the heart of innovation and flexing to meet their needs. Because technology really can change the world, but the best technology changes with it. Мъркъл започват официално в България на 1 януари 2022 година, но двете компании, които обединява са на нашия пазар доста по-отдавна. Isobar Commerce и Liferia стартират съвместна работа като част от новата бизнес линия на Мъркъл Commerce and Experience. Аз съм част от това семейство от 13 години и заедно с много мои колеги преживяхме най-различни метаморфози на фирмата. Започнахме като малък стартъп, наречен Икомера през 2008 година. Тогава празнувахме успешен декемврийски ден на коледно пазаруване с цели 1000 онлайн поръчки за 24 часа. През 2015 година Екомера беше придобита от Айсобар и стана част от бизнеса на Денцо. Това ни позволи да спечелиме нови вълнуващи клиенти 
И на последния черен петък през 2021 година достигнахме пикови стоености от 1000 поръчки в минута. През цялото това време сме разработили и внедрили над 400 транзакционал сайта. Работили сме с клиенти в над 60 държави и имаме онлайн магазини на 6 континента. Качеството на кода и поддръжката ни е ненадмината. Затова свидетелстват и нашите клиенти, с които работим заедно вече повече от 11 години. Днес сме мъркал и целим да поставим нови рекорди с качеството на кода, който пишем. Okay, let's continue with our next speaker, who is Viktor Hristoskov, who has over 13 years of experience in software industry. Currently, he is a de uh, software development lead and mentor mate, and today uh, he will share with us the insights of how to make mobile applications uh, accessible and inclusive. Please welcome Viktor.
Uh, now we can hear better. Uh, well, first, uh, talking about mobile accessibility, my examples today will be uh, more about the iOS uh, ecosystem because uh, I'm an iOS developer. But those, those examples are applicable for Android or um, any kind of mobile applications. And also, most of them are applicable for the web. Uh, just how we're going to achieve it uh, technically uh, varies. And uh, the, the first thing that we uh, need to know is what actually is the mobile accessibility. This is the way uh, we create our apps so they can be usable um, by more and more users. And uh, talking about this, uh, we, we are talking about people with disabilities. So we can uh, have different kinds of disabilities, like cognitive, motor, vision, or hearing. And the best practices, or the good practices, uh, that we're going to review today uh, are applicable for all of these kinds of, of, of disabilities. Um, why we need mobile accessibility. Actually, my belief is that when we know better why something is important, it's easier for us and we are more motivated to find out how actually we can achieve it. Um, and with that said, uh, we have like 6.6 uh, .6 billion smartphone users uh, in the worldwide today. Uh, but also, we have like uh, over a billion people with some kind of disabilities. And we're going to answer four why questions. Why we need to use dynamic fonts, uh, why we need to use and to be aware of what is contrast ratio and color blindness, and why is voiceover so important. So let's start with the dynamic fonts. Whip. Uh, what is the dynamic font? This is uh, an option that uh, the iOS uh, give us to change the font size. Uh, and for some people, changing the font, si the font size... Okay, I'm going to use this one because... Uh, changing the, the font size... Uh, now it's better. Uh, could mean that uh, we have uh, like a smaller font size and we can have more content on our screens. But for other users, it could be just a preference to see better with a little bit larger font size. Though, for um, some people, having a large font size is not a preference. It's like uh, the difference between being unable to use uh, the mobile phone or uh, some concrete application, or it could be a little bit more usable when we have a, big, a bigger font size. What we have uh, by default from the uh, operational system is we have like a seven uh, font sizes that we can play with. But even if we are not super happy with this, we can uh, turn on the larger accessibility sizes and then we will receive five more. And if our apps uh, do something pretty simple, we can benefit a lot of this. So how technically we can achieve this is just by two lines of code. We need to uh, select our text style, which in this case is headline, and then automatically we'll have the preferred font with its size uh, based on this dynamic size that was uh, selected from the user. And if we want to, uh, to automatically adjust our font sizes in the application, we need to set this flag to true. And these are all kind of um, textiles that we, we can choose from. And as you can see, uh, for example, the headline in the default uh, style, we have 17 points. And for the first accessibility uh, size, we have uh, 28. And all of this is like automatically uh, calculated for us. What are the good practices when we are developing our uh, applications? So if see that from the beginning that uh, some of the text sizes could grow uh, in the future, it's pretty nice to, to make them dynamic. And also we need to think about 
using scroll views from the beginning, because at some point, having bigger and bigger font size, it will make us for sure to, uh, to scroll the content. And it's far way easier to make it scrollable from the beginning than trying to refactor this uh, on the later stage. Also, we need to try to avoid truncating text. Uh, and if we have any kind of icons, we need to try to make them scalable as well. Uh, otherwise, um, it will be a bit weird. And also, if, if there is a need, we can change our layout of the UI so uh, we can present our information better. So uh, in this case, you can see these buttons with movement, stress, sleep, and nutrition, how we change the layout so they can be um, uh, easily visible. And now we already know how to change the sizes and what's the impact, but also um, there, are, there are cases in which even if we have like a bigger font size, we can still have some issues with uh, readability. And what is the contrast ratio about? In this example, on the left side, you can see 2.1 to 1, and on the right side, you can see 13.4 uh, to 1. And this is exactly the contrast ratio. So it's kind of clear that on the left side, um, the text is a bit hard to read. Uh, then on the right side, um, it's far way easier. And actually, there are uh, different kind of guidelines. One of them is like uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guideline, uh, which is the worldwide uh, guideline, and they define two standards. Actually, they have more than 70, but uh, these are two pretty uh, easy to follow. And the first one uh, is AA standard, which is about the minimum contrast, which says that we need to have 4.5 to 1 for normal text, and then 3 to 1 for uh, larger text or bold text. On the other side, we, has, uh, we had the enhanced contrast, which is AAA. And in this case, we need to have at least 7 to 1 for normal text and 4.5 to 1 for large or bold text. Another thing that we can use from the uh, operational system is the increased contrast. For some of you, uh, maybe it's slightly visible, but um, maybe not visible at all. But here on the left side, we have uh, a bit increased contrast. Um, and this actually, for the people that have some kind of issues, like visual issues, could be a huge improvement. And this also is pretty easy to, uh, to achieve. If we use the default set of uh, symbols that uh, the iOS ecosystem provides us, um, actually this contrast change is uh, happening automatically. Another option, if we need to have uh, some custom assets, uh, we can provide any uh, like PDF or SVG uh, vector format, uh, and then we can turn on the high contrast option. So in this case, we can, uh, we can set like a specific custom uh, asset for, for this case where we need to have like a higher contrast. Now we have uh, some rules to follow, but also we have different tools that will help us to audit our app. And uh, this is the Accessibility Inspector, which is a built-in tool uh, in the Xcode, which is the default uh, IDEF for developing iOS applications. And what it will uh, do for us is like throwing all kind of warnings so we can be aware what we need to improve. In this case, we have uh, selected one label, journaling strategy, uh, and the accessibility inspector tells us that uh, we have uh, contrast failed warning. So not only this, but it gives us some options how we can improve it. Another thing that uh, it could give us as a hint is about uh, do, we, uh, do we have a dynamic text font? Uh, in our screen, or maybe some of the buttons that we're using is more than needed, so it's really hard to tap. Another tool that is built in in the Accessibility Inspector is this uh, color contrast calculator, where we can play with the colors and also with the uh, 
text size, so we can uh, decide easily is it okay or not for for our application. Well, we have two things so far. We have uh, dynamic fonts and contrast ratio. But the things are getting a bit more complicated when we start to use more and more colors. And for some of you, uh, this chart could represent a red line, a uh, solid red line uh, for this week, uh, and also a solid green line uh, for the next week. But maybe for some of you, it could be like this. What we can improve in this situation is to avoid using red and green colors together, and also blue and yellow, because these are the most, two most common uh, color blindness types um, in the world. And not only this, but we can, uh, we can play a little bit more, and we can use some symbols. In this way, uh, we can make the things really more differentiable. This is uh, one of the tools that I found and I pretty like. Uh, maybe there are a lot of these. Uh, but you can play with uh, two or more colors here. And also, you can select different palettes and so forth. But uh, one pretty uh, cool option is to apply different kind of color blindness. So you can be sure that at the end, you're using uh, some uh, good colors. And not only this, but when you receive some uh, designs from your uh, design team and you're not sure is it good enough or not, maybe you can check it and uh, talk more about this. And now after these three things, uh, which are more visual, um, what happens if the people that are uh, using our app uh, are completely blind? So this uh, the voiceover is like the standard screen reader that uh, the iOS ecosystem uses. And what is the screen reader about? It allows the people to experience our interface without the need to, uh, to see it. So, to be able uh, to experience better and to understand better why the voiceover is uh, needed, I'll invite you now to close your eyes, but like sincerely, not only with the one eye, uh, and to listen carefully uh, what's next, and to try to imagine what you should be see uh, in the screen. Are you ready? Body pain, Sunday Max Phil, one image, morning, add underscore icon underscore button underscore final PNG button, n slash a, add your pain. Okay, now you can open your eyes. And maybe for some of you, it was pretty clear, uh, but maybe there are some differences. And if you, if you had a hard time to imagine something like this, maybe uh, the voiceover uh, should be uh, the thing that we need to, uh, to think more carefully about. So, some good uh, and basic, basic principles. Uh, first of all, we need to add accessibility labels to all of our components. Otherwise, as you just heard, if we have a button, for example, which has uh, any image, the voiceover will not uh, read for you, this is add button. It will read the label of the image, which could be pretty, uh, pretty weird. The next thing that we need to do is uh, to not include the element type. The voiceover is smart enough so it can infer the, uh, the element type, and if it's needed, it's gonna, it's gonna to read it. In this case, we have a button, and if we add the label like add button, it will uh, sound like add button button, which is kind of redundancy. Um, but also, this is like the better option. Now we have add button, it's clear enough. We need to uh, strive for pretty short but still understandable labels. So something like this could take really long time uh, for the user uh, to hear it and to decide what's going on and should I tap this uh, element or not. Something uh, that could be better is to avoid the redundancy but still provide a good context about what's going on. And in this way, uh, in this... Uh, in this case, we have at pain level, which kind of give us more context that we're going to 
um, at some kind of pain level. Add pain level button. Hmm, better. So, if there is a case that you need to add something additional as an information, there is another uh, property that you can use, and this is accessibility hint. Uh, what's good for it, that because the voiceover is going to read the accessibility label first, and then we'll make some polls, and then we'll, make, uh, we'll read the accessibility hint. So as a user, if I'm with closed eyes, I can pretty easily decide should I skip it or, or not. Also, the voiceover is not aware about uh, how your components are changing their state. For example, if my button is disabled, the voiceover, the voiceover will not be aware about this, and then we need to add it to the accessibility label. If we already added this pain level, this button could change to edit pain level button, and the voiceover over will be not aware of this, so we need to take care of it. Uh, and also, the, the applications that we're using today are loading tons of data. And when we see such loading indicator, if you're uh, iPhone users, it's a pretty familiar thing, and we know that something is happening and we need to wait. But as a, a voiceover user, uh, I cannot see this. So please add these accessibility labels to the animations that are meaningful so we could give uh, some opportunity of our blind or, or people with disabilities uh, that some idea uh, that something is happening. How the voiceover is working, actually. It's, it treats the components from the leading to the uh, edging for the trailing edge, which for us uh, will mean uh, left to right and top to bottom. Uh, what we can do, actually what we should avoid to do, uh, is Labels this one. Without grouping. Morning pain, evening pain, average seven, average five. So in this case, it will, will not be pretty clear which value is corresponding to which label. And seven is about the evening pain or about the morning pain. If we need, in these cases, we can use elements grouping. Labels with grouping, morning pain, average seven, evening pain, average five. And this will increase significantly the uh, scanning effi efficiency and the speed. And last of the why questions is uh, why we need this for, from the business perspective. Uh, this will engage more and more our users, not because we will engage more and better the people with disabilities, but also it will improve your user experience and UI for uh, the other part of the users. It will expand the market. Uh, of your app and your product, and also it will boost the public uh, relations and the company's publicity. And one last question that we need to answer is why it's needed from the human perspective. And um, actually, we need we think about accessibility almost every day, or maybe almost every hour. For example how we can purchase a food uh, for the dinner tonight, or how can, I bill, uh, how can I pay my bills easier so I can save uh, some time. But honestly, how often do we think about such uh, questions in the context of people with disabilities? How can a blind person pay the bills online? How can a person with limited mobility use public transport? How can a deaf person understand the news and cross the street? So, um, it was a pleasure for me to be here and to share with you these simple but still powerful practices. Um, and we have kind of a minute if you have any questions. Uh, okay, how do blind people actually interact with the, with the application? The, that's a good question. Um, actually, what's happening when you turn on the voiceover um, option, 
uh, it starts to speak, and it's a user, uh, like a gesture-based screen reader. So uh, there are a lot of gestures, but like the most simple one is to swipe left and right to move across the different elements. Mm -hmm. And also, if you need to interact with some of the elements, you uh, double tap. But also, there are components that, for example, could have some additional actions, and you can swipe with two fingers or like uh, rotate with three fingers, so there's like a whole guideline how we can use the voiceover. Okay, another question. First of all, a great lecture. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for that. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the automated scanners for uh, contrast uh, differences, and uh, I would like to ask, do you know about any scanners that give an overall mark, or at least they can give uh, suggestions for, for the groups of labels you just mentioned, or uh, any other similar scanners? Uh, but do you uh, like, are you asking about mobile or overall? Uh, I'm asking overall. But overall, uh, I'm not super, super familiar with the web tools. Uh, while I was researching about the uh, presentation, actually there are a lot of uh, solutions about the web, and there are fewer for the mobile. Uh, that's what I uh, found best for um, iOS. Uh, they had uh, something similar for Android. But also, uh, there are some paid solutions. Uh, which analyze better um, and give you like a really good report. I haven't used them, but uh, watched some like tutorials uh, or demos. Um, so I cannot recommend are they they're working good or not. But they promise that they're giving pretty good um, report at the end. Thanks. We'll give it them a try. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
SAP focused on making businesses run better by pushing the boundaries of innovation and impacted the world and people's lives beyond anything the founders ever imagined. With 50 years of groundbreaking work, SAP will continue to lead the way with innovation and help the world run better and improve people's lives. Thrice Bulgaria was founded in 2008 by the Dutch entrepreneur Kun van Weyden. His vision was to create solutions that exceed customer expectations. Since 2014, Strive is part of the ICT Group in the Netherlands. ICT Group is a stock-listed company on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange and employs more than 1,000 professionals. Since 2017, I have the privilege and honor to drive Stripes forward in the role of CEO. We offer solutions to our clients in digital transformation, smart applications, and infrastructure. Our mission is to build smart solutions that create business impact. We are Stripes. Okay, it's time to continue with our next lecture. Architecture and UX design are like two roads leading to the same destination. And this destination is a good product. That's why we invite our next lecturer, Anna Maria Christova. She is a former architect and has a few years of experience of, as an architect. And uh, now she is a UX designer in SAP and will present her great lectures about UX. So welcome. Thank you, everyone. Let's say that architecture and UX design are like two roads, each in their own area, on their own path, however, towards the same destination. But what are those roads? Are there any intersections? And what is this shared destination? Let's find out together. Let's start with exploring the common aspects between construction architecture and user experience design. It's all about the user, and I would like to emphasize on that. No product, digital or physical, will succeed if it's not focused on the user's needs. Architecture, UX design, and every design in general would be pointless to exist without their users. In that sense, we can even say that 
the user is like the main character in a movie, you know, the reason that drives the story forward. Thanks to the user's needs, desires, and requirements, design offers new products, enhances other products, and in general keeps the spark of creativity alive. However, design should be distinguished from pure art. And I would like to underline that. Both design and art are products of creativity, yes. However, art is a subject for interpretation. Everyone can see it with their own eyes, understand it in their own way. Immanuel Kant, a German philosopher, had said that art is purposeless, meaning that it, should, it doesn't need to justify its existence or it doesn't need to be valued by others. It's art, it's simply there, and it tends to provoke some kind of emotion within you. And sometimes, even no emotion is some sort of an impact. Design, on the other hand, however, has purpose and has goal to fulfill. And it does so by communicating clear messages with the user. Design doesn't leave much space for interpretation and it shouldn't. Imagine yourself in this situation. You want to push a door in order to open it, but instead you need to pull it. I guess such situation would make you frustrated, you wave by with a hand, continue on, but in the end, deeply inside of you, you would wish that this door was designed better. Yes, we often talk about good and bad design, but there is no good and bad art. As I said, it's an object for interpretation. Good design, unfortunately, is often invisible, However, when we see something that we don't like somewhere, that's a whole other story. Because in the end, design provides the users a product. And we, as users, set the measure for that product. And speaking of products, let's take a look at the basic elements of two products, on the architectural side and the user experience side. So, on the architectural side, we can get a chair, a simple yet very important basic component of an architectural environment. After all, we use it in our daily lives. And on UX design side, let's take a button. Yet again, simple element, however, very important because without it, we wouldn't be able to make most of our interactions I mean, come on, we can't all remember the keyboard shortcuts, can we? So, these two basic elements can be combined together with similar ones. Like, two chairs and a table can create a nice sitting area, and a button can be a part of a bigger control, such as filter bar, for instance. Building our picture further, we can say that this simple sitting area can be a part of a nice living room, as well as the filter bar can be of great use in some web page, for instance. I hope you see the analogy here clearly. Although these components may differ in their core meaning, they're meant to, to be used in a similar manner. They help us fill a space with content. We talked about these components, yes, but their combination and their arrangement is actually what a layout is. Layouts in architecture determine the spaces, dimensions, and in general, the organization of internal building objects. On the other hand, layouts in UX design actually support the structure of the user interface elements. You can see that the term is used in both areas, and that's not a coincidence. 
layouts display these basic components that we just talked about, not only each one of them, but also the organization between them. But most of all, layouts represent information, no matter if it's physical or digital. But what about the connection between those group of elements? Think for a second. Why do we move from one place to another? We, te we tend to move from room to room, depending on what we need to do or what we need to get. And it's the same in, ap in applications too. We navigate from one page to another, depending on what information we need to access and what interaction we need to do. Imagine yourself in this situation. You are going home after some long grocery shopping, so you carry many bags with yourself, like two in each hand. You get home, and where would be the first place that you leave those bags? I guess it won't be the bedroom, because this room doesn't bring the function that you need right now. Probably most of you will either leave the bags in the hallway or get them to the kitchen. But yeah, who knows? Someone else can have a different idea. I'll be happy to hear it later. But imagine that you want to leave those bags in the kitchen and you can't find it. And it's not where it's supposed to be. On the contrary, the kitchen can be accessed only through the bathroom. Huh? Weird. Unfortunately, such frustrating situations often have happen in the digital medium. I guess most of you have been in a situation where you want to find the login page, you look in the toolbar, it's not there, you look in some other menu whatsoever, nowhere to be found. This frustrates the user. And unfortunately, this happens when some navigational patterns have been broken. These patterns have been established after years of research and exploration. And there are reasons why some elements and group of elements should be combined and connected together and others not. And one of those reasons is the purpose and function. Purpose and functionality are crucial characteristics for all types of products. They give them a goal to fulfill. In architecture, purpose should be defined long prior the initial ideation phase. Each type of a building, no matter if it's a house, factory, or even a church, has its corresponding requirements, which are based on the purpose that this, that this building needs to fulfill in the end. And it's the same in applications too. But think for a second. Imagine that your bedroom is with the size of this huge hall. I mean, enormous area, and in the middle of it, your bed. I guess you wouldn't be feeling that comfortable sleeping in such large space. And that's why actually most of the standard bedrooms are not with such area size. But exactly area sizes, dimensions, proportions, and even interior elements are one of the key factors that help us experience the architectural environment. It's the same in applications too. Depending on the content and context, we can use different elements in order to achieve the desired user experience that we want the users to have. Sometimes, you may want to have some fun, you know, watching amusing videos online, while other times you may want to feel secured and assured of every step of a bank transaction process. Purpose and functionality places us in a situation from which we can draw conclusions, inspiration, and as designers explore what the desired impact we want to achieve on the user. And actually, sometimes the user has a way to leave their own mark on this impact. And does so 
with the personalization. I guess that probably you have thought how a simple room can have different designs, different ways of furnishing. I mean, I guess we have all experienced this when we have made renovations at home. Architecture in that case offers more freedom because it just gives you a blank space to, to play around with. However, user experience design also offers such option in some limitations, yes, but some applications allow the user to change a the theme, color or font, you know, just something. Personalization is not something necessary to have, but I still think it's a good option for the user because it allows them to bring something from themselves inside of the product. So in the end, the product is not only created for the user, but also created by them, even just a little bit. And so, step by step, we have managed to reach our destination. But what is it? Well, this brings us back long, long time ago, at the age of the Roman Empire, over 2,000 years ago. Back then, there was a man who worked alongside Julius Caesar's best engineers. His name was Vitruvius, and he wrote one of the best works of its time, the Ten Books of Architecture. Those books were written as a guide for building projects, planning cities, structures, buildings, even exploring construction materials. These books also explored the human proportion, you know, the main user. And later, these human proportions actually inspired the Renaissance artists. Most importantly, in these 10 books, Vitruvius describes the three key features which architectural objects should have. Strength, usability, and beauty. Of course, architecture should be strong, meaning that it should be stable and durable. It should be useful, corresponding to the user's needs and requirements and successfully serve its purpose. And third, it should be beautiful, meaning that it should be connected to the aesthetics of, the, of its environment, <clears throat> environment and the context. But also, beauty refers to the level of detail and craftsmanship. Probably back then, Vitruvius didn't expect that these three simple words would also describe the features of a good product. No matter if it's physical or digital, any product. However, nowadays I believe that one more feature should be added to this Vitruvius triad. A product should also be sustainable. No matter the type of product, if it's physical or digital, it should incorporate the thought for future. Sustainable doesn't only mean being recyclable. It means that the design process should not stop once the product is produced and the user interacts satisfied with it. Designers should also think for the moment after the usage when the product is no longer needed. By applying those four pillars of good design, so far we have managed to create great products. And right now I believe it's time to continue this work on, improve further and probably bring it to the next level. I want you to think of architecture and UX design as two roads leading to the same destination. It's true that one tends to exist in the physical and the other is for the digital medium. The building method, materials, and even components may differ. However, in the end, all products, no matter the type, should be strong, useful, beautiful, and sustainable. 
by exploring similarities between different areas, we can get on board with unfamiliar tasks easily. We can draw inspiration and we can be open to explore unconventional trails. I want you to remember one thing. Similarities can be found in different areas. Areas that at first glance might seem disconnected from your own. However, architecture and UX design are just one example. We are all explorers. And I am truly curious what comes next. What you will discover. I'm happy that you joined me through this journey of the parallels between architecture and UX design. It was a pleasure being here with you today. Any questions? Okay. Uh, thank you. So, maybe just wanted to ask if you can elaborate on the specific uh, user, because, as you say, uh, building is uh, created for the person using it, but there's a very big difference between a specialized user and a generic user. So, let's say a house used, is used by everybody, but a factory is used by specific users. And so, the same is true for software. We have general purpose software, so, for example, Netflix, YouTube, whatever, that's used by a general public. And then there is uh, specialized software, uh, by the way, something that SAP is mostly doing, <laughs> uh, where you have uh, a person who has to input uh, a number of documents each day, and for them, performance in this input is more important than the beauty. While for other users, the beauty is more important. So that's maybe something very interesting if you could <laughs> yeah. Yeah. give your opinion. Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, as you mentioned, uh, user experience design sometimes focus on generic users and sometimes on specific users. It's the same in architecture. I mean, if you want to create like a huge a building of apartments, you can't ask each family what do they want in their apartment. You make something that is sort of unified for them all. But when someone comes to you and say, okay, I want you to design my dream home, you focus on this, this user in particular. So I would say that in, in this sense, uh, SAP is sort of designing the dream <laughs> product of the specific users for, for their current needs, but not, not overall. So yeah. Uh, the approach depends on what you want to have in the end as a product, something that suits for most of the people or something that you really want to do for a single family. Okay, another question? No? Thank you. Thank you. We're a pretty resilient species, and that's true now more than ever. So we deserve app experiences that are as resilient as we are. This starts with apps that can scale to keep pace with shifting demand, or update at a moment's notice to support entirely new business models. In a time when the app experience has become the human experience, 
Being future ready means keeping people at the heart of innovation and flexing to meet their needs. Because technology really can change the world, but the best technology changes with it. Мъркъл започват официално в България на 1 януари 2022 година, но двете компании, които обединява се на нашия пазар доста по-отдавна. Isobar Commerce и Liferia стартират съвместна работа като част от новата бизнес линия на Мъркъл Commerce and Experience. Аз съм част от това семейство от 13 години и заедно с много мои колеги преживяхме най-различни метаморфози на фирмата. Започнахме като едно, малък стартъп, наречени Комера през 2008 година. Тогава празнувахме успешен декемврийски ден на коледа проба, за Руле проба, с едно, цели проба, хиляда едно, две, проба. за 24 часа. През 2015 година Екомера беше придобита от Айсобар и стана част от бизнеса на Денцо. Това ни позволи да спечелиме нови вълнуващи клиенти и на последния черен петък през 2021 година достигнахме пикови стоености от 1000 поръчки в минута. През цялото това време сме разработили и внедрили над 400 транзакционал сайта. Работили сме с клиенти в над 60 държави и имаме онлайн магазини на 6 континента. Качеството на кода и поддръжката ни е ненадмината. Затова свидетелстват и нашите клиенти, с които работим заедно вече повече от 13 години. Днес сме Мъркъл и целим да поставим нови рекорди с качеството на кода, който пишем. Може да опитате презентацията. Окей. Okay.
Okay, it's time for our next speakers, uh, who are development architect at SAP Labs, Georgi uh, Wozif and Radoslav Tomov. Both of them uh, will present us the uh, SPIFE and SPIRE product without no secret, so please applaud them. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Georgi, and today with Rado, we will try to show you how you can get rid of your application secrets and make yourself proud to friends and family, especially if they are in IT. For the purposes of that, we will use the following agenda. We will start by defining the secret zero problem. Then we will go over a plausible solution in the face of Spiffy and Spire. And last but not least, Rado will give us a practical example of how this technology can be put into practice in the real world scenario. Or in other words, what we are trying to do today is to show how you can actually delegate the responsibilities of your applications, services, and, and systems uh, of having, having to deal with the complexity of managing secrets, uh, sensitive data like usernames, passwords, uh, cryptographic keys, and everything uh, yeah, else. OK, let's get going. Let's start with the problem definition. For the purposes of that, I will have to return you some good uh, 10, 15 years back in time when I started my career in IT. Back in the days, we used to have a few servers under our responsibilities. They were safely communicating over HTTP uh, without any sort of uh, authentication. They were using and sharing a private network. And basically, they were happily delivering the end user functionality to our users. We just tend to open a few ports to the outside world in case some access was needed. And then we tend to take care of protecting it with certain means. At the end of the day, those servers were sitting just behind my back. And I can physically ensure their security and can physically ensure that they are running within this perimeter and no one is stealing data from them. Fast forward today, the situation has drastically changed. Nowadays, our applications are running ad against or on different heterogeneous environments, like my database is located and is using the best of breed uh, persistency layer from AWS. My PubSub is from GCP because they are offering the most cost effective solution to get the job done. We have a number of additional clients nowadays. IoT applications, as we heard on different presentations, mobile devices. We can't anymore trust this mess, <laughs> basically. We can't be sure that the server that is communicating with my application is the one that it says it is. Nowadays, it's hard to throw these boundaries and to draw this perimeter around our applications because they are spread and there are different microservices and systems running all around the place. OK, and so far, so good. We have this problem. What is the most common solution that we see today to actually securely introduce one system to the other? Well, the most common solution to these problems are the so-called secrets. Basically, these are usernames, password, credentials, service accounts, you name it. You know all sorts of sensitive information that is pre-shared with a certain system and that this system can use to actually prove to another system that it is the one that it says it is. What is a challenge with, with those secrets? Well, basically, first of all, we invent them and we create them to enable certain access control. The same way like I have a username and password and I use it to authenticate to some uh, provider. OK, we created this secret. However, since I mentioned it's a sensitive information, we want to protect it. So the next thing that we do, we invent some form of encryption and we encrypt this secret to protect it because it's sensitive. I can't hold it in my source code repository or directly baked into my container image. And then, fundamentally, what I do is I create another secret, which is the decryption key used to actually decrypt the very original secret that I wanted to create. OK, what I do with this decryption key, because basically it's 
also very important. Well, I store it somewhere securely, like, for example, in the HashiCorp vault as a secret repository. But then what I need to do is actually own yet another secret to be able to get and retrieve the very first one that I had to use, or de facto the decryption key of the very first one. And I think you follow the pattern. Basically, it's turtles all the way down. What we do is we invent secrets to actually protect the very first secret that our application needed. OK, that's good, or that's what we can see today. But this is not the only burden and challenge that we need to face. There are multiple a a questions that we need to answer. Even if we invent this secret, basically we need to securely distribute it to our applications and our uh, environments. We also need to rotate that secret. Also, I don't have to wake up half of my team in case we suspect some security breach and we need to rotate this precious credential zero. And technically, or ideally, uh, the rotation should not involve human interaction and also it should not cause downtime because I don't want to make my users frustrated just because behind the scenes I'm rotating some technical uh, information or technical data which is necessary for my service to operate. And even if I decide to trust and to put my trust in a container orchestration platform like Kubernetes, and I basically trust the resources which are called secrets there, that doesn't actually mean that they are treated as sensitive information. They are just yet another byte array which is distributed over the network and stored somewhere in plain text in some file and in some storage which easily can be obtained by someone either intentionally or, uh, yeah, unintentionally. Okay, so far so good. We defined the problem. What is the solution to, to this problem? Well, the Cloud Native Foundation, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the same foundation that hosts Kubernetes, uh, has two projects which exactly aim to solve this challenge. Uh, the first project is called Spiffy. This is the specification. The second project, the reference implementation, is called Spire, and Spire tries to put uh, the concepts and, and the documentation in an actual running software that you can place in your environment, and you can leverage the benefits from Spiffy. Okay, now we'll go a little bit more over the theory uh, behind Spiffy and Spire and how they solve this challenge, so we later can follow the example from Rado in, with better understanding. I'll start with the definition, and if we have to describe it with one sentence, that would be it. Basically, Spiffy gives us a way uh, and gives us uh, short-lived identity documents, and it does that via a simple API. Let's try to depict and break apart this sentence so you understand what we mean by it. The first key word of this sentence are the so-called identity documents. And if we draw the parallel with the physical world that we live, basically you can see that in the real world I have a, my passport. I use it to travel, to go to the bank and, and do some things. And then the, the authorities can know that, yes, this is the passport belonging to Georgi. Spiffy tries to define a digital passport for our systems. You can see it like that in a simplified manner. The second key word and the, sec and the example that you can see here, Spiffy doesn't try to reinvent the wheel. As we saw already in the talk from Stefan, uh, basic basically JWT or JWT tokens are one format that Spiffy supports, so they don't try to come up with their own thing. They try to trust on industry standards for cryptography. The second standard that you can see here, an example, probably for some of the security folks, uh, is, is kind of popular, the X509 certificates. And what you can see in the certificate itself, you can see the validity. Like also we mentioned that if we reduce the time that the identity document is valid, we just decrease the attack surface and the attack vector that potentially someone yeah, running away with that certificate will have access to our system for 10 years or, or so. Uh, and the last but not least, which is another concept uh, from Spiffy, is the so-called Spiffy ID, which is a string, a simple identifier that actually baked into the certificate can be used from authorization systems and can be used to apply a certain access control policies as after uh, the, the system is being authenticated. Okay, 
the last concept from Spiffy, the simple a API from this single sentence definition. This in Spiffy terms is called workload or workload API. I will use today the terms uh, application, service, and to a certain degree system interchangeably, and they all can map also to a, to a workload. The workload is the process that actually needs this precious credential zero. You can see it as my business application or as my uh, layer that needs to communicate with the database. Uh, basically, the workload has one responsibility. It starts and it asks the workload API, hey, workload API, give me my credential. That, important to mention, happens without the pre-shared uh, secret. So we break this vicious cycle of secrets all the way down. And basically, this workload API can solve us this problem. And here you can see the two formats that can be returned to the workload. Today, we'll use the X509 certificate as during the next examples, but easily can be, uh, yeah, it's abstracted in such a way that JWT tokens can also be leveraged. OK, now we have the theory in practice. Let's see the environment and let's see the software that actually implements this specification. And here we will start from the bottom up. So we will start from the perspective of the workload, which is the user of this whole Spiffy Inspire magic. This is our application, service, process. Yeah. So the workload starts and asks, hey, Spire agent, the first component of Spire, give me identity document. The Spire agent doesn't just blindly trust this workload. It performs uh, a process. It performs a verification that actually verifies the, that indeed this workload is the one that it says it is. And it does that by communicating with the second component of the SPAR, the so-called SPAR server. This is the brain of the system. This is the control plane that actually holds the cryptographic key material to be able to sign identity documents and verify them. And it also contains additional metadata and information, which are the agents that uh, belong to this server and which are the workloads that actually needs to communicate or can communicate with this agent. Let, and if we need to map that to a popular runtime like Kubernetes, typically our pods run, uh, our workloads run as pods. Uh, the, the Spire agent run as a daemon set on every single node or VM of our cluster. And the Spire server can run in the same cluster or can be collocated in a different one for cost reasons, for operational reasons, yeah, depending on how you want to run that. OK, so far, so good. We saw a bunch of boxes, lines, and things. Uh, but we didn't actually see how the magic happened. Well, we will need one last term from Spiffy and Spire so we can answer that. And this term is called attestation. You remember that I mentioned the agent and also the server do a verification, then do certain assertions to actually know and just don't trust but verify that the workload is the one that it says it is. And this, in the Spiffy and Spire terms, is called attestation. And the first level that the attestation happens is the so-called node attestation. It happens between the Spire agent, the one component of Spire, and the Spire server. For the purposes of the example, we will use GCP as infrastructure provider to illustrate how it works with it. But Spire provides a pluggable mechanism. So here you can plug AWS. You you can plug a bare metal. You can plug even your own custom implementation without any sort of uh, yeah, challenges. OK, the whole process starts with step number one. So this is the agent starting and obtaining the instance identity token from the internal GCP metadata API. This token actually is something that is uniquely issued by Google to every single virtual machine that they own and that they uh, have running in their data centers. And the Spire agent sends that over TLS to the Spire server. That's the first and second step. OK, the server doesn't trust, verifies, uh, a common theme that you hear. The <laughs> server checks that indeed this token is signed by the keys from Google verifies that cryptographically. In addition to that, it checks, OK, this is an agent running in a GCP project that I know. It also has a sec certain security group, maybe service account associated with, uh, with the VM. And only if all the attestation parameters match, then the Spire server returns back in step number four a list of identity documents that the agent can use. OK, 
That's the node attestation. The same pattern, pretty much, but it's called the workload attestation. Happens again, but not between two VM, or two virtual machines or two nodes running uh, somewhere, but actually within the same physical host, between the process that is running in a given virtual machine or server and the, the, the server itself. The Spire agent, as you remember, runs on the host and it runs with certain privileges. It knows, for example, how to communicate uh, with the Linux kernel or the kubelet in case the pod is running in a Kubernetes as an environment. And whenever the workload starts, it basically sends an empty request to the agent and says, hey, agent, give me my identity. The agent makes a verification. It talks with the kubelet in the Kubernetes, verifies that a certain namespace, service account, and image are there. And if this attestation passes, on step number three, we successfully have our precious credential zero, and then our workload can, can use it to communicate with other workloads, to communicate with databases, to communicate with whatever. And OK, without further ado, after this theory, Radu will give us an example of how it can work in practice. Thank you, Jerome. Uh, for the architecture, of course, <laughs> uh, and also for the technical details. I'll try to break it down a little bit for uh, all of you. And for that, I've picked my favorite use case, which is uh, one that I guess everyone here at certain point in time uh, has had to deal with. This is a service-to-service -service communication, and usually we do it over a mutual TOS uh, if uh, we would like to be secure. Um, Stefan told us about JOT tokens and how to deal with client-server in the previous session, but uh, here we will focus a bit more on uh, how uh, we can uh, achieve the mutual TOS with the technology that we have. I will show you a simple example before that uh, without this technology and try to draw a parallel to see what's the benefits. Let's assume we have two simple clusters. Uh, Kubernetes, we have two services A and B. For those that are not uh, accustomed to mutual TOS and don't know how it works, basically we have to create a uh, public-private key pair, then we go through a, a certificate signing request, and we interact with uh, a so-called public key infrastructure uh, to be able to generate the certificates uh, themselves. Uh, not all certificates are made equal. It's a bit complex topic, so I won't dive uh, into it too much because uh, there are a lot of sol solutions as a service, and you can do the path um, using a sales sign one, but it's a complex topic. The common part is that once you get the certificates, you need to uh, provision those certificates to your software. Usually that means you will store these certificates somewhere in an intermediate location. Maybe humans will be um, involved in the process. And in many cases, no one wants to do it manually. No, it's tedious process and it's error prone. Someone can leak uh, stuff. And we also need to keep in mind the rotation part and the expiration of the certificate. So not rocket science, but again, there are things that we need to be careful of. Usually people will yeah, stick a bunch of uh, um, Jenkins jobs somewhere or some other CI, CD tool to automate as much as possible as this process. For example, uh, if we say uh, we are using Kubernetes, the one thing that I would do immediately if I have a very simple setup is I'm going to use uh, GitHub and Vault. I will go to follow the um, uh, standard GitOps process and have all my uh, application definition and service definition as, as code. I would like to store it in GitHub and also have some system like Argo CD, for example, that monitors the changes for these repositories and applies the lifecycle management operations like redeployments, configuration changes, and so on to the cluster itself. And ideally, I would like Argo to go pick um, the secrets that I need, whether they are um, um, credentials, where there are certificates, whatever, doesn't matter, to pick them up, create uh, here the um, uh, manifests and deploy the service. 
This is nice, but unfortunately has few uh, drawbacks, and this is uh, mainly the fact that uh, we, we are tying the lifecycle management uh, of a credential with the lifecycle uh, of the um, uh, service itself. So we always have to go to our delivery pipeline basically to change our credentials. Then we will also need to do some magic here uh, in order to change the credentials accordingly, to regenerate the certificate and put them. There are some um, plugins for uh, Vault that can uh, help out here, but it's a tedious process and we need to uh, take care about it. Um, also, from security standpoint, it's not ideal because certificates are stored in a multiple location. We have it in Vault, which is secure, but what about our CICD system? Who has access to it and what happens there? And also to the cluster, but either way, we need to be there. If we adopt Spire, for example, the landscape of our two services in our uh, example will look like uh, I'm over, I have oversimplified here, of course, because a lot of stuff to deploy, but basically we have a Spire server. In each cluster, we have the dedicated agent that Georgi mentioned. Uh, they are deployed there without credentials, and they are being attested through the node attestation process here. The server has called the underlying Kubernetes cluster, maybe the GCP uh, APIs like metadata service for AWS, the corresponding thing, and has figured out that basically these PyRanger are OK and they're verified. For, mo for my two services to be able to communicate, I need to go to the Spire server and say, I would like to define the metadata for two services that need identity. I will define them, for example, uh, with a GCP account that they're they are going to run in with def uh, details about um, the Kubernetes cluster, maybe VM labels and stuff like that, security group. Uh, also, I will say, for example, uh, the service account, the namespace, the pod image, maybe the shot checksum of the image that is actually represent the service and it's going to run. And then, in runtime, when, I'm the, uh, when the solution is deployed, basically, service A can, can reach out to the Spire agent, as well, as well as service B, and it will go through the process of attestation. They will be verified, and they will be given a digital document. Uh, fortunately for us, this uh, document is actually X509 certificate, so we can basically directly use it to establish the mutual TOS connection. So and let me yeah, try to mention a little bit more about how we adopt this, because the service needs to communicate with the, uh, with the Spire Agent API. Usually we have two options. Uh, one uh, on the right-hand side here would be to go the native way. The agent has gRPC API, so you can generate a client and you can put it inside your application or service. And um, this will be a very efficient way to deal with it. Uh, and on the other hand side, if you're lazy like I usually do, you end up with uh, employing a sidecar, basically a proxy is deployed next to the service. Uh, uh, and also this proxy, for example, when it's Envoy, it has direct uh, native communication with the Spire agent. It can facilitate the um, fetching of the identities for the appropriate uh, pod, and also uh, can do the rotation. It can, you can configure the Envoy proxy to do TOS origination and TOS termination. So basically, the both services will, will, will have uh, totally a transparent communication. They will be unaware that their traffic is routed through a mutual TOS connection, which is a cool approach, uh, uh, more or less, but it has its drawbacks because it uh, consumes more resources, adds addition, uh, additional latency to the system. It, it depends in, on the use case. So if we have to uh, try draw the parallel and think uh, what we have gained by uh, adding Spire, first, uh, it's uh, on the security side, we have moved from uh, credentials, which are uh, taken, uh, which are stored in multiple locations and then are deployed through a deployment pipeline, to a solution where um, credentials are being injected in runtime. There are no third-party systems involved. There are no secrets uh, need to bootstrap this communication. Uh, credentials, like the X509, is stored in memory. Here we have the flexibility of having these uh, certificates automatically rotated by Spire. 
and then we can move from something like uh, um, very long lift certificates like we usually have in our um, standard setups when we use Jenkins and we have to facilitate everything ourselves to uh, environment where we can, uh, we can rotate certificates every few minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and so on. Um, yeah, and with that, I think I've bombarded you with a lot of uh, technology so far, but uh, there are a few things that I would like you to remember for this talk, uh, from this talk and take it with you. First, security is a journey. Check out the Zero Trust architecture. There's a nice paper uh, in the public internet. You need to start thinking about security in a holistic manner. It's not about your application being secure and having all the CVSS ratings and scores under 7.5 or something like that. We, we need to think about the processes, whether humans are ac actually interacting and how they're interacting with our solution. Secondly, don't reinvent the wheel. This is what we all do occasionally. But there are industry standards and tools and processes that are emerging out there. For example, Spiffy and Spire. Georgi and I, we have been playing with them and exploring the capabilities of the software for the past year, trying to bring into the SAP's uh, business technology platform to power a little bit the uh, lower foundational layers. So from experience, we can say that the community is growing there. And also, um, it is mature enough to be used in production environments. The applications of this technology is not only limited to stuff like mutual TLS uh, and having JOT tokens, you can build on top authorization uh, concepts and you can also exchange this token with, uh, and documents with external systems in order to get credentials, to interact with maybe cloud provider uh, APIs and get uh, uh, tokens from that or um, which gives um, tremendous flexibility. So check it out and play with it a little bit. Um, if you're wondering, is it for you? We have seen that we have not traded complexity. We could actually introduce more complexity. This is the reality of a distributed software. If you have a uh, few services, then it will be um, totally overkill for you. If you have, like in your company, a team dedicated that deals with infrastructure and produces tooling that other people do, uh, use in order to, to focus on um, developing applications, then you can definitely um, uh, inter um, introduce this technology and we will see TCO improvement and also uh, st uh, make it, making the whole process secure. And with that, yeah, I would like to thank you for your attention. I know we'll Yeah, if you have questions, now is a good time. Or you can find us in the speaker's corner or around the hall. So. Questions? Okay. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, so if I understand correctly, um, you've been playing around for, for a year. You're saying that the technology is uh, ready for production. and. Uh, how do you expect maybe the migration journey to look like from uh, existing solutions to these problems, maybe like uh, sealed secrets or HashiCorp vote? Like how do we uh, not create a m more complex system and uh, some security problems on the way to, to this perfect solution? It is not a bullet, uh, silver bullet that will solve your, all your problems. Uh, you mentioned sealed secrets. It happens that we are actually using sealed secrets in order to deal with these type of issues in, the, in, uh, in our deployment of Spire because we want to avoid the chicken and egg problem, basically. But to, uh, to address your, um, your concerns, I think it, it will be like gradual uh, migration. I don't expect people to go change their coding. It depends on the use case. We will try to put it out there, potentially, um, provide some guidance, like if you have older applications, try out, uh, uh, for example, the sidecar approach. If you're building something new, maybe consider it. Maybe run um, uh, tests, you know, try it out. 
uh, code deploy it and see how it goes like in on your staging and maybe if you ha if you have non production but test systems where you have enough load to get a f get a figure of how um, uh, significant the impact will be yeah it's a good place to evaluate but we're also struggling with that and just to add a few cents so you know SAP also over the years accumulated some software so it's hard definitely step by step start small start with some maybe new applications that are developed learn incorporate the feedback the approach with the proxy with the sidecar and meshes as they are yeah, de facto applying the pattern of the sidecar with a control plane on top they are also a good way to actually decouple from the business logic and in case let's say you can't touch certain application, you can still intercept the traffic and make the communication secure. So there are ways, but yeah, just need to start somewhere. Otherwise, just, it, yeah, car, it's a mess. And thank you for pre your presentation. Uh, what are the disadvantages? I think you briefly mentioned it, but with every system, there are <laughs> advantages and disadvantages. Maybe I can start this time. Okay. So, as Radu mentioned, I, I mean, complexity is not gone. It's just shifted. And you start thinking about it in a more structured way. And as every new thing and innovation, it takes time until things are set out. So, first challenge is how you run this PAR server, how you ensure that it's secured, how you ensure that it's protected, because it starts to be a fundamental thing that if someone compromised, then basically everything is game over. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's one, one aspect of it. Uh, yeah, as I guess that would be at least for me. Yeah, on a high level, the, the, these are the major concerns. On a very low technology level, if when you start actually deploying it, the software is relatively simple to, to automate and deploy. It's not like you're running Kistior, for example, where you cry, uh, but, <laughs> but um, still there are some quirks. Um, it has a plugin archi uh, architecture that you can build your stuff inside, but there are always maybe something missing. We've heard uh, previously a speaker talking about the uh, pave road of pave path. If you are there, uh, Spiffy and Spire seem to be okay, but if you start dealing with very complex heterogeneous systems where you don't have only Cloud Foundry or, for example, Kubernetes, but you add stuff on premise, then challenges start to arise. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. So the question was concerns with availability. Yes, and fundamentally, Spiffy and Spire also kind of thought about that. One way of handling it is the Spire agent has a local cache. So it doesn't every time the workload starts goes to the server, so it creates a synchronous dependency. But actually, whenever an agent starts, it pre-caches the workload certificate, so it can serve them between the same machine. Yes, to a certain degree, that's true. Also, the validity, as you saw, I mean, you have a certificate typically valid for five, seven days, so you have a tolerance of the server being unavailable for some time until the certificate expires. Of course, this affects if you roll out a new deployment and you now need to start all the workloads because you patch something and then the server is down. Yeah, may, your pipeline might be a bit uh, yeah, affected with that, but the Spire server on its own, it also scales horizontally. Uh, so you can scale it, you can distribute it, uh, you can have a good uh, persistency. Mm, so you can take care about it of being uh, yeah, important and also spl split it or separate it around the world to actually limit in case GCP is down to have one deployed on Azure if you want to yeah, be a cloud. Yeah, it, it, it supports some kind of a hierarchic hierarch hierarchy of deployments, basically, where you can leverage the intermediate certificate. So basically, you, have, you can have dedicated yeah, Spire server for each region and yeah, tolerate failures. OK, thank you. Thank you. Too. Merci.
Ciao. Ciao. SAP focused on making businesses run better by pushing the boundaries of innovation and impacted the world and people's lives beyond anything the founders ever imagined. With 50 years of groundbreaking work, SAP will continue to lead the way with innovation and help the world run better and improve people's lives.
Strijs Bulgaria was founded in 2008 by the Dutch entrepreneur Koen van Weid. His vision was to create solutions that exceed customer expectations. Since 2014, Strijs is part of the ICT Group in the Netherlands. ICT Group is a stock-listed company on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange and employs more than 1,000 professionals. Since 2017, I have the privilege and honor to drive Stripes forward in the role of CEO. We offer solutions to our clients in digital transformation, smart applications and infrastructure. Our mission is to build smart solutions that create business impact. We are Stripes. pretty resilient species, and that's true now more than ever. So we deserve app experiences that are as resilient as we are. This starts with apps that can scale to Hi everyone, time flies, you know, it's time for us to announce our last speaker, um, our uh, keynote speaker. His name is Vasily Nornudov. He is director of the Advanced uh, Development Center at VMware. His focus is actually to bridge the gap a little bit between the technology and science. He's here today to tell us how to get with the times. Please welcome Vesco. All right. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me, and um, thank you for staying. Now, I, yeah, I go by Vesco. I do lead the Advanced Development Center at VMware. And um, that means my day job is to, you know, work with amazing people, get disruptive tech, and try to de-risk it so that it goes into the business lines. But now, my good friends and colleagues at ISTA, organizational uh, committee, they came and said, all right, um, you do interesting stuff, right? Can you do a keynote? And that was my reaction. And pretty much the hair is kind of like that. <laughs> if you're as old as I am in this industry, the, you know this guy, Doc Emmett Brown. Crazy stuff, right? But, but they're like, okay, what do I talk about? And they're like, don't worry, this is the closing keynote. This is just between, you're going to be the last thing between a day of interesting stuff and the cocktail. So no one's <laughs> going to pay attention, don't worry about it. <laughs> right, but still, after two years of staying off stage, I said, all right, what, what can we do? And um, thinking of Doc Emmett Brown, I was thinking, hey, it's kind of like a back to the future moment for me because I was on this stage 
um, in 2016. And in 2016, I had a talk about polyglot developers, right? So back then, we talked about different languages, ways to um, what to learn, what to handle. We t spent most of the time talking about two important topics. One was ransomware. The other one was blockchain, smart contracts. And mind you, that was 2016, so for better or worse, I think it's mostly worse. The predictions came true. I guess both of these topics are very relevant right now. So in preparing this talk, I wanted to say, uh, think about what is going to be useful for you. And maybe we can get back here in a couple of years and see whether this panned out, right? So if you pay no attention whatsoever from now on until the end of the talk, which is fine, remember two things. I want to take you on a brief journey through two topics. One of them is going to be AI and machine learning. And um, my claim there is going to be that actually some real progress is made, and you should care. And we're going to talk about perhaps some areas you should care about that may not be the most obvious ones when we uh, say AI and ML. The second one, the second one is going to be good old systems engineering. I'm talking about languages, compilers, architectures. And in particular, I'm going to talk about something we call WASM. A lot of you probably know it, but I'm going to touch base on WebAssembly. So with that, let's dive in. <sighs> Obligatory disclaimer, this is a keynote. I love doing talks. I love doing hard ones with data and uh, performance stats and all of that. This is not it. These are opinions. They're my opinions. I tend to be wrong about stuff, so keep that in mind. Still, I claim AI ML is eating the world. And uh, if this is familiar to you, it's because Mark Anderson from the VC firm, Anderson Horowitz, said it's circa 2011. Um, his quote was, software is eating the world, and the claim was that software is getting into so many of the domains, be it healthcare, uh, autonomous driving, or something like that, that everything is going to be disrupted and changed by software that we are building. Okay. I'm playing a twist on that and claiming that AIML is eating the world. So, <laughs> to tell you the truth, I was usually reacting like this guy would on the, the picture, eye-rolling. The reason why I would eye-roll like that is because, well, we have this internal innovation conference. I used to be chair of it a um, couple of years in, in, um, in a row. And, you know, circa 2017, AI and ML were at the high of the hype curve. If you've never seen one of these before, that's the Gartner's hype curve until you get to the plateau of productivity where we all want to be, you have to go through all of that. And at that time, it was up there. Every second paper, uh, that's sort of between academic and industry papers, was about machine learning. A lot of it was statistics, hidden like machine learning, but doesn't matter. So I was a little bit skeptical. Let's try to use this everywhere. But then, in preparing for this stuff, I was, I said, okay, how do I demonstrate the immediate value of machine learning in our lives to grab your attention? And you, you know what? The previous slide, that was a stock photo. I just found it on the internet. I hate using stock photos. Don't do that in your presentations. You could even see the water, the water markings. And um, I was like, okay, I've never used that. Can I do something better? And I could. I actually went in, ran the stable diffusion model. Uh, stable diffusion is, we're going to talk a little about, about open AI, but it's one of the open AI-based models that can draw based on a prompt. So I gave it a prompt, watercolor, Sophia, impressionist, and best of a subreddit. It tends to work good for the model because of um, the way it has been trained with other images. And it produced this. And I think it's pretty nice. 
This picture is going to be free of copyright, free of any licenses. I could use it in my presentation instead of an ugly stock photo, and it's unique. It was generated for me. And now, you know, I started playing with it, and um, it's, it's doing pretty good. And by the way, I tried to do a small tweak. I added to the prompt watercolor Sofia pavement impressionist in Best of Watercolor. And if you live um, in the city, you might get the joke. It actually, the pavement that, that it produces is pretty good, I would say. But the machine prompted me that, look, this is taking longer than expected. So if normally it would take 30 seconds, this one took three minutes. And I was like, yes, yes, I know it's taking longer than expected. So another one of, of uh, pavement jokes. Um, but, but all joking aside, it's, it's actually doing pretty well. So this is a conference in Sofia that the computer imagined. Uh, the next one is uh, Sofia City Sunrise. The third one is the Sofia City Autumn in Vitesha. And um, I think they're pretty good. Maybe they're not as good as, as some other things, but it, we're getting there, and we're getting there very fast. So let's talk a little bit about DALI. DALI which I used for the, the previous three pictures, instead of stable diffusion, is another. Actually, this is how it started. Uh, you've probably seen this all over social media. Now, also, regular media is piggybacking on this. It was presented um, as a paper. Originally, I think it was even a blog post at the beginning of 2021 um, by Adam Kuchak and his team. So you could generate images from text captions. It's um, a 12 billion parameter version of GPT-3. GPT-3 is the OpenAI's model. You have a big data set of text image pairs, and it gives you the power to combine unrelated concepts, like this illustration that they use in the paper of an avocado chair. And um, this is the computer's interpretation of what an avocado chair is, because usually avocados are not related to chairs. But at the end of the day, I think it's doing a pretty good job. Again, opinions here. But still, I mean. What is DALI? How, how magical it is? Well, it's actually very um, evolutionary, I would say, in terms of machine learning techniques. I mean, if you know what an autoencoder is, what a variation of autoencoder is, and now they, they did present the technique of the vector quantized variation of autoencoder. And let me tell you, that's, that's a mouthful. It's a pretty interesting paper, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, actually, as part of this, uh, this paper, you realize that um, you know, every good scientific paper, you should be able to replicate the results. And um, to replicate the results, the problem is you need a 1,000 of NVIDIA's Tesla GPUs, which are about, I don't know, these days, they're about three to $4,000 each. Um, I, didn't, I don't want to imagine what it was back then, but you need a pretty big cluster. So it's cool and it's getting more and more accessible. And um, two things that you can learn from that. If you have a lot of data, and we can go into how we generate that data, because could we use AI and ML techniques to do that? Yeah, sure, we can. GAMS. If we have a large enough model with a lot of parameters, we can have some impressive results. Caveat is, training that model is going to be hard. Now, about machine learning. I'm not going to give a talk going into the specific of what an autoencoder is, how to use it, how to apply it. But I wanted you to recognize the fact that the machine learning algorithms hidden under the hype are nothing but good computer science and applied math. And I personally trust computer science and math. Of course, there is a lot of computational power involved. And we'll get to that in a minute. Now, <coughs> with that, you can have some amazing results. And not only in image making, you can have um, song composers that, that actually can give a prompt of music and continue the song. You can have. Um, solutions for, I love the previous talk about enabling people who cannot see 
um, and bettering their lives. You can have self-driving cars and all the other things that you regularly hear and you associate with machine learning. But now, what does that mean to me as a computer scientist? Well, I love this quote. It's by one of the former VPs of Airbnb, who was saying that every time you interact with our service, be it the website, be it the mobile app or something like that, you interact with machine learning. And I bet you that the top apps that you use on a day-to-day -day basis, no matter where you're based, um, here or elsewhere in the world, are going to be using machine learning or in some shape or form interacting with machine learning models. So what does, what does that mean? Well, that means that you need some, I would call it a working knowledge of the machine learning concepts. Now, this is an illustrative workflow. Don't, don't worry about it. But do you know if a model that is being deployed by your data scientist group is CPU or memory intensive? Does it need specialized hardware? What is the cost of a training run? Do you do it in the cloud? How often do you have to rerun it? Some training runs of some commercial applications cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to train the model. But then do you need to retrain it? What do you do? Does it make sense to invest in your own infrastructure if you're going to be doing that fairly often? And even from a product marketing standpoint, from a product ownership and business standpoint, how do you work with machine learning when you have it as part of your apps? Do you create a horizontal product, and so you make one model and you apply it in different scenarios, sort of like OpenAI with GPT-3? Or do you tailor the model because you need to for each individual customers? And what that means, if you choose the second route, is that you perhaps need to structure your business in a different manner. Maybe now you're a services business where you have sub-teams tailor customizing each machine learning model for a particular customer and then dealing with a different level of margins and uh, way of, uh, of doing business and fixing things. And I don't know if any of you are running uh, or working in machine learning startups, but perhaps this sounds familiar to some of you. So what I'm getting at is that machine learning algorithms that are most commonly displayed are just a tiny fraction of the ecosystem that we should care about as professionals. We need to care about configuration. We need to care about feature extraction. We need to care about how data is being collected. We need to care about the infrastructure that runs this thing. We need to care about boring things like monitoring and, and process management and all the rest of the usual software engineering business. But are you going to be able to do all of that that we do without at least having some concept understanding of what it is. And, you know, this conference started um, as a, a, a quality engineering conference back in the day. How do we do quality engineering on the, one of those? How, do you understand the attack models? I mean, I love this because it's easy to understand. It's, um, you've probably seen it. You get a picture of a dog, and you add some very well-constructed noise to that picture um, in which the human eye cannot discern it, but of course, the computer can. So it gets correctly classified as an ostrich, which is, of course, hilarious um, until you realize that you can actually do it with real objects, and perhaps, as this experiment showed, you can have specially crafted speakers, uh, stickers, stick them on a stop sign, and then the self-driving car interprets that sign as, let's drive with 120 kilometers per hour. And then it stops being funny very quickly. So how do we curate our data? How do we work with it? How do we deal with biases in the models? There are studies that show that our, you get your, your output is going to be as quality as your input for your training data. So you are going to run into problems if your training sets are, have a bias in them. 
how do we do explainability? And um, as we start to interact with machine learning applications more and more, for example, even when we don't realize it, we go to the bank, we ask for a credit, and the, um, and the, the credit inspector actually asks an app what your credit score should be or where your trustiness. Or maybe you go to the doctor uh, wanting to read an x-ray and uh, the practitioner relies on another app that actually looks at and tries to help them interpret the, the x-ray or the scan. Now, it's going to give you some result with some probability, but that practitioner right now is going to have a very hard time explaining why that particular result came into being. So explainability, tomorrow it should get the user of machine learning applications knowing exactly why the machine decided a certain outcome instead of another one. All right. And you might say, okay, I don't, honestly, I don't care about that. That's for QE, for DevOps folks to, to worry about infra. It's for the data science folks to figure out with the models. I'm a software engineer. I write code. I don't care. Well, have you seen Copilot? If you haven't, do so. But um, in this particular um, tweet, someone was complaining, all right, look, I actually wrote a function, and you, you write the function name, and you rely on Copilot if you haven't used it to uh, give you suggestions. And in this case, the suggestion I gave you, OK, you should <laughs> throw an error because you don't want to invert the binary tree. That's dumb. And obviously, that's not the function you were looking for and the help you were looking for. But again, that's the data sets. All right. So this is going to be more and more pervasive. Pay attention to it. But learn at least enough about machine learning to have an idea what is doing behind your back. All right. Shifting gears. Enough about machine learning. I hope I turned at least some of you from skeptics to curious people. Now, I look around the audience right now, and I see a lot of you using devices while I'm speaking. Now, some of these are ARM-based devices, right? Some are, I see laptops, so Intel probably based, but I see some MacBooks as well, so um, M1 or M2 chips, I don't know what's inside. I probably don't see any RISC-V devices, but um, trust me, soon there's going to be at least, if not here, then around the lights or in the control box so over there. So lots of architectures. Let me tell you about WebAssembly. Now, WebAssembly is a very cool open standard that defines a new binary format. And that binary format it started with the browser, as many things do these days. Um, it's supported, in fact, by all major browsers. You could uh, run an executable program there. It's very cool. I like it even more because, I mean, riffing on the theme of polyglot development, you could write in Rust, you can do Golang, C, and then you, you get into this portable bytecode format. But the cool part is it executes across architectures. Now. I'm a server's side person, so uh, these days you can do a lot of that uh, magic in the browser. Google Earth, Figma, Unity all have WebAssembly in them, but um, Solomon Hikes, one of the initial creators of Docker, was saying, all right, if in 2008 we had WebAssembly and the system interface, we would not need to use Docker and container. We'll probably not need to create it because it gives you a lot of the power WebAssembly is, um, has a very interesting um, sandbox. Um, has, it's very efficient. It's polyglot, so you could fulfill some of the promises of what containers gave us as, as engineers. It's open, so it's a little bit in a better position than, for example, what Java was when it was, uh, when it was invented, backed by only one company. Uh, WebAssembly is by, backed by the Bytecode Alliance. Um, and most of all, it's portable. Because, look, as software engineers, we always solve. There is a lot of boring stuff that we need to do when, when we, until we get to production. I mean, we create the technology, but then you know, we need to build it. And uh, do we keep different branches for the different architectures normally? 
do we need to um, perhaps just have different make files and, and build different deliverables and then store them in different repositories and then, okay, if we need to patch one, do we patch the other one? I mean, I'm talking about that whole sequence of, I would say, important but boring work that we do right now, and if we have even more architectures, we'll have to do even more of that. So it's, um, it's um, an exponential, actually, expansion. And this is a cool piece of tech that promises maybe what Java promised originally in terms of not only cross-operating systems, but in this case, cross-architecture. So with that, to recap, and as I promised, I'm not going to go over because I'm the only thing that, that's between you and the, um, and the cocktail. Um, I didn't know even that it had um, some music, but this is Stable Diffusion, one of the AI models I showed you, running on um, the new virtual reality platform that was just showcased by Meta this week you can see that it actually gets generated, computer, uh, computer generated. You need a lot of firepower, you need a lot of computational power to do it, but you can do it on the go. So imagine being in a virtual reality landscape that gets auto-generated for you by the computer just by prompts. No designers, except for the ones that give you the prompts. I find it amazing. It has its quirks, it's early, but I find it pretty good. And uh, enough of that um, before we get dizzy, before, because that's another area, but I'm not going to go into it, virtual reality. I love this quote by Bill Gates. It's an old quote from 96, that we tend to overestimate what's going to happen in the next two years but severely underestimate what's going to happen in the next 10. So how about we do this? How about we do this? In six years, we, come, we all come back here and see how many of these things panned out. Thank you. By the way, if you want to geek out about some of these topics, find me afterwards in the, in the speaker's corner. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you, Vesco. Awesome. <laughs>